Alrighty, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, and welcome back everybody to Secret of Mana. Attempt number three at the intro, the first time I goofed up, the second time a microphone decided to stop working, and hopefully that's not the case anymore now. Welcome to Seeker of Mana. Welcome back because I've played this game a lot in the past, and if you would like to have more knowledge about the game, let's put it this way, about the weird and wackiness of the game, well, this might just be the playthrough for you. Now, for reference, Seeker of Mana is pretty much my favorite game of all time for many different reasons, so I'm not pointing at the game and laughing about it, I'm just having, kind of having fun, because the more you know about the game, I, in my opinion, the more fun it happens to be that way. So, well, I would suggest, let us get started. Welcome to Seeker of Mana, and before I begin, I'm gonna do a little setup here. What I'm gonna do is, I'm going to select just a save file here, and we're going to hold start select L and R for a few seconds for resetting. Why would we do that? Well, you will see. Um, let's get started, shall we? And, oh yeah, timer, why not? In the beginning, normally, this cutscene here is supposed to scroll. Well, it doesn't scroll right now, so you immediately know something is up, right? Or maybe you don't, or you forgot that these uh, cutscenes are supposed to scroll. Who knows? Either way, the way the game normally scrolls these cutscenes, it takes control of your main character, of your main controller, and walks that character across the screen, just kind of invisibly, just walks them through the boundaries and everything in order to be able to show you what is going on. Which is actually quite a fun way to implement those camera scrolls. If you notice that the character's movement speed is exactly the same as the camera scrolling if um, you account for also certain things just being in the background. Now, well, welcome to Seeker of Mana. I'm not going to explain the plot. Anybody who has played through the game probably knows at least as much, if not even more, about this game than me. And, well, I have played this game a lot in the past. In fact, if you watch the speedrun, there are a lot of things, techniques, glitches and stuff that I have figured out, implemented and discovered. But I'm not necessarily the most knowledgeable person about the game. Um, the creator of the randomizer, Moppleton, for example, is way more informed on the technical level, as is Rekers, who is also just kind of one of the original Seeker of Mana wizards, and also Crow, who is another runner of Seeker of Mana, who, well, just kind of is actually going to provide us with the early game route that we're going to be taking. You might not think there's much of a choice in where to go in the early game, but you just need to know how. And I hope I don't goof it up because it's possible to just softlock. Speaking of softlock... So, unfortunately I don't have an input display here, but if I press left, nothing happens. If I press up, the boy briefly runs to the left and just comes to a standstill. I cannot do anything here. So, if I press the B button on the other hand, suddenly we interact with the sword. And then the camera tries to begin with the cutscene, but... The camera is trying to center on the boy and the sword, and it tries to scroll onto that character. The problem is we are nowhere near the sword, so it can't exactly center on the characters, and it just starts scrolling. Welcome to Seeker of Mana. I love this game, it's so good. And by the way, I would like to point out something real quick. Um, this is mostly an ad hoc, just informative and glitchy and fun playthrough. I would like to point out, I know a lot of people like to just kind of point fingers and say, Oh, look at this! Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, uh, the programmer was so bad. No, he really wasn't. Like, for the amount of time the basically sole pro programmer, from what I know, had Nazir to create and make everything work on a new system on the Super Nintendo at the time is just ridiculous. And there's a lot of little subtleties that are accounted for for so many things. It's sure there's a lot of little glitches and holes and a bit of awkwardness. But for the most part, this is actually crazy impressive. I just want to point that out. But that doesn't really stop us having some fun with the game. Also, yes, I'm softlocked. I couldn't do anything. 
So, um, I'm getting to chat in just a second. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, now, this is the place where I can point out all the things that I don't usually get to point out, and I will forget about pointing out certain things or stuff. If I do, feel free to remind me. But here, whenever you scroll in the text box here, you hear that noise for, well, the cursor movement. Makes sense, right? Now the thing is, in the Japanese version, you actually have an entire grid of characters. You can also scroll up and down. Which, well, you can't really do that. If I press up and down, nothing happens. But if I hold down or up and then move left or right, the cursor uh, sound just kind of stops. Because up and down is not supposed to make sound. And if you hold up and down, well, the cursor sound just stops entirely. It's kind of interesting. Alrighty, and people have voted for me to be named the boy, but I'm just gonna say that it's gonna be Hump, our good old original. Welcome to Seeker of Mana. I like this game. And, well, let me real quick get to chat here. Let's see. Lethe, thank you so much for a ridiculously long time of 72 months of support. Holy cow. Welcome back. And I'm glad you enjoy your stay. Also, Kablooey Crips, thank you so much for quite a long time as well already. 17 months? And well, I'm glad you enjoy your stay. And Lethe, thank you so much for the gifts up to Jeff, that's really nice of you. And yeah, the OST in this game is really, really nice. So for reference, um, because of my current physical setup, I'm actually playing this through... Uh, the OBS window, and on my end, the game has like 30 FPS. So I hope the playthrough is still perfectly fine and watchable for everybody else, and it's just on my end. So, well, let's see how this is gonna go. People told me in chat that it looks perfectly fine over on there. Alrighty, welcome to Seeker of Mana. Now, when you initially start the game, you actually don't have a menu. The character bar at the bottom, where the boy's HP and such is displayed, and the little character portrait is just not present. Um, if you somehow could possibly glitch through to the next area without ever activating the HUD element, HUD, then the game would actually go really weird and do a lot of really strange stuff. Now the thing is, there's actually no way to do that to my knowledge without using Game Genie codes. You would need to use a walkthrough wall Game Genie code in order to be able to accomplish that. And this playthrough here is not about using fun and quirky Game Genie codes. This playthrough here is just for everything else. So. If you have a Game Genie and can walk through walls, see what happens when you just walk through the wall there on the right side. Or maybe don't. I've heard, like, rumors of where people might have lost some save files if they did. Maybe do it on an emulator instead, I don't know. Also, by the way, there's a current here in this water, and currents are kind of strange in this game. It's like, it just moves you. Okay, let's get going, shall we? Welcome to this game. Did the glitch earlier have any point? No, it should not have any influence whatsoever. It's just basically the explanation is there's a lot of weird things and you can basically set up a glitch before even starting the game. It's quite fun. And also holding start select L and R is a soft reset, but it's not the same as pressing the reset button on the console. Because if you hold Start, Select, L and R for a little while longer, then... Well, some of the variables and such are not erased, and we're gonna be taking advantage of that in a more, well, complete way later. Alrighty, welcome to Seeker of Mana. These rabbits here are the only monster in the game that I think have a 1 in 4 chance to drop you a chest, whereas every other enemy in the game has a 1 in 16 chance to drop you a chest. So it's just rabbits that do that. Also, if we were to die in the rabbit forest here, which some people, well, I, I imagine a lot of people never died in here, but if you were to die, the fascinating thing is you would actually get sent back to 
the spring. You actually do not cave over, curiously enough. So you get sent back to the water on the left side and then you just go again. No consequences, you don't even lose the experience or money that you have gained in the meantime. Am I going to show magic percent? Um, I actually probably will not. Because I meant to prepare for more, but... Magic percent is not currently something that I could just do ad hoc. I would have to just learn how to do the route again. Getting whacked means that an enemy just received a critical hit, which is generally speaking just double the damage. And, well, there we have our first chest. In the chest there is a... a boy. I think it was a 10 in 256 chance to get the rare drop, which for the rabbit is gold. The common drop is candy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so there we just get a candy. That's fine. But yeah, magic percent is the effectively any percent cat category for Seeker of Mana. Um, effectively the category. Also, let me do a save file here real quick. That's for later because there's gonna be some curious shenanigans with that. We're gonna say no to the guy and then say yes in order to just save without having to sleep. And yeah, we can save over this one. This is fine. We're gonna come back here later a little bit too. If I don't forget about it. There's going to be a lot of things going on. But yeah, magic percent is effectively the true any percent of Secret of Mana. Where you go and get a barrel in order to have a text box or a dialogue box open. And then you talk to an NPC that has the money uh, amount displayed immediately at a certain frame after the box disappears. And then you get into a really weird and glitchy state. And you can effectively finish the game under 10 minutes. Or more specifically, you can call the credits on the 10 minutes. But it's not something that I'm inherently all that familiar with. I just kind of sort of know how it works. But yeah, that's the probably the one thing that you're not going to see here. Maybe later if I have time to experiment with it some more. But yeah, welcome everybody. Welcome to the first boss here. Now, here's a little fun fact. Elliot here on the bottom right is actually part of the boss fight. Like, literally. When... If you play the Secret of Mana randomizer... Whenever you fight the Mantis Ant in some location, Elliot is always part of the encounter. Which I always thought, thought that'd be kind of funny, so it's just kind of... If you meet the Mantis Ant in, like, the arena where you normally fight Buffy in the Mana Fortress, he's just kind of... <laughs> somewhere randomly in the room, it's great. Alrighty, welcome to this guy here. Now, Speedrun has a very particular method where they just stand in front of this guy and attack him just before um, he can hit them. So just kind of, if you time it right, just hit him again. Alternatively, what we can do is we can stand on the side here, walk away just as he starts swinging, because the Mantis Ant here has like two different melee attacks, and if you just stand on the side, he just swings with one of his hands first, and then he just can walk away from it. Also, um, if you stand far away from Mantis Ant, that is when he actually uses his ranged attacks. This one here makes you unconscious. And he also has spells that he can cast on you if he decides to do so. So it's actually quite interesting on that end. So just a ranged attack here again. So if you ever wondered, how do you even defeat this guy without dying? Because Genuinely, this guy is actually kind of difficult casually, but of course, the nice thing is, even if you die, you can automatically get revived. Now, what you can do in order to defeat this guy easily, you just stand here in the corner. Because whenever you are behind Mantis Ant, he just jumps. And because he literally cannot go any further up here, he just gets stuck this way. Which, that's kind of the method that I used as a kid, just stand here and hit him, because... That's the easy way. <laughs> but yeah, AI and Seeker of Mana can be abused and used in quite a number of quirky ways. Welcome to you, Monsieur Bombs. I hope you're doing well. And welcome to anybody else who might be around. This bus was supposedly scripted to be later in the playthrough. I've actually not heard of that one. Interesting. Alrighty. 
Welcome to Secret of Mana. Now, do I have anything else to say about this one here? Not really. Right now, we just kind of keep going, shall we? Here, we are going to encounter, of course, our expelled, expelling, I guess, from the village. And what's supposed to happen is the elder tells you that, hey, you, um, go down into the basement to get the money before you go, so you have at least something along the way. And I kind of appreciate that. The elder is really nice. But it also is kind of has that implication that the NPCs leave as you go downstairs and grab your stuff and then go back. But also, the NPCs just leave after you go outside and come back in. So I guess all of them are now in the basement? I don't know. <laughs> Either way, welcome to Seeker of Mana. Let's go. And Blood, thank you. Thank you so much for a crazy long time of support with 69 months. Welcome back. It's been a while indeed, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay with a tier 2 too. Thank you so much. Alrighty, so, fun fact, it's actually faster to run over to the left side to the water palace rather than take the cannon travel, because the cannon travel guy tells you that, Hi, the cannon travel brothers are building a global network. Going to the water palace? Shema's already left. He paid for your way to hop in. So basically, it just allows you to use the cannon travel here for free. Isn't that nice of him? But it also serves another purpose, because right now you're not supposed to go anywhere except um, visit Gemma in the Water Palace, that is where you're supposed to go. Now, a lot of people probably already know this, but there is a way where you can in fact go other places rather than the Water Palace, and that's where Crow's Route comes in. Crow made a challenge run where he defeated the... Well, actually, I'm not gonna say that yet. It's going to be a surprise to a lot of people. He did a challenge run at some point that had a really interesting goal. And we're not gonna go quite for the full challenge run, because otherwise that might take a long time. Alrighty. Now, if you've ever wondered why in speedruns we don't get the cutscene where we get kidnapped by goblins, that is because we never learned the name of this guy here. This is Dialog. If you never learn Dialog's name from talking to the NPCs here, then you actually don't get kidnapped by goblins. Because that is kind of when you're supposed to learn that, oh, the lady is looking for this guy who is going to Eleni's forest. And effectively talking to this guy here, or talking to this guy here, or talking to the others multiple times, you eventually learn Dialog's name. For example here, that's Major Dialog. And now we learned Dialog's name. So instead of going to the Water Palace, this sets the flag that, hey, we learned Dialog's name, and this advances the entire plot of the area. Uh, the way Seeker of Mana keeps track of plot is by telling effectively the game that there's a certain number, and that number just increased by one because we learned Dialog's name. And the cannon travel guy here also actually takes, uh, looks at that number in order to see, okay, where am I supposed to be able to send the player character? And in this case, now that we've learned Dialog's name, it's no longer at the lowest possible value, instead we can just go anywhere we want. In this case, Gaia's navel. Which means, um, we're going to go places we shouldn't. Now, I don't recommend necessarily doing this unless you follow the exact steps that I do. Because if you don't go to the Water Palace cutscene early enough, you will softlock the game. Like, literally, you can no longer proceed in any capacity. Unless you do somehow the magic percent. I guess that's technically a way out, but... Besides that, there's not really a way to do anything else. So, um, I actually need a little bit of money now to think about it. So this, uh... Skipping the Water Palace cutscene is effectively not actually much of an option. So this is why you don't see speedruns doing that, because the out of order early game that we're gonna be performing here is... 
actually quite tricky. Let's put it this way. So, um, no, I have prepared a thing. And that thing is, I would like to explain to everybody how the money glitch works. Now, this is going to be... I wanted to prepare more, but I just didn't really. So what we need is we need at least two items in our inventory. So in this case, I kind of wanted to see... Can we afford this? We can actually, just barely afford this. We're going to go ahead and buy one chocolate. We already got a candy from a rabbit earlier, which is convenient. And one medical herb. Now, the order of items I have received is actually kind of important. Let me go and... Where did I put it? Browse the spreadsheet. Here we go. So. I'll move this a little bit out of the way. Now. Our inventory looks basically kind of like this. There... Any inventory item here that is empty... This is basically one inventory slot. Right now, in our first inventory slot, we have a candy. And I actually have no idea what the item ID for the candy is, but effectively, we now have one candy. Now, real quick, this is displayed here in binary. This is how computers process things. So, zero, one, two, three, four. This is how you count in binary. This is just for reference for people who may would like to have a reference for how this works. But also, we now have a candy in the first slot, we have a chocolate in the second slot, and we have a medical herb in the third slot here. Again, unfortunately, I don't actually know what the item IDs are, but we have one of each of these items here on inventory. Now, by default, if we ever open our inventory, um, right here, and move over to the candy and such, kind of make it showing you. Um, right now, the cursor is selected on the candy. If I move it over, the cursor is now selected on the chocolate, and now it is on the medical herb. The reason why the cursor selection is important is... Well, I'm going to try and explain this in just a moment. So basically, our cursor is now selecting the medical herb here. And then we're close to the regular menu right here. Afterwards, what we're gonna do is we're going to sell the medical herb and we are going to sell the chocolate as well. So we're gonna go into the menu here, sell the medical herb. I hope you can see this just about well enough. Just let me move this a little bit. We're gonna sell the medical herb and now what the game does once I sell the medical herb here, it moves my cursor that it has memorized where it is in my regular inventory up one sp uh, slot, basically back to the second slot here where the chocolate is, and it automatically would like to select the chocolate. However, you might notice that this cursor here, in this inventory, works a little bit different because it gave us the candy immediately. So we go ahead and now sell the chocolate as well, and you might expect the game to also now move our cursor back to the first slot because there's nothing in the second slot anymore. But, because there's kind of a bit of a disconnect between the selling item cursor menu and the regular item menu, the game actually doesn't really know what to do with that information. So, now what we're gonna do is we're going to back out all the way out of the sell menu, and our cursor, or the memory cursor, is actually still on the second item. It's still now over there, where it's empty now. Let me set this up real quick. We just sold the chocolate and candy, and everything here is now empty. And empty is basically, oops, um, whatever, it's fine. Empty is effectively indicated by everything just being a one. It's the highest possible value in the inventory. This is how the game knows something is supposed to be empty, but our cursor is still on the empty item. Now, we're going to back out of all the menus here. And then we go back inside. I hope this actually works, because this is a slightly different setup than usual. Now if I go back onto the cell menu... There we go. Now, in the regular game, you can see there's nothing selected up here. Because technically, our cursor is now on the second item, rather than on the first one. So what happens if I sell this now, 
is I get about 30,000 gold. Because selling literally nothing is worth about 30,000 gold. And now, we have this blood item in the top here. And effectively, blood, in case you were wondering why there's a weird blood here, this is now our item here. Of course, it's not supposed to be here, but the game just decreased the amount of items we have by one. So instead of this being 110, we now have this item in our inventory. Effectively, 110 in binary means 7. Wait, no. Six? I think I messed that up, didn't I? I'm pretty sure I messed up the binary thing here somehow. Because I think this is supposed to mean... Oh wait, no, we start counting with zero. It is six, right? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I did. I would like to have practiced that, but I didn't have time. Yeah, it's zero through seven, and I reduced this now. This is now six, which I guess... Whatever, basically we have now minus one in our inventory for bats. Oh, wait, I think the amount is always zero? I it doesn't matter, it's whatever. Basically, we now have a weird glitched item in our inventory. Now, if I sell this one again, the glitched item is going to get reduced by one so again, so this is going to be zero once. This is correct here, this number here is correct. So we now have uh, five items in our inventory of the blood. Now what happens if we sell this item five more times? One, two, three, four, five. So this is now exactly zero. We've sold this thing now five more times. Oh, lady here, hang on. <laughs> I should have put her behind the spreadsheet. So, we have sold this now five more times. Now we have exactly zero blood in our inventory. But because blood is not supposed to be an item, um, the game does not know what to do. So if we sell it one more time, it actually is going to roll over. And we now have once again an empty inventory slot. Because everything is just one, 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 and the game considers this to be empty. Alright, and that is kind of the short version on how the money glitch works. If I just go back out of the menu here... ...and look at my item... ...it says trash, because the cursor still is memorized on the second slot. But if I just kind of go anywhere else... ...and then eventually come back, it's back to normal. And now the game knows that, okay, everything is normal, except that I have a ridiculous amount of money. And this is kind of how you can get a lot of money. Now, there is kind of an alternate method that the speedrun uses. So in the speedrun, you only buy two items. And then you kind of do the same procedure. Um, you set your inventory cursor to the second item. And then you go ahead and sell this item and this item. But now, our entire inventory... Oh, shoot. I... Oh, that's not gonna work, is it? Because I actually bought some candies. Alright, so we sold our entire inventory right here now. So everything, once again, is basically empty. There is no candy here anymore. But the game still kind of, sort of, somehow allows us to select stuff. If we go into the buy menu here... The game now has memorized... Oh! This is the last menu that we were in, which is technically the Nico cell menu here. And if you go back into the cell menu now, for some reason, um, and I don't actually know exactly why, now everything is back here. And there's no candy in here either. I don't actually know why that happens either. Either way, so chocolate here is actually our first empty slot. This is our second empty slot, third empty slot, fourth empty slot, etc. So, effectively what I can do... Actually, I think this might be the second night empty slot. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, it, did. it should be. Whatever. Either way, what we can do now is... We can do a little bit of funky glitch tech. So, 
what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to sell an item in, this is I think the second or third item slot, I don't know. So we once again have this glitched blood here in our inventory. Let me try to pull this up again. Let's make this smaller, maybe this is gonna be better. No, we have once again in, let's say the third item slot, we have this blood here in our inventory, which is not supposed to be there, but the game notices that, well, we have some item in our inventory. And now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna buy a bunch of items here. What I'm gonna buy first is because I have so much money, let's just buy barrels. The normal limit of how many items you can have in an inventory is four. Once we have four items, the game no longer allows you to buy any more. So let's just fill up on items, shall we? Just a little bit. I'm gonna only buy two cups of witches and two medical herbs, and that's gonna become apparent as to why later. Just basically two of each item right now, because having some supplies even in a glitchy playthrough is very, very nice to have. Just two of each. Alright, I'm also going to buy some equipment items here, because having something equipped in every item slot is actually very important. I'm gonna explain that in just a second. Either way, we now, um, let me check real quick, just to verify where we have the glitched item. So, couple of wishes, barrel, and then we have blood in the fourth in, uh, third inventory slot. Okay, it is the third inventory slot. So let me replicate this real quick. So we have barrel, Cup of Wishes, and Medical Herb, Walnut, Honey, Chocolate, Medical Herb, Walnut, Honey, Chocolate, and Candy. Alrighty, so basically I'm just replicating the item ID here. Or more specifically, the items. I actually don't know what the ID is, to be honest, so... Whatever. So we have bought two of each of these items, except for the barrels. We have bought four. That is going to be slightly more important later. So. We have now two cups of wishes, four barrels, two medical herbs, two uh, walnuts, two chocolates, and two candies. Now. What is actually happening here is, as you can see, um, the glitched item, the blood, that one does not actually have its own icon. So what is happening here is, we have the first slot is a barrel, the second slot is a cup of wishes, and then the third slot is actually the blood, the glitched item. But because the game does not have any icon for this item, it just takes the next icon from the next item. Like, it literally just doesn't display anything here, and everything it just kind of gets moved one spot to the side. So, now this is the blood, this is the medical herb, this is the fairy walnut, and this is the royal jam, this is the chocolate, and we literally cannot select the candy even if we wanted to. And that's kind of curious, which by the way, don't use the blood as an item, it will crash your game. Or do you? I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> it just crashes your game. To my knowledge, there's nothing useful to do with that. Either way, now... I kind of prefer to not have a blood in my inventory, because if I accidentally used that item, um, it would be going kind of weird. So, speaking of weird, what we're gonna do here now is we're gonna sell the blood now seven more times, because Every time you sell a multiple of 8 times, it effectively just kind of rolls over the value, and the game considers that inventory slot to be empty again. Which is nice. So, the slot is now empty again, we have sold everything here, and it's just, well, empty. Now, you might notice there's an empty slot in the middle of your inventory, this cannot normally happen. But also, another little fun part, the way the game checks as to whether you have a certain item four times already or not, is it is actually going to go ahead and just go through the list. Okay, you would like to buy... what do we want to buy? Let's buy a fairy walnut, shall we? Okay, the game checks then. Okay, you want to buy a fairy walnut, good. Do we already have a fairy walnut? Slot 1? No. Slot 2? No. Slot 3? Oh, it's empty. Then I don't have to check any further because... 
there's nothing else in the inventory and it stops checking. Which means, if I just buy a fairy walnut here, or two, now we have another fairy walnut here on inven inventory. I just bought two of them, by the way. So we have two fairy walnuts in our inventory here, because that's where the game puts them. It just kind of went, oh, yeah, okay, let's put them in the empty slot there. And consequently, we now have two fairy walnuts in here. It's quite fascinating, let's put it this way. Alrighty, that's enough with the inventory shenanigans for now. As you might notice, there's some uh, equipment stuff later, but we'll get to that in... Well, later, let's put it this way. Welcome to the Secret of Man and Dark Paladin! Thank you so much for a crazy long time of support. Welcome back for 65 months. Did I miss anybody else? So did I sell my Seer of Blood? Yes, I sold my Seer of Blood and that kind of made the game just kind of roll over to an empty inventory slot. Which you're not normally supposed to select any of these and that's just kind of how it works. Normally when you sell the last of an item, uh, it basically just rearranges and reorders the item. But because the Blood is kind of a glitched item, it just didn't do that there. How many times can you perform the money glitch? Until you max out the money, which I actually don't know what the maximum is. I've never really bothered to check. Um, what I recommend if you do the money glitch, always sell the item a multiple of 8 times so you no longer have that blood glitched item in your inventory. Otherwise, it's getting uh, a little bit dicey. Let's put it this way. So, alrighty. Let's get a sword upgrade, shall we? No balloons! No. Oh. Balloon is effectively an 8 second ish stun where you can't do anything during this. And hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. So we're just running through this cave here, but we're going to take a slightly unusual path. Because actually the only thing I want from this cave trip here is I would like for the sword to be upgraded so we have a level 2 sword for later. Um, it's gonna be a little bit awkward here. Especially with me having, <laughs> like, only half the FPS that I'm supposed to have. I hope that doesn't affect the stream, but... Well, we'll see. By the way, you might have noticed me earlier equip the most basic equipment pieces here on the boy. So, the bandana gives us two defense, and the wristband gives us one. Honestly, that defense is as little or as low as it sounds. It is actually not that great. But, it is however significantly better than having nothing equipped on any particular item slot. And the reason for this is because there is the concept of... The game calls it evasion, I like to think of it more as glancing blows. The idea is that, effectively, there is two ways of hitting an enemy, a high damage roll and a low damage roll. So, if you get a high damage roll, that means you checked against the enemy's evasion value. And effectively, this means that you might not have... If you beat the enemy's evasion value, you get a high damage roll. And if you, well, don't beat it, you get a low damage roll. Um, but the reason why I like to call it glancing blows is because it's just high or low damage rolls rather than anything else. Um, because, yeah, either way, effectively having nothing equipped in any particular item slot has the character's evasion or, well, yeah, let's just call it evasion value because it, that's what the lab, uh, game labels it as well. The character's evasion value is effectively not properly there until we have at least one item equipped in every single item slot, and this is what I did. Now I have a proper evasion value, which means most of the time the enemies are actually going to land low damage rolls on us rather than high damage rolls. And that's kind of important, because otherwise we take way more damage. Because the difference, especially in the early game, between high and low damage rolls from enemy is kind of significant. Ryok, thank you so much for a crazy long time of 56 months of support. Welcome back to Prime Gaming. I greatly appreciate that. Welcome everybody, I hope you're doing well. 
So, we are now here in the Dwarven Village. You know what, I probably should explain the equipment trashing right here, because this is kind of the original place where we did this, or do this in the speedrun, so you have kind of a reference to what happening, what's happening in the speedrun. So, I'm just gonna buy a bunch of equipment pieces here. Um, by the way, the power rest here gives you plus 5 strength. Which, that's a ton of additional attack damage, especially in the early game. This thing is better than most of the arm armbands, who are just kind of raw damage output, than a lot of others. Let's put it this way. Now, gonna buy a bunch of spiky suits. I actually don't know how many I need. But this is effectively going to be another demonstration for inventory shenanigans. Buy this here. I should have bought a hairband for the lady. We'll get to that. <laughs> We're going back to potato to buy a power vest. Oh boy. I did actually write in my note potatoes rather than potos. But I want to show us something else. Alright. So. Inventory shenanigans 2.0, and don't worry, that's the last time we're gonna dive into that. But I just kind of want to explain what's happening here again. So, when we are going in our inventory to equip stuff, if you unequip something, or more specifically, let's put it this way, um, the boy currently has the most basic armor equipped here. Let's say this is... Here at the very bottom. I don't know what the item or ID is for this armor, but this is the one that he has equipped. So, the way the game keeps track of things for whether a character has something equipped or not is like this. The first, uh, the top two of the bits in basically the inventory or armor equipment pieces kind of indicates who has the thing equipped? Is it, if it's a 0, 0, nobody has it equipped. If the boy has it equipped, it's a 0, 1. If the girl has it equipped, it's a 1, 0. And if the sprite has it equipped, it's a 1, 1. That's effectively how the game just kind of attributes these things. Now I'm just wondering whether we can possibly... ...equip something on the boy that the sprite has equipped. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just kind of completely off topic. Either way, right now, the boy has in fact this armor piece equipped here. Now, if I unequip it... ...the game just does this. Nobody has the armor piece here equipped anymore. It makes sense. Now, if I... however, instead of unequipping it, if I just... ...put it in the trash... ...the game... Well, that's a straight-up glitch. That's a bug. The game does not properly unequip that armor. It just tries to unequip the armor and then delete the armor. But what it does instead is, based on where you're standing on the screen horizontally, and I'm not going to go into detail with this one, it just kind of changes different values. So if you go in here and hug the left wall here, instead of it effectively deleting or unequipping the armor and then deleting the item, it deletes the armor, and here's what happens. It deletes the armor, so this stuff is gone, it's empty now. But, when it tries to unequip here, it tries to move this value from 0, 1 to 0, 0. But, the place I'm standing in, the game does this one over here. So from 0, 1 to 0, 0. And we now have 0, 0, 0 in here, in our regular inventory. So if I go and check on my inventory here... Couple of wishes times 0. You're not supposed to have 0 of anything in your inventory. At least, not that you can select in any capacity. And... Well, this is just kind of what happens. So... It's actually kind of weird on how the game does that, because I don't even have to move here in order to do the inventory stuff some more. I just stand here, glitch this one away as well, so the game just unequipped my fairy walnuts in slot 3. Which means yeah, I have now 0 fairy walnuts. Do the same thing again. Now we have 0 medical herbs. 
and this is why I bought a few more armors than necessary. Do this again, we now have zero of the other stack of fairy walnuts. Because I bought two of each specifically. So, you might notice, it actually did not touch the barrel at all. Um, this is because we have four barrels right here. One zero zero is the equivalent of four. And effectively the game specifically checks for a value that the boy has equipped, which is zero one. And right now I have four of the barrels in my inventory. And if you look down here, if I were to unequip the lady, she would actually be able to reduce the amount of barrels from four to zero because the game would unequip it by setting this bit here to zero. So if I had the lady in my party right now, we can do the same shenanigans. And I'm just going to do this two more times to have zero of all of these uh, uh, inventory items in my equipment. So I do want to have stuff equipped though, for that matter. But everything here now should just be a zero. Zero cups of wishes, four barrels, candy, chocolate, etc. I actually forgot to add this thing here. Whatever that is. And in case you're wondering, there's, to my knowledge, no way to change the amount of magic rot. You just have one. That's just how it is. And yeah, this is just kind of how this works. And yes, by the way, we would need six of any particular item in our inventory to have the sprites trash it. Oh, by the way, which is technically possible because if we use any of these zero items, what happens is the following. Let's use zero candies. And now we have seven because, well, one, one, one is seven since it just kind of rolled over. We now have one, one, one candies in our inventory. So even though the game stops you at buying more than four, it just kind of sometimes still allows you to do that. All right, that's the explanation here. Let's continue, shall we? Is zero equal to infinity? No, zero means that it just kind of tries to subtract one from zero, and that means it just rolls over to well, one, 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 one. Curiously enough, it does pay enough attention that this rolling over actually does not appear to affect anything else. Yeah, normally it would be 255, but it just kind of, it does specifically reduce the quantity. Alrighty, so we're just going to go ahead and upgrade our sword to level 2 here. And the other trigger, by the way, to trigger Tropicolo to appear in the area down here, is we would need to go ahead and go to the theater. Let me actually see whether I can do a specific setup for that. Alright, we have a level 2 sword now. We'll get to the snowman abduction. Alrighty, so let me check something. Yeah, I think this is fine. Alright, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a really weird thing. So. What normally happens after you watch this cutscene here is you get back to the main Dwarven Village Plaza, or just outside in the Dwarven Village, let's put it this way, and Tropicalo spawns. But there is this kind of weird in-between area where we can actually use a magic rope in order to get outside, which means we kind of don't fight Tropicolo, we don't get the sprite, we don't get the axe, and we just get out of here for now. Actually... Can we do that? Hang on, I might be goofing up something. Oh, I would be goofing up something. Let's not do that yet. Sorry, we, we're gonna do that later. Let's just get outside here. But you can actually just... Ignore Tropicolo for now. But... Normally you need the axe in order to proceed from here. So we have decent equipment now. Um, I'm going to... oops. Ah, come on. When certain flying enemies are standing up, they are intangible. So you can't hit them during that.
Alrighty, so my goal is to start leveling up the sword to Lord's level 2, because that's gonna be used for another little set of shenanigans. Alrighty, keep in mind we have never gone to complete the Water Palace yet. And, well, we're not really going to do Gaia's Naval yet either. We're just going to do stuff a little bit out of order, let's put it this way. So these guys have exactly 60 HP, so two hits at 30 each is exactly enough. But we can always get these low damage rolls. As I mentioned before, that is what the game calls the evasion value. If we get a low damage roll, although evasion, like completely missing a hit, is technically something completely different. Alrighty, I'm actually gonna go ahead and buy an item here. As I've mentioned before, having something equipped in each inventory slot or each equipment slot is really important so we don't get high damage rolls from enemies all the time. So, because the headband is the only equipment piece the lady can equip right now, I'm just gonna buy that right here. We also save and let's free the lady who is getting harassed by the wolves here. I did buy better equipment so I should be mostly fine. But they can't just straight up combo me to 0 HP if they decide to do that. Which is always a risk, because as long as you only have one character, you could just get comboed infinitely by enemies, especially if they get knocked in here. I might just be dead here. Yeah. This is why I saved beforehand. <laughs> this is one of the frustrations that you have to deal with in the early game, and honestly, the early game is genuinely one of the more difficult parts about Seeker of Mana. This is just... well, you don't really have invulnerability frames in the traditional sense. You just briefly are intangible, but if you are on the ground you just kind of get hit again. And yes, this is a difficult fight here. Especially if you play the game casually and you didn't go and buy all the equipment pieces from the Dwarven Village. This can be pretty dangerous here. Fun fact, these uh, wolves here, as you probably noticed, they can heal each other, but they can not heal themselves. Alright, but if you manage to push them over there, then they're just kind of stuck there. Because they try to take the shortest route towards you. Alright, now, another little thing that you might not know about the game. There is two ways to attack, and there's no way to control it. If you are close enough to enemies, you will have a 50% chance to do a stab attack and a 50% chance to do a swing attack. Stab attack, unfortunately, it actually gives you some brief moment of intangible frames where enemies cannot hit you, which is almost never useful, let's put it this way, but it's kind of curious. But the swing is pretty much what you always want. So right now, I'm just fishing for a 50% chance to get a swing here rather than a stab, because that is what I can hit them with. But that only happens when you are close enough to enemies, rather than too far, let's put it this way. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's, a, it's supposed to be a 50-50, okay? Alrighty. Okay, now, this is the lady. We actually meet her here for the first time. And the interesting thing is, have you ever tried to name another character the exact same as the previous character? So we have our main character named Romp. And if we try to confirm this, the game goes bring. And every time we try to confirm this, by the way, uh, if you have name suggestions for the lady, let me know. Uh, every time we try to confirm this, the game tries to set up the lady, which means uh, it gives you her weapon, it equips the weapon, it gives you her armor and it equips the armor. So our inventory is going to look a little bit weird because we just received a bunch of armors. Go, 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 right. <laughs> That's fair. Which I will be able to show off the go, go, go part. But not in the usual way. Alrighty. This is a reference to having no name on a character, but the character name is still getting called. Alrighty, welcome to the team. Go, 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 go. Well, actually, that's not right. Also, we have now her weapon, 
the only way you get the spike knuckle is by getting the name and introduction for the lady. So, we give her a helmet, which is nice, and there's a bunch of kung fu suits. <laughs> Way too many, in effect. They should not be here. And another little fun fact here. Um, all of these kung fu suits, the lady actually has equipped. So if I unequip this kung fu suit right here, she has the next one equipped. I know it's in the same spot here, but basically, we have to unequip them a bunch of times because technically she had the, every single one of these kung fu suits equipped beforehand. Until just now. Oh, and by the way, just kind of as a demonstration, let me try to get this set up. If I move her to a specific point, which actually I think this is about right, and now I basically trash something that she has equipped, kind of like before with the boy, this reduces the item amount by 4 in our inventory. And if you remember, we had 4 barrels in our inventory. Which means, if I stood in the correct place here, which I'm not sure about... Okay, the barrel also now is 0 barrels, because we reduced the amount by 4. Kind of the same concept as the previous stuff. So alrighty. And we get out of here. Now, if you want to keep the lady in your party, you have to interact with these statues down there and basically show the lady, hey, there's no way to get through here. So we kind of have to go and find another way through. So finding another way through is actually what we're going to be doing here, but not in the intentional way, so let's put it this way, of the game. Basically, we're just kind of doing everything a little bit out of order. So we just kind of got the lady, and the reason why we got her is because we need a second character for what is to come, coming up. Purmst. Alright, let's get back to the Water Palace. And yes, we could watch the entirety of the Water Palace cutscene with the lady, and the boy just kind of trailing behind. It's kind of weird. But we're going to take a slightly different tour here. And by the way, the goal of the lady is to find dialogue, right? So the only way to ever get them back together without them knowing somehow is to, well, bring her right here. <laughs> of course, the game is not set up to deal with this kind of things, so... Welcome to the back door. So. These rope poles here are kind of weird. This is where I need a second control loop in order to demonstrate things. So, um, in the bottom, there's these little ones and zero. Uh, one and two, he, uh, I can see it. This is kind of to indicate whether the first or second control of which character you're controlling, depending on which number is where. So, um, effectively, I'm now controlling the lady of the second character. And whenever you hit these rope poles, you're supposed to use the whip in order to be able to jump across. Just kind of a reference in case you may not know that. Um, whenever I hit them with any weapon, the game just kind of briefly stops everything, checks whether you have fulfilled two conditions. One is gathered at the gather spot near the rip, whoop, uh, whip pole, and two, whether you have a whip equipped. Now, we don't have a whip, so... The game just checks and then lets us go. But during this check, it actually, the first thing it does, the game allows you to walk through walls, because that's part of the script in order to get you across the gap. And this is kind of why it stops you too, it's just kind of, you're not supposed to kind of move here. So what I can do here is I can force move the character by charging up a level 1 charge attack. For example, uh, for reference by the way, if I just release the button, charge attack, it moves the character forward like this. So, what I'm going to do here is, I'm going to release the charge attack just at the same time as I'm hitting the rope pole there with the lady. And this allows me to move through the wall. There is a technique to do this with just one controller, but two controllers makes this way easier. And now we are through. Now, how do we get the lady across? Well, you could do the same thing and have her do like a level 1 charge attack with the sword, but that would need her to actually level up the sword. An alternative way of getting her through the wall is using the AI. Because if I tell the AI to target this enemy, she will stop at nothing, and I mean nothing, to try and get to that enemy, as long as she can walk through the wall. So, I tell her to attack this guy, 
and while I hit the rope hole, she can just walk straight through the wall. And that's exactly what we do there. Alrighty. My sword reaches level 2, that is very nice, because we're gonna be using that. In fact, I might actually just demonstrate on what I will be using that for right around here, rather than doing anything else, because we're gonna use it against the boss, let's put it this way. Is using the AI the other way to do that with only one controller? No, actually, um, the problem with trying to use the AI to get over there is no enemy is actually on the screen in order for you to be able to do this. The way you do this with one controller is you actually have to charge up the character's charge attack standing in the correct spot, release it, quickly switch over to the other character with the select button, give a barrel to the character, and then hit the rope pull while you're hitting this. This is kind of, to my knowledge, the only way to do this with just one controller. And yeah. Nose Master, thank you! Thank you so much for 7 months of support, welcome back, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay. Thank you so much. Alrighty, so... Um, let me go ahead and demonstrate another glitch. So this is a pretty well-known glitch. And there's two different setup methods for it. Um, right now I only have access to one. So what I'm gonna do here is I go into the AI menu, the AI behavior menu, the action grid, and I'm gonna tell the boy to start charging up his weapon to level 1. So he starts charging up his weapon to level 1. Now it's at level 1, and the game does kind of a bit of a weird thing here, where it recognizes, okay, you have reached the maximum charge level, so let me just keep the charge bar there and increase the number right there. However, if I tell the boy now to charge up to level 2, it immediately jumps to level 2 without any further charging. So that's kind of neat, so we have instantly the boy at level 2 without him having to charge. But also, the AI uh, is weird in that if I tell him now to only charge up to level 1, the game gets really confused, because it has not yet reached charge level 1, so it just keeps charging. And yeah, the boy's charge bar just kind of goes absolutely haywire, because every other frame like, basically 30 times a second, the game increases your charge level by 1. And normally, to give you a frame of reference, the maximum charge level is 8, normally. But right now we have a charge level of 120 or something like that. It's kind of crazy, and each charge level gives you 50% more damage compared to what you had before. So if I tell the boy to go at attack, um, he's probably gonna try and do that, but he might fail. But yeah, he just dealt 999 damage, which is the maximum amount of damage you can possibly do to any enemy. So this is pretty well known, I will say, overall. And we can use that in order to just one-shot the early game bosses, because most of them don't have more than, well, 999 HP. Hello, welcome to your Rekidactylus, I hope you're doing well. And I'm just gonna go ahead and run through here. These chairs are pretty fun. Oh, I kind of like to also point out two more things, and I imagine most people have known some of these things before. Oh, by the way, I switched. I stepped onto the switch a second time, because when you close the door, the game wants to make sure that nobody is caught inside the door, so it just gathers your party right here, and this is an easy way to just get the other character across here. Alright, this is dangerous. You know what we're gonna do? Barrels. So, I know a lot of people have very little experience casually with the barrels because one, you can only buy them from Nico, and two, they are really expensive. Like, if you don't use the money glitch, using barrels is a huge investment. And you just press the attack button once and the barrels are gone. But if every character in your team is barreled, that means the enemies don't know you're there. Like, they literally don't acknowledge the existence of a character that is in the barrel state. As soon as I press the B button, the barrels are gone, and they attack us again. But yeah, um, what barrels do is they prevent any damage that comes from a non-magical source. 
And non-magical means anything that is not specifically a spell that you as the sprite or the lady can cast. So even something that looks very fiery and strong and fiery, um, if you cannot cast that ability, it's not considered a spell and you take no damage from it. Alrighty. If your game, yes please. And this is less of a glitch or a particularly amazing trick here, and more of a... Yeah, I did this as a kid. So if you go ahead and go up here, if you have a ranged weapon, well, which normally you should have a ranged weapon here, at this point, you can just sit here and kill these guys with a boomerang or the bow and just grind a bunch. I'm not sure about you, but this is what I did as a kid, just kind of sitting here, trying to get a bunch more money and trying to buy stuff from Nico because Spiky Tiger is a monster of a boss. But if you're a little bit more confident in your ability, what you can do is, this is actually a quicker grind right here. These three chairs here, if you just uh, push them together, which is kind of dangerous, you don't want to have the chairs go um, away. If you just push them over there, the chairs literally cannot hit you because they keep running into the wall here, and then you can just finish them off, just hitting them like this. And this is really good experience and money, and if you get the rare drop from one of these chairs, you actually get a barrel for free. So, if you want to have a slightly quicker grind, or you do like a solo challenge, this is a really good grinding spot. Although in the solo challenge, if you get hit by the chairs, they can just easily combo you and kill you straight up. So you may want to be a bit careful about that. Alrighty. I want to do it like the second controller already, but... This is mostly I want to control a playthrough here. Alternatively, by the way, if you want to do a bit of grinding, these two chairs here, you just stand over here. They cannot attack you through the banister of the stairs here, so you're perfectly safe here. This is also a bit faster than the two wolves earlier. Although the two wolves have a common drop of a cup of wishes. Alrighty. Hello. Okay, and welcome to Spiky Tiger. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use a barrel before we go in here on the lady, and then we go in here. Is this the Mana Palace music? Kind of is, isn't it? Alrighty, so. Just kind of a bit of a demonstration about Spiky Tiger here coming up. Also, dialogue somehow beat us getting to this point. Now, Spiky Tiger is one of the most dangerous bosses in the entire game, and tanking him down is... Like, it's genuinely difficult. If you struggle against this boss, yeah, that... That... that thing is mean. So, what you can do is you can use a barrel in order to tank him. So what I'm gonna do is as follows. I'm just gonna move the boy straight down, he's not gonna get hit here. And the lady here is now actually too far away. Uh, please hit the lady. Ah, oh, he's jumping. That's fine. Alright, so if he's on the tower over there, he has a high chance of just doing his fire attack. So now what I'm doing is, I actually do not attack myself. Because if I press the B button, the barrel is gone. What I'm doing here is I'm actually just kind of coercing him into doing the eating attack. But because the lady has a barrel equipped, she doesn't take any damage from it. Um, even if you don't have a barrel, that eating attack is actually the least dangerous thing Spiky Tiger can do. So you actually want to feed one of your cactus over to Spiky Tiger here, in order for him to not be nearly as dangerous. Also, whenever he jumps down from these towers on the left and the right, he does in fact um, land in the exact center, and if you face up with the boy or the sp uh, uh, the boy or the girl in any of the corners, they don't get hit. Left and right sometimes they get hit, and the sprite actually has wider of a hitbox and always gets hit. It's kind of mean. Either way, uh, Spiky Tiger actually only does his ball attack when he does other things, and there we go. Fire breath normally engulfs in flames, but because this is not a spell the sprite or the lady can cast, um, it doesn't deal damage. Here, however, this is a spell the sprite and the lady, or the lady specifically, can cast. The fire breath here, this will deal damage to her through the barrel. 
And he always attacks, by the way, the cactus that is closest to him. So this is also something worth noting. So I can just wait here until he comes down. And he never does that rolling attack or the jumping attack when he is in the bottom center, because, as mentioned before, he will prioritize using the eating attack. So what are we gonna do here is we're gonna have the boy AI start charging up to level 1. And he could have just jumped back onto the towers if he were unlucky. Then I tell him to go back up to level 2, immediately tell him to go back to level 1, and then I just have the boy attack. And Spikey Tiger did. Yeah, I didn't have to use the glitch there in order to kill Spikey Tiger, because as long as I just have the barrel, I could just tell the AI to continuously attack Spikey, and I can mostly just tank everything, except for the fire breath, so to speak. No problems. And yes, a lot of these bosses are really tough. So by the way, you might notice the boy is already charging up his weapon. That is because he was charging the weapon before we got teleported here. And he still thinks there's an enemy nearby because his variable for charging up just doesn't get reset. Alrighty, that's fine. Alright, and that's kind of all we do here. We get the whip and we go back. Oh, by the way, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I did not actually know that Eleni can teleport you outside. And if you ever wondered why this beatrun picks up the chest with, what is it, 50 gold? Because the lady actually does not teleport you outside unless you pick up both treasure chests. Now she teleports us outside. So you have to pick up both of them. Alrighty, also, um, during this text box here, so the lady is called Go Go Go, but there's another character going to be after this place here that is talking, and that is supposed to be the sprite. But you may notice we've actually never named the sprite, and there you briefly saw it, and a character name that is empty, the game for some reason initializes everything with the highest possible value, and the highest possible value for a character results in the word go. And because there's technically 12 characters for a character name that get interpreted, um, it just kind of writes 12 times go, or 24 characters total, which, well, it's kind of slow if you try to go fast in a speedrun. Alright, I'm just gonna equip the whip on the boy here. But you know what? I kind of would like to have the whip on the lady as well. But we can do that later. Actually, yeah, that's gonna be a thing for later. I'm actually gonna start um, ch leveling up the whip here. So in the speedrun you will see the, uh, the players level up the spear as the secondary weapon. I'm just gonna go with the whip here. It doesn't matter what secondary weapon. But I want to have a weapon that is level 1 in order to use the other method of the overcharge glitch. Which is going to make it a lot easier for me to hit the enemies. So I'm starting to level up the whip here towards level 1. And yeah, Go 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 is used for any character that doesn't have a name yet. Because that's just what the game considers to be an empty area. It just initializes everything with... well the highest possible value, and this just happens to correspond to Go Go Go. If you play the Japanese version, and you see an empty character, it literally just is empty. Like, there's nothing written there. Because the Go only happened in the translation, so to speak. Alright, this is how you're supposed to get across here. This is the intended method. But yeah, um, somebody asked earlier, um, how do you, in fact, get across here with just one controller? So, the way you do this is... You would have the lady here. And curious enough, um, the lady actually tries to get to you, but the AI cannot go past certain event tiles. And the tile below the rope hole there is an event tile, so she's just stuck there. So you would just ch uh, start charging up here. 
Release, immediately switch character, give the barrel over to the boy, and then hit the rope pull here just in time to be able to go across. I didn't do that right actually, but th that would kind of be the idea. Alrighty, so Dialog is still here, even though he got sent to another place. And now, this is the important part here by the way, if you do the early game out of order, you have to do this weird and arcane thing, and shout out to Crow for coming up with this route to begin with, because this is really not something that you would even consider to do if you were just trying out things randomly. Because this is where you normally get softlock, because you're supposed to get Undini, but you cannot go into the Undini cave because the plot sequence is not advanced enough for that to happen yet. So what do we have to do in order to, well, actually be able to make everything completable is we have to advance Pandora cutscene plot triggers far enough to be able to uh, go ahead, let's put it this way. And yes, it's technically used for the boy too. That is indeed accurate. Just leveling up the whip along the way here. Any enemy that only gives me... Well, any enemy that is lower level than me gives me only half the weapon experience. So, we enter Pandora. And then we go back outside. This is all we needed to do. Because whenever you enter Pandora, the game checks as to um, what your current game state is. Whether it needs to put the guard in the way, or whether it needs to do anything else. Or in this case, the game actually put Fana at the bottom right. Because we just kind of advanced the story of Pandora far enough that, well, that's normally what happens. And now, after we do this, we just kind of go back here. Need a sword in order to go through there. Also, by the way, that little guy is called a High Stepper. Which, by the way, this High Stepper dude down there, he is the reason why in this area, if you ever noticed it, there can only be two enemies at any given point. Normally, the maximum amount of enemies you can have in an area is three. But in this game here, that High Stepper always occupies one enemy slot. And it never can have more than two enemies at any given point in this entire section here. Alrighty, so we now go ahead and do the Water Palace cutscene. Animals are leveling the whip, it should be up to level one soon, I think. There it is. Whip level one, which will allow me to do some other shenanigans. So, by the way, after the Water Palace cuts. Oh, wait, no. I'm not gonna say it, you're gonna see it. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Let's go, Harp. Just does not even acknowledge the lady being there. And this is where we just watch the cutscene. Now, what normally happens after you complete the Water Palace cutscene here, also, the boy's just kind of trailing weirdly behind us, it's kind of funny. Um, normally what happens during this cutscene here is... The game recognizes that, okay, the guard should be gone from Pandora and actually let you go into Pandora. And also, the cannon travel guy should allow you to travel to another place now than before. The cannon travel guy in this case is not actually affected whatsoever, but... Because the game effectively increases the value for Pandora by one, and we just said it so that Fana is now walking around in Pandora, the next higher value means that, well, Fana is going to be in front of the ruins rather than anywhere else. So we just watch the entire cutscene here. That's kind of all we do. It's kind of really weird to have the lady do the cutscene, but eh, this is fine. If I were to select the boy as the second character here, I can actually walk around with him. Often in cutscenes, your characters are just locked into place, but in this case here... Well, he can just walk around if I have a second controller. Just kind of for fun. I don't want to accidentally softlock the game, so I'm just gonna make sure I don't do that. I don't actually know whether you can do this. So. I think I selected the wrong option. Oh well. Let's say okay. 
And we hold up this sword. And the lady is holding up this sword. She is now the hero of mana, of course. Because who else wouldn't be? Alrighty, here we get the spear. Receive the spear. If we were to go into this cutscene here, by the way, after defeating Spiky Tiger, we would not acquire the spear. Like, we just don't get it. It's kind of curious. But also, you wouldn't be able to proceed either, so there's that too. We can save, yes please. And here's a little fun thing. Whenever you save, and then you reload that save file, it respawns you in the last place you entered the area from. And that is actually just kind of down here, allowing us to, well, skip the last few text boxes of Luca because we just saved. We also now have a spear in our inventory. Alrighty. Now, I have a question. Do you know what happens when you complete the Water Palace cutscene? And you have talked to the soldiers, I have mentioned it earlier. And if you don't remember, don't worry. Everything is just kind of a lot here. But hey! We get kidnapped by the goblins! More specifically, the lady gets kidnapped by the goblins. And the boy... Uh, he's just kind of standing around there. <laughs> so, these... Uh, Goblin characters here are technically enemies, and the AI considers them to be enemies, so whenever the goblins get too close, the AI just kind of tries to attack them. Well, fruitlessly, as you might be able to tell. And... Yeah. The boys' AI is just kind of freaking out because this enemy is really close by. And of course, oh yeah, the boy has to go into the pot, because that's just how it works. And then the lady, of course, is going to come ahead and save the lady. Because <laughs> this lady, lady AI here is basically just an NPC, whereas the lady we have in our team, that is the real character. A case of mistaken identity, huh? Hey, wait! Left without even telling me her name. Yeah, who's that weird doppelganger? Alrighty! <laughs> uh, I love this little cutscene with just having the wrong characters in it. It's great. Alrighty, so as mentioned before, um, we had Fana now. Actually, I could have shown that off. But normally what happens after you uh, get Andini, you go to the Earth Temple, get Gnome, and then Fana is walking around here. And then when, when you talk to her with the lady, or actually with the lady in your party normally. Actually, if you just talk to her, um, she gets teleported over to the Pandora Ruins. But, well... Actually... Uh... I need to save before I do this, because this could actually just game over me if I mess it up. Because the upcoming boss fight has a really strange quirk to it, and I kind of want to show that one off, because I don't get to show that one off otherwise. Alright, save here, just in case we die. I guess I could use... so, uh, by the way, for anybody who might not have noticed. This is the Super Nintendo Mini version. Which, technically speaking, Super Nintendo Mini is the exact same version as a regular cartridge for the Super Nintendo or your Wii Virtual Console version. Um, however, you might have just noticed that flashing effect is significantly toned down. And that is effectively the SNES Mini, the internal SNS Mini emulator that emulates the games here, it just kind of reduces these flashing effects. And this is kind of why I personally prefer playing the game on the SNS Mini version. That way I don't have to keep warning people about the flashing effects and such. It makes it basically a lot nicer. Alrighty. Right. 
So we're just gonna walk through here. By the way, there is a bunch of enemy spawn manipulation going on at times, but I can't really do this because I have the wrong weapons equipped. But in this next room here, if I hold up left into this wall here, the tomato guy that is normally on here does not spawn. Because the game thinks I'm trying to go to the up and left area and consequently tries to put an enemy in my way where I'm going because it always has to spawn the enemies off screen so you don't see them just popping in out of nothing most of the time. Oh no, the boy slowed down. Oh. Um. Okay, I'm actually gonna use a save state here. Because this is... How uh, do I make a save state again? Uh, press and hold Y. Alright. The reason I want to make a save state is because if you play the game um, multiplayer and you try to be really fast, you might try to do certain camera and such manipulation. So basically, normally in most cutscenes, what the game will do is it allows your characters to briefly be able to walk through walls in order to gather on specific points. Now the thing is, um, if you have an AI control cat or a character that is trying to get to a gather point on a cutscene, but they cannot do that because they are in the wrong place, um, what ha ends up happening is that the boy just kind of gets stuck in a place where he shouldn't be. Oh, actually, it didn't happen this time. But basically, you can actually softlock the game by uh, the game just not allowing you to go any further than where you would be before. Poor sprite totally left behind. We're gonna get the sprite because otherwise we can't continue the game properly. But it's gonna take a while. Alrighty, so... It didn't work in this case, but basically when we did this and just tried to run into certain places, we just kind of got soft locked here, trying to go fast. Um, which one is controller one again? The other one, that's good. Alright, so, I'm gonna use the second method here now of using overcharge. So this is the wall phase boss, and... Let me explain something real quick before we uh, go much further here. If you've ever thought that Secret Mana has uh, questionable hitboxes, you're right. But there's actually more to it than just questionable hitboxes. On top of that, there is actually a chance to hit and miss mechanic that the game doesn't tell you about. Like, there's absolutely no indicator as to whether you missed or not. In fact, actually, if you play the phone version of the game, which maybe I should play that on stream sometime, uh, it actually does tell you that you missed. Which is such a nice thing. Basically, there's a difference between you not hitting because your weapon's hitbox just doesn't connect with the enemy, and there's a dif uh, between the game just deciding, you know what, you rolled a 60 instead of a 70, you don't actually hit the enemy. And this is kind of what can happen on Wallface. Wallface is the first boss that has evasion, in that sense that you can just straight up miss and there's nothing you can do about it, it's just pure luck. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set up a overcharge glitch with a second controller here. So I'm holding down the charge button with the second controller and I'm effectively doing the exact same thing I did with the AI control area, but this time we're switching weapon. The boy only has the whip at level 1 and he has the sword at level 2. So, if I put that level 2 charge he has right now onto the whip, the game is going to go crazy with the whip and it's gonna overcharge. And the reason why I like the whip is because this allows me to overcharge it a lot. Now, there's another component to this. You can actually keep a charge attack, basically unleash the charge attack without the game taking it away or reducing the number of how many charge attacks you have. I basically close the menu here on the second controller and then hit the B button right after in order to keep the charge attack and unfortunately this is just a straight up miss. Also, another technique here that I like to use is when an enemy or AI get hit by an ability or a spell you can actually use an item on them, in this case for example a barrel, 
and it just denies the damage. There we go. Alright. I'm killing both of the eyes here, just to demonstrate something else. Alright. Now. This is actually potentially really, really dangerous here. So... I want to have a very particular setup for this. So, now... What happens here is the wall face is trying to squish you. If he reaches the bottom at any point, you actually, um, you instantly die. But, as I've mentioned before, AI control cactus cannot move the camera. So if I set this up properly here... There we go. AI control cactus cannot move the camera. What is happening here is, the game is trying to tell the lady, who is AI controlled, to run down two tiles. But, because the AI control cactus cannot run there because that's outside of the camera boundaries, it, she just kind of gets stuck, and the wall face gets stuck too. So, you can effectively use an AI control cactus to stop the wall entirely because they're just um, not smart enough to understand what's happening. But again, if I get all the way to the bottom there, uh, I would die. So... <laughs> this could be dangerous if I miss here. I hope I don't miss. Uh-oh. Yes. No! Ah, <laughs> oh, this is why I saved. Uh, this is why you don't normally want to do this in the speedrun. <laughs> I guess I could use the safe state, but it's fine. This is a casual ish playthrough. Worth it to show that off, yep. And XF, thank you. Thank you so much for 72 months of support. That's crazy. Welcome back, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay. Yeah, I have a state, yes, but also I kind of like to just play the game as if I, uh, if this was on a regular console rather than the SNES Mini 2. Which, by the way, if you use save states in your playthrough, I think that is perfectly valid because. Secret of Man, and especially a lot of the older games, use any form of emulator, including the SNES Mini, please do use save states. Because unless you're looking to get that kind of weird old game challenge, um, a lot of them are just straight up unfair. I do not deny this. I personally enjoy that kind of additional challenge, but that's me. <laughs> So, I will always be in favor of people being able to use safe states. The will of course always be the purists that just kind of never want to use anything that the game didn't originally have, which, that's fine too. I think that is a perfectly valid way to play through as well. I just kind of like to say everything is fine as long as you're having fun, which is the main goal, right? You mostly use states to retry a glitch? Well, that works too. Especially if you're trying to test out stuff, like for speedrun testing. It's kind of mandatory almost to be able to have an easy way to just try and retry certain things in order to figure them out, right? You actually found the game quite easy, even when you played it as a kid. Nice. Honestly, aside from Spy Kid Tiger, Nothing was too insanely difficult except for the pure lands beginning until you finally get your equipment pieces. At least in my opinion. Am I picking up lore percent run again? Probably at some point, yes. I will be playing those again. Because I just kind of felt like, you know what, let's play some of these older um, games at some point. Alrighty. Um, let me just kill the wall face right here. We're just going to use the overcharge glitch. And... Boom. Wallface, I think, has 900 HP. So 849 plus, what was it, 26, which is barely not enough.
But yes, there will be lore percent runs for Terranigma and Second Insetsu 3 and Tears of Fantasia. But I cannot guarantee when that's exactly gonna happen. I'm kind of trying to aim for... Well, maybe next Yaga Month, which is kind of a throwback. Because why not? And yes, you definitely can heavily abuse magic in order to go places. Which, by the way, we haven't gotten any magic yet. We don't have Undini, we don't have Gnome, so... It would be quite a challenge to clear this boss here without magic. It's definitely doable. Especially, well, I have done solo character challenge runs with all three characters at any given point here. I've even done a challenge run where I did a solo sprite playthrough, but not using any magic. That was... Quite tricky, to say the least. Alrighty, now let me actually check my notes. Oh, I actually missed up something. That's fine. That is okay. Okay, next up, we're gonna go ahead and defeat Kelroy. So let's just run over to Gaia's Naval. And in case you're wondering, running is slightly faster than taking the cannon travel. As long as you don't get stuck everywhere, which... Getting stuck with an AI control character is... Uh... Very easy to do. That's just how it is. This game here is a little bit notorious for... Having AI control characters get stuck on everything. Well, maybe a little bit is a bit of an understatement, I suppose. What did I miss? I kind of could have removed the lady from the party earlier and gotten her at Pandora Castle again by going into Gaia's navel and then back to Pandora. But it's fine. Which, by the way, um, if you remember, we have never actually looked at the statues in the forest where the chopping hoods are and such to recognize that, hey, um, the lady wants to go to the forest still because that is where dialogue is. Ida has no memory of us going through basically the back door, so what is happening here is normally when you get the lady and you try to go in here, you kind of get the choice as to um, hey, this isn't the way to the witch's castle, where are you going? We're going to the underground palace. I'm not going and are going through by yourself? Yep. And she's gonna go. And in case you're wondering, yes, we can just go and grab her at the werewolves again. Because she gets kidnapped by the werewolves again. And we can do that up to three times if we sequence the entire thing properly. Also, since we never talked to Watts, um, he is kind of... Actually, we never defeat the Tropicala. That's kind of the thing. And I welcome to you, Zuka Blue. I'm showing off all the secrets, that's kind of the idea. What on earth? Something is coming. Did I activate it? Wait, I never talked to the... I never... talked to the... right dude. Alright, actually, sorry, I'm... I'm not supposed to fight Tropical at my rod right here. <laughs> so, um... We can... I want to point out something about Tropical. You know, Tropical is supposed to have two of these plant thingies right here. But there's only one. The other one spawns somewhere off-screen. And the reason for this is really weird and arbitrary. If you hold down the B button at the beginning of combat, or I think the select button, you can also hold the select button down. Um, if you hold down the select or the B button at the beginning of combat, the game for some reason spawns the second vine in the wrong place. I don't know why. But yeah, we have a whip now for this combat here, which is kind of strange. What is this sequence? This is the out of order early game. Where did the girl go? 
She left us at the entrance to Gaius or the well place here because she has not yet noticed that the statues are gone. Or the statues are blocking our way so we cannot go into the forest, even though we cleared the forest earlier. But this is weird because I never talked to the Sprite and the Elder. But Tropicolo still appeared here. I wonder why. Maybe if Crow comes by, he could tell me. Also, by the way, I'm just kind of standing in positions where the pumpkins are basically exploding on high ground, and that's why they don't hit me. But also, I have really high defense, so it doesn't matter for the most part. I hope I didn't... <laughs> the boss fight started before entering the Dwarf Village. Um, the Dwarf... So the lower area here is part of the Dwarf Village. It's the same, like, general region. So that's why that happens. Hey, we got a Spear Orb. Yeah, plot advancement got definitely got out of whack. I hope I didn't mess it up now, because this could be that we are soft-locked in a way, which means I would have to restart the game <laughs> real quick. That would be a little bit awkward. Alright, let's go and... Get the sprite. Please name the little sprite, and I think the sprite's name... Which is gonna go with the good old tradition of Taco. I got that save state. I don't think the save state is gonna save me because the save state is afterwards, but true. So, we also just got the sprite's uh, boomerang button, and this is also where we get the bow and arrows. Which, by the way, I think what is gonna happen... Alright, let's see. <laughs> Hang on. I think what's gonna happen here is... Yep! We're stuck here. This is behind the loading trigger for... Um, going down to the boat, so... <laughs> it's just gonna get sent down to kill, right? We can magic rope out of this, yes, that is an option. Oh, well, hey! Box! Get a whip orb. Hi, guys. Alrighty, welcome to Kilroy. I meant to defeat Kilroy with just a boy, but hey, we have a sprite now in our team. The sprite who just kind of got sucked down the hole right after defeating Tropicolo. Oh, by the way, technically speaking, the lady still has the sword equipped. So what happens here is, when I equip the sword on the sprite, it's going to move the sword in that like little exchange fashion that normally happens. But the lady's gonna be whoop all the way off screen there. I always thought it was kind of a weird thing. Either way, Kilroy is not really that dangerous of an enemy. You normally have at least water magic, but I'm just gonna speed up the process of killing him. So yeah, let's just knock him out. If you'd like to have like glitchless solo challenges where the boss fights are more of a big thing. Um, I have plenty of videos for that if you'd like to see that. This is just trying to show off all the other things that I don't usually get to show. Alrighty, moving on. By the way, here, the sprite is actually in control of the cutscene. Oh, merci. The sprite is actually in control of the cuts in here, because the sprite is actually the last character controller who has had the menu open. So, the way the game checks as to who it should give control after defeating a boss fight is by whatever uh, controller had the menu open last. 
And if you play the Japanese version, if you switch off that character that had lost the menu open, you will softlock. The Japanese version is actually notoriously even more softlock heavy, where it just straight up lose and it's really bad. Don't recommend playing the Japanese version unless you play the Wii Virtual Console version of the Japanese version because they patched that there. Either way, um, moving on. Let's bring it back to the Water Palace. Sure. Oh boy, I was not supposed to defeat uh, Tropic Hollow yet. I hope that doesn't mess up too many things. By the way, the Elder is not standing here. The opening is right there. And... I'll do. Well, we just defeated Kilroy, which means um, defeating Kilroy set the Water Palace to a strange um, status, let's put it this way. Oh! We can also go ahead and grab the axe, so this is gonna be easier to get back in here. Because we actually kind of need the axe in order to proceed. We can't just skip this forever. Well, I mean, you could if you use the arbitrary script, script execution, but that's beyond the scope of this playthrough. Alright, so, I wanna uh, demonstrate something else. So, you know how the game kind of decides to alter arbitrary values? Whenever you... ...have something equipped and then you uh, delete that equipped item. So basically, depending on where I stand horizontally on the screen, the game just alters the wrong values, let's put it this way. So what I can do is I can actually unequip the sword. So right now, the game kind of keeps in memory the exact same way it keeps in memory how or which character has which item piece equipped. So right now the sprite has the sword equipped. So if I stand in a specific spot, which is two tiles to the right of where the left camera boundary is, in case you're curious where that is. If I stand in a specific spot, let me actually see whether I find a good setup here. This is probably fine. This is one tile, and this should be a second tile right here. Alright, if I stand in a spot where the camera bound just two tiles to the right of the left camera boundary, and then I delete an item that the sprite currently has equipped, like the mid rope here. Then the sprite now has the sword unequipped. This, uh, it still functions uh, perfectly normal as the sword, but what I can do now is I can have another character equip the sword too, and we have now two swords. Because why not? Alright, that's kind of the main thing I wanted to show there. There's actually more weapon related that you can do some shenanigans with. I wonder if you can equip two weapons at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking about all sorts of other stuff that is not really part of this playthrough, because I only just recently uh, now realized certain things about about things. Alrighty, moving on. Do you know how the PAL version compares to this when it comes to glitches? I guess way less glitches since it was released later. There are definitely less glitches, for example the... Um, uh, frost country stuff just doesn't work, but I actually don't know what other things do or don't work anymore in the PAL version. I've not played that version in a long time. Careful not to softlock if you try new stuff. In this case it likely wouldn't softlock. Worst case scenario it would crash the game, but I don't think it would, but I actually also don't know. But 
But yeah, I actually don't really know how it compares to the PAL version. To be completely honest. And... Once we are done with the entire early game being out of sequence, by the way, I'm gonna take a short break, so I will guess that's going to be in 15 to 20 minutes. So if you're looking to take a break and are looking for a good opportunity, um, that's probably what I'm gonna be trying and do. Let's put it this way. The QA life is getting to you already. It actually is, it really is. Because I recently started playing a little bit of, what's the game called? Rise, uh, Rise of the Third Power, and there's a few things that I kind of noticed that I thought was like, Oh, I should report that. Wait, no, I shouldn't because... Well, maybe I should, but... <laughs> yes, it definitely gets to you, Duffy. <laughs> Alrighty. Now, the reason why I saved is because this upcoming boss here is going to be rather tricky. So. Which boss comes normally after defeating Kilroy? Well, Jabberwocky, of course. We still don't have any new magics to defeat the bosses with. By the way, I will probably be just switching to glitchless strats once we are back on track after the out of order wacky early game shenanigans. So we'll see. Alrighty, what will you do? Hand over the seed. Don't worry about the lady not being there, this is actually kind of normal for one player to control the strats. Welcome to Jabberwocky. Um, if you do a solo character challenge, this guy is actually really mean. Um, because what effectively happens against Jabberwocky is he has Acid Rain. And let me tell you, he has actually more magic power than Dark Lich. It's kind of wacky, because they kind of balanced it around that his Acid Rain deals a decent amount of damage. So they gave him a ridic ridiculous amount of magic power, which does mean that if he does ever a single target Acid Rain, that single character is going to take like 300 or 400 damage from it. So good luck surviving that. In a solo character challenge run, you just hope he doesn't use it. That's literally all you do. In this run here, I'm just gonna go ahead and do the good old one player two controller strategy. And hope that I hit him before he knocks me out. Uh, the sprite would die here if I don't heal the sprite, so let me do that real quick. Poison gas is an ability, it is not affected by multi-target or mul no multi-target. Okay, so Sprite had the menu open last year, so Sprite would get the cutscene afterwards. I opened the menu now on the boy, so the boy gets the menu afterwards. Alrighty, Jabberwocky basically kind of straightforward, except we didn't have any magic to work against him. Which by the way, Crow did this all in... The most solo way possible the entire playthrough, it was kind of fascinating to watch, which makes it very difficult, because you saw Chabberwocky, which, as I said, is quite a thing. Oh, by the way, something I never pointed out. The mana seed over there, you can interact with it as long as you stand close enough and face in the correct direction. And while it is in this state, you can just interact with it from over here. Now we sealed it again, and that is part of the requirement to proceed here. But if I just try to interact with it here, it doesn't work. You have to be facing up in order to interact with the mana seed, but you can still do that if you just face up behind the seed, because you're close enough and you're facing in the correct direction, because those are the only two conditions. <laughs> oh, by the way, you might notice that I sometimes walk backwards. If you hold R and B at the same time, your character does not change facing direction. So you can moonwalk places. Okay, we get another whip orb, which is mostly irrelevant for me. You actually never have to talk to Gemma here, you just only have to talk to Luca in order to be able to proceed at this point.
Save the game, sure. And by the way, we did spawn in the middle of the arena rather than at the entrance, so it's actually not as efficient to save and quit. By the way, I love this music, it's so good. Unfortunately, whenever you walk on steps, it's not that great. And the music continues here. So there are certain screens in Secret of Mana where they don't have or play their own music. So if you somehow get to the screen without having any music playing, it just never plays any music. But it actually just continues playing music from whichever screen you were before. So if we go down here to change up the music, this is the music that will now play in this screen right here as well. So just kind of a little fun fact here. Alrighty, you know, I would like to go ahead and... <laughs> no fishy there. Fishies don't appear there. Uh, we just go ahead and... Go straight into here. Right after Chapel Rocky, the normal way, right? <laughs> so, now you might be wondering, does the lady actually get the magic when she is not in the party? And the answer in this case will be yes. And the reason why the lady actually gets the magic, despite her not being in the party, is because the way the game does it is... It always gives all the characters the magic once you acquire it. However, and this is kind of the important part here, um, if you name a character, the character uh, sheet, so to speak, gets completely wiped and set to the entire baseline of what it's supposed to be when you meet the character for the first time. But because we did not name both the sprite and the lady, both of them will never have that character wipe anymore and they will get the spells. So consequently, if I were to pick up Andini here and then go and get the lady and give her a name afterwards, she would actually not have Andini as a spell school. The way the one player two controller run gets kind of around that is you don't get to give her a name if you meet her for the first time in the desert sand ship. And yes, oh, I completely forgot to point that out. Yes, the previous boss there, um, the way it works, it has 600 HP in phase one, and I think 700. A lot more in phase 2. And once you deal at least 300 damage to the phase 1, it transforms into the second boss and gets its health fully refilled. However, if you deal enough damage to entirely kill phase 1 without the boss getting any to do anything in between, um, he just straight up dies rather than giving you a second phase. I will actually be able to demonstrate that in the Ice Palace if I don't forget about it. Oh, right, I forgot about this. Alrighty, we now have our first spell, Andini. What do we do with Andini? Well, of course, we get self. Kind of the standard way of doing things, right? That's how it works. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just kind of amused by the route that Crow came up with. Alrighty, now, what are we gonna do here is we have defeated Chabaroki, and defeating Chabaroki is the trigger for us to be able to go to the Upper Lands. And welcome to the next part of the game. Or are we going there? Now, here's the catch. Unfortunately, um... If we go to Matanga... ...and try to go through the cave after Matanga, there is a part where I need gnome spells in order to be able to proceed. So, unfortunately we will we'll have to go back and get gnome, so this kind of is inefficient. Now, we have to talk to one of these Moogles in order to be able or the sprites to remember certain things, or more specifically for us to get the information that we should help the little moguls. 
The first Moogle appearance outside of Japan, indeed. Alrighty. Welcome to... The encounter with the little... Pebblers here, they are called. Call them Hedgehogs, Sonics... All of those are correct. And these guys actually have evasion. So effectively right now there's approximately, I don't know, 60-ish, 60... 5% chance for me to hit, but effectively a 1 in 3 chance for me to miss. And let me actually demonstrate something that I kind of missed demonstrating until now. Also, by the way, instead of overcharge glitch, let's just start using spells on the sprite instead. So, most people probably know that if you select the allies menu with spells, you can actually cast them quicker than you would otherwise be able to before. But right now, Sprite has no more MP, so I'm gonna give the Sprite one of the Fairy Walnuts. And this effectively keeps stacking damage on enemies. Now, this is kind of sort of intended to be able to stack damage on enemies, because enemies cannot stack spell damage on you, the player character. If an enemy casts a really powerful spell on your character and immediately before the spell concludes casts a very weak spell on the character that weak spell takes precedence and just wipes out all the damage you would have taken from the previous one but here let me demonstrate something real quick so normally when i charge up a weapon and i get it to the appropriate level you just have to restart charging up from the beginning however if i open up the menu on the second controller release the attack button on the first controller, and then immediately press it as this uh, menu is closing. Right now, you can see the character is moving around really slowly. This is because the game still thinks I have a level 2 charge attack. It didn't actually wipe that out because of the menu shenanigans, and I can immediately do a level 2 charge attack again. This is what you constantly see in the one player 2 controller speedrun. This is how they preserve their uh, charge attack. Good day, Zola Shell, and welcome. Hope you're doing well. Also, welcome everybody. Hope you're doing well. You playing this out of order, scaring me for the minimum XY playthrough? Ah, uh, there might be something there. Actually, if you, actually, I don't know. I'm just kind of following Cross Rock right now with a slight hiccup. Let's put it this way, because I didn't mean to get the sprite as early as I did. But yeah, um, let's go ahead and defeat the next boss, of course, that is Spring Beak. Don't worry about not having defeated the Fire Gigas. We can just do this later. Well, actually, it can't be much later. But it could be a little bit later. We could go all the way to Matango and get stuff out of there first. Alrighty, since we don't have Gnome, and I'm gonna play this a little bit, well, somewhat glitch-ish less. Um, well, our best option to defeat the Spring Beak here is... ...using spells. Now, Spring Beak here. Real quick. If you ever try to hit this guy with a melee weapon, which by the way, a whip does count as a melee weapon, and from the front, you hear that zing noise, that means Spring Beak just deflected your attack. And that's kind of generally true whenever you hear that zing noise. Sometimes you hear hitboxes anyways, but oh well. So, effectively that shield happens whenever you hit the hitbox of the shield, which is the beak of the spring beak in this case. And, well, you don't just specifically hit the body of the character itself. This is why bow, arrows and javelin are actually kind of decent against Springbeak, because they kind of circumvent that shield by just poking into the enemy in one specific spot, usually. However, um, I don't really plan on playing too much with this guy. 73 Sprite is actually surviving here, because while casting a spell, the Sprite is entirely immune against spells, let's put it this way. Oh, except that one. 
Good thing I saved. <laughs> uh, spells that have projectiles that need to arrive at characters work very slightly differently because they don't take effect until they actually hit. And so the timing is different than what happens with um, other things. Let's put it this way. I knew that could happen, so well. But yeah, in case you were ever wondering why you can't hit Springbeak easily with weapons, you can hit him. It's just kind of difficult at times. Also, these owls only go into their chase AI once a character is actually silenced. Also, by the way, this screen, he this screen here, the one in the snow, is actually different than the one you initially arrive in, where the Moogles are walking around. It's actually two separate maps. Alrighty, let's hope that <laughs> we don't get absolutely murdered by the Spring Beak this time. Hello, welcome to Yam, Maddy. I hope you're doing well. Do I have a list of games that I own? Not really. Alright. Lost Circus again. But right now, Freeze is basically not dealing a whole lot of damage. Because he's not weak to Freeze and has a decent amount of defense against Magics. Actually, this... Yeah, he has a decent amount of defense against Magics, so until we hit Freeze level 1, we probably won't deal a whole lot of damage with this. We could just defeat this thing with the boy instead, directly. Oh, I messed up. Right is dead. Oh, he's using... Okay, so here's a thing I can do. He's going to hit the boy with the lightning bolt, and if I manage to open up my inventory after the animation, but before the lightning bolt hits, which I could do there, which is like, I don't know, a 5 frame window, I can actually deny the lightning bolt with just a solo character. Alright, there we go, level 1 on Dini on the sprite, so I think the sprite should be able to deal damage now, otherwise I'll actually have to use weapons, which I didn't really consider that beforehand. All good on your end? Nice. I'm doing quite fine, thank you. So, um, that is not as much damage as I hoped it would be. Just to show how important it is to use the correct element against the bosses when you have them. But, as you might notice, I don't have the correct element against Spring Peak. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna chain in a physical hit at the very e tail end of the spell animation against the boss here. And if I do it right, the boy actually can add the physical damage to... Uh, the spell damage on top of it. Which is a technique that is used in glitchless speedruns, because chaining damage is perfectly allowed and valid. And the fact that you just have to chain in physical damage in a very particular way just happens to be kind of a quirk of that system. By the way, uh, that would be too late. I'm gonna use the barrel to deny the damage here, because that is a quick animation. Um, by the way, Royal Jam works slightly different than other items for healing. You can effectively revive a character that is at 0 HP with a Royal Jam, as long as you're quick enough. You can never do that with candy or a chocolate. Alright. I might just resort to using an overcharge here too. Oh, by the way, there's another glitch that I have no idea how to reproduce, and um, that involves Spring Beak. So, when I was doing speedruns at some point, um, I somehow managed to hit a weird glitch that apparently involves the audio, according to one of the TAS videos wizards, HHS, who also is one of the people that knows way more about the game than me. Um, there, I basically hit Spring Beak at a very particular point while it was just kind of jumping around. Or being slightly off the ground, let's put it this way.
And when I managed to do that, somehow my boomerang upgraded to level 2 without ever having upgraded it to level 2. And consequently, after that, I was able to upgrade the boomerang to level... 10. 9 or 10? Whatever. One higher level than you normally can level up a boomerang. And what happens if you upgrade the strongest boomerang once more? You get a javelin. Because that is the next weapon in the list. Don't ask me how that works, because unfortunately I actually don't really know. And I don't know how to reproduce that one either. But that's just kind of what happens. Alright, I'm gonna try and finish this thing off with maybe some more javelin tosses. Because we can actually hit the thing with it. Balloon. Medical herbs allow you to remove any negative status effects, and as we all know, balloons are very negative. You never want to encounter a balloon. Which, I mean, I'm, I know I'm joking here, but that is actually kind of true for me as a person. For anybody who may not know, um, I have audiophobia, which means that any sudden loud noise kind of gives me pretty severe anxiety. And a little kid playing around with a balloon, for example, because it can just burst at any point, kind of gives me that same anxiety. So, <laughs> I actually don't like balloons. Uh, maybe just kind of on a weird random note, I guess. There we go, he's done. Took way longer than I hoped it would, but hey, we got it. You assume that means all the weapons are stored in the same list, and upgrading just increments the list by one. Exactly. You have a friend with the same sort of issues with balloons? Yeah. It's not just balloons, it's also, like, fireworks. I guess fireworks are mostly fine, as long as I wear or get, like, earplugs that are really... like, good at shielding against the noise, then it's fine for some reason. I mean, I guess it's the same for balloons, technically. So, we sealed the mana seed here. You got a chill down your spine, thinking about random balloon popping? Oh no. But yeah, that's a real condition, and that's a thing for me. So if you ever try to give me a secret birthday party, you ever somehow figure out what my birthday is, please no balloons. <laughs> That's all. You're usually fine with some noises when you know they are coming. I see. For me, it's kind of mostly the opposite, actually. I'm not fine with the noises and I know they are coming. Actually, especially if I know when they are coming. Sometimes it's actually perfectly fine when just random pop and it's loud and it's like, uh, whatever. But if I know there's the potential for something to make a loud noise, that is when I get my anxiety there, unfortunately. Alrighty. We have Sylph and Undini, but no Gnome. So we kind of have to backtrack now in order to get Gnome. So everyone jumping out from behind the couch and yelling is fine, but no balloons? Actually, pretty much exactly, yes. You do too. For your friend, she has dislike of the balloon squeak screech her hands across it. Yeah, I mean those noises are very unpleasant for me too, but it doesn't elicit the same kind of like fear response from me. Mercy for the meek! Thank you! Thank you so much for five months of support. Welcome back! And I'm glad you enjoy your stay. For your birthday, we will decorate the party room with uninflated balloons. I mean, as long as everybody knows that they are not supposed to blow up the balloons, then that's fine, right? <laughs> Alright, so, we need to go and get Gnome. So once we have defeated the Fire Gigas, we're actually back on ordinary track, let's put it this way. We could just defeat the Fire Gigas with Sylph here, 
which is what Crow did in his playthrough. But I'm just gonna kind of speed this up because honestly, I didn't expect the early game to take this long by itself just by me explaining all the things that we come across and there's still a lot more to come at this point. So, yeah. Oh, that's actually an interesting point. Water balloons are perfectly fine. I don't mind them. They don't make any sounds. Well, I mean, they make sounds, but... I was a big fan of water balloons as a kid. Probably still am, to be completely honest. Money glitch math was long. Yeah, it was probably a bit longer than necessary. It's kind of the concept of, if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. Time to kill. Basically, I meant to prepare and actually practice on how to explain those things, but I didn't really get around to doing that. Because there was just, well, a lot of work, really. And I tried to go to sleep in time, because Monday I have to get up at 5am, whereas my usual sleep schedule has been waking up at literally 1pm, because I'm currently working for an American company. And I effectively start my work at 3 p.m. So that's quite a shift over a short amount of time. So yeah. We're just running through here. Nothing too special. Alrighty, we are through here. <laughs> we need to keep wishing him happy birthday until the day he doesn't say it's not my birthday. That's one way to figure out how that works. Alrighty, we're just gonna use freeze here. But as I said, it's kind of funny that we could use Silph right here against the boss, which is definitely not the element that is antenna, so here, I have a lightning bolt. Also, let me check. Fix this point. Or thunderbolt is called. But I'm not the first one to throw a thunderbolt onto Fire Gigas, by the way. Crow has done that before me. And with just five more free spell casts, the boss here is going to be very, very deep. Then I need to read my notes again as to what we should do next. Alrighty, Fire Gears has been defeated. Very scary boss in the solo character run, if you remember correctly. Yeah, if you don't deny the damage from his spells that normally hit three characters, um, it's pretty terrifying. Oh, by the way, we can seal the seed here without ever talking to Gnome, technically. Which, sealing the mana seed is actually the thing that turns off the enemy encounters in the entire area, so we could just walk back now. Got Gnome's powers. To the mana seed. We've been there already, but sure, we can seal it again. But fun fact, you never have to seal the mana seed in this area if you don't want to. It's just not a requirement. And the game never checks for it, which by the way, the game also never checks whether you seal the mana seed of the wind. But I do recommend you do in fact seal them, because um, you can only level up spells to the next higher level if you have the next higher level or the next amount of mana seeds. Oh yeah, I, I did miss that question, sorry. By the way, if we try to use the magic rope here, where does it go? 
Well, it goes back to where we entered the area from, which happens to be from the Earth Temple. So there's that, by the way. Um, there is no dwarf dude telling me about the Mitch Mallet. So, not sure what that with that. In fact, I'm curious. Let me see first, <laughs> before I mess up stuff more. Let me save before I mess up more things. What happens if I now go over here? Because technically I never went to the cutscene with the sprite in the back over here. Okay, they're just not here. Weird. Alright, that's fine. Okay, and I think we are back on track for, let's say, a more normal playthrough. If you have any questions or anything like that, or things that you would like me to show off because I might forget about it or might have already forgotten about it, let me know. But at this point, this is where we can play through the game pretty much normally. Except we don't have the lady. <laughs> Which, by the way, <laughs> we could get the lady by defeating the werewolves. Then it would be a pretty normal playthrough. But effectively we have done all the triggers and things for the most part to be able to proceed through the game without uh, getting softlocked in any capacity. Okay, and with this we go to Water Palace, then we go to the Upper Lens, and then we take a break. Oh! Oh, I just realized there's one more thing before we get to the other place. There's one more thing I wanted to show off. This is something that most people know already, but you might not necessarily know as to why this is possible. And that is, we go back into Potatoes. I know it's called Potos Village, but ever since I heard the Potatoes thingy, I always thought that was really funny. That's an old, old, old reference at this point. Alrighty, so I think it was Proton John who said that. No, we're not supposed to get back in here into this place. However, if we just push against the NPC here, you may have noticed there the boy, he just moves one pixel. I just keep holding up and then I switch character to this right. And the boy just kind of moves one pixel in to the NPC. This is because the game still recognizes that the boy wanted to move up. But since I'm no longer in control of the character, if we just repeatedly do this, we can just go straight through the NPC. And the reason why this works... Actually, is there an NPC around here? I think this guy works. So, the reason why this works is because AI-controlled characters let me just use a second controller to demonstrate this. AI control characters can walk straight through NPCs in a non-combat zone. Non-combat means that there are no weapons drawn. So the boy can just go straight through the NPC whenever he tries to get to the characters. And basically, because the AI can go through NPCs, you can basically, in any non-combat zone, face through NPCs. With one caveat. One caveat here. You might notice I'm holding down and I'm pressing select and nothing happens. This is once again because AI controlled characters cannot move the camera. Effectively what is happening here, I am being stopped by the NPC and the AI controlled character is being stopped by the camera boundaries. So I have to scroll the camera down and then I can do this in order to get back outside. So, that's kind of also one more thing I wanted to show off. And last but not least, as I've mentioned before, um, the screen where you land in, where the Mughals are initially running around in the upper lands, in the snow area, is different than the screen where the enemies are in the snow area, which means if you actually come back to 
the water palace cannon and then shoot over to the upper land, it still gets you to the old screen where the Moogles used to be. Curiously enough, they did actually realize that to an extent and the Moogles are no longer spawning on this map, but this also means this is a non-combat zone map and there's no enemies present here. So yeah. Okay everybody, I'm going to take a short-ish break. Actually, it's not going to be that short. Let's say we're going to come back when the timer hits 2 hours and 40 minutes. So everybody, thank you so much for watching, listening and lurking. I hope you enjoyed the show and we're going to continue afterwards. If anybody who is live here has any questions or concerns, ideas, concepts, stuff you would like to have explained that I happen to pass by already, let me know. And... Be right back. Break time. And welcome back, everybody. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. The time for the break has ended. I have moved location here just a little bit because I like the music here better for just kind of standing around because it's not as short of a loop. So, we have acquired Sylph as well as Gnome for the sprite, which is kind of all we need in order to be able to proceed. We do, however, actually need a little bit more magic on the sprite. But also, this is an excellent opportunity to show you something else, if you did not know. Um, this here, if you need a little bit of grinding to be done in this area, if you just go out the door there and move to the left here, there's a stack of three of the Silk Tails, they are called. I want to call them Turbo Bites or Turbo Rabbites because that's what the German version says, but Silk Tails in this version. And you can just hit all of them. And you're perfectly safe from their regular attacks. They can't technically use spells, but I think you actually can't use it unless specific conditions are met, which should never be met if you are just sitting over here. So yeah, this is a very easy way to just grind up a bunch of money and stuff for the area. Here we have to use air blast in order to open up the orb. Turbobite is a way cuter name. Well, I'm inclined to agree. Like Pogapuschel is the German name for Ravite. For example. Turbopuschel, yes. Is the thing. A pushel is kind of like a Something really soft and plushy. Well, I guess plushy is a reasonably close translation. By the way, this is why we need the axe for these rocks right here. And technically, well, actually, do we need it later? Maybe. Either way, moving on. Welcome to the mushroom village. You know, while I have time to just explain a bunch of things. So, you know how the power wrist is really hard to replace because it gives plus 5 strength? There is an armband right here that actually gives plus 5 agility, the wolf's band. And the reason why that's kind of, sort of, useful is because agility is the stat that is used in order to check whether you hit or not on bosses. So I basically have a higher hit chance. It's not much higher hit chance, like it's barely noticeable usually, but it helps a little bit. But also, um, agility is used in order to check whether you do get a trap from a chest or you don't get a trap. If you are have high enough agility, you never get a trap, ever. If you have too low agility, you have a 50% chance to get a trap in possible trap chests. Also, we can actually just Go straight through this guy. Same trick as before, just press select and push through him. But I actually want to point out something in these little cuts in here. Oh wait, no, that's actually after we free Flammy. Not in that cutscene. You don't think you've ever had the sprite before the girl, is this one of the strange things? Yes, sort of. Getting the sprite before the girl is reasonably possible, even without any out of sequence or glitches or anything like that. But usually you get the girl before getting the sprite. By the way, 
I like that the truff King Truffle tells you, hey, um, I have a chest for you in my bedroom. Just go and grab it, but you can always just go and grab it before. This is a javelin orb, by the way. So, um, another thing that I'll tend to like to point out, also let me save here while I'm at it. Another thing that I like to point out is, there's this weird passage here. It doesn't do anything. Maybe this is the explanation as to how the truffle gets behind the counter. I don't know. I always found this one to be really strange. Hey yo, welcome to Bonsai Beer. Alright, welcome to this area here. I'm just gonna try and run through. And get places. Oh, 50-50 whether this guy hits me or not, if I try to dash past like that. Because of how the properties for dashing work, so to speak. Also, a lot of enemies only ever specifically hit the boy, so the boy right now is confused. Confused means that he is... He cannot cast any spells, which, to be fair, the boy can't cast any spells to begin with. Um, but silence, the spell, confuses the character, which means if they press left, if they go right, if they go right, uh, if they press right, they go left. Except that for AI control characters, for normal movement, it mostly doesn't affect them. They, however, tend to attack in the wrong direction, for that matter. But if you jump across a uh, whip jump place, you actually get all your status effects removed. All of them. So that is kind of potentially relevant for some instances. Also, this is the reason why we need no. If we didn't... ...have this... By the way, we can walk during the text box if we just switch character there. Um, if we did not need Gnome, or if we didn't have this, we actually could skip Gnome, technically. Alrighty. Welcome to... ...the Big Snake. So... Here's an interesting fun uh, fact. The pole dart is my favorite ranged weapon. And ranged weapons, basically, in this game, uh, if you release a projectile and it can hit an enemy, that's a ranged weapon in this game. And specifically in this arena, you literally cannot hit this guy with a projectile. It's impossible. It is not possible to hit this guy with a projectile. It just straight up does not work. Uh, this is also true for Vampire. You cannot hit Vampire uh, in the arena with projectiles. Why? I don't know. That's just how it is. It's really weird. Either way, um, we're just gonna do the regular glitchless strategy. But if you try to defeat this guy with just weapons, what I recommend is you use the whip. Um, I have never upgraded the whip in this case, but you have a whip at least level... Th well, usually level 3 when you arrive here. But the whip is not a ranged weapon, and you can relatively easily hit the boss with the whip, since it is long range. I guess a reach weapon, basically. And it does actually hit the thing right there. Also, Sprite just got pig meat. I think I will never get the Mitch Mallet in this playthrough because of the weird sequencing we did um, on Gaia's navel. But, when a character is minied, their defense is set to zero, which is kind of a big deal, since they take a ton of damage from everything. But also, their attack is basically nothing. Their AI gets set to be very aggressive. For some reason, little people have just the most aggressive AI settings possible. And they cast spells ever so slightly quicker, because what de uh, determines how quick you cast a spell is your casting animation. And so if I control the sprite here, I can cast this spell slightly quicker again while controlling the sprite because I don't get that long animation after finishing a spell cast 
that you normally get when you have the character at full size. This technically would go for the same for a Moogle, but you cannot actually cast any spells as a Moogle. But yeah, um, Pigmit Cactus cast spells quicker. It's kind of interesting that way. Really. Also, I think the sprite would take damage here if I don't heal this with him right now, but I cancel the damage by giving him a candy. By the way, I say him for the sprite. Um, it's supposed to be genderless in Japanese. However, because that's that was really not much of a concept at all in... Well, actually, that's about 30 years ago. Uh, it was really not much of a concept at all at the time. Uh, they decided to just arbitrarily give the sprite a he or him pronoun in... English or French or German. German, it is a she, which is why if you see somebody refer to the sprite as she, um, that is most likely because they play the German version. French and English, they say he. In Japanese, they have a very straightforward way, I suppose you could say, for them to just not have the sprite be any like gendered at all. Also, Sprite now has 0 HP, but we can give him a honey to revive from 0 HP. As long as you're quick enough and the numbers haven't settled yet, it's still fast enough. Alrighty, I'm going to try and equip some trash. I actually have no idea where I'm supposed to stand for this, because... Oh, I never gave the Sprite the power rest. Whoops. That's the power rest the lady has equipped. What's the... I don't know whether I did this right. Zero... One... No, I'm not standing in the correct position. That's okay. I was trying to multiply the fairy walnuts, but that's okay. I don't know how to stand, because normally I use the character portraits at the bottom, but I need three of them for <laughs> me to know where to stand exactly. Also, while the Lightning Bolt deals way more damage, or Thunderbolt it is called, it also literally costs twice as much as the Air Blast, and it's not twice as strong as Air Blast. A bit of an unfortunate spell, actually, I think it's considered. There we go. Got the snake. t -Salt. thank you so much for 41 months of support. Welcome back, and welcome back to you! Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your support. Righty, hello. You think it has to do with layers? The projectile's not hitting? Probably, yeah. I think that sounds about right. You remember seeing an efficiency spell list in Secret of Mana? A lot seems to be irrelevant. A lot of it is really just what level is your character? If the sprite was actually one level higher, uh, they would have 12 MP and I would cast Thunderbolt three times, which actually is reasonably efficient overall. Alrighty, so, um, you know how we don't have the lady in our party currently? Well, you know what normally happens when we get to the desert? Actually, we don't go to the desert first, we go to the ice country first this time. But either way, um, we will get the lady in our party, don't worry. And then we will lose her again and get her again, don't worry. It'll be perfectly fine. But speedrunners actually go to... Kakara first, and then to the Ice Country, and then back to the Kakara, because if you go to the Ice Country first, um, you actually cannot directly fly to Kakara, because you're supposed to get lost in the desert, because this guy shoots you in the wrong place. And that script cannot be triggered from the Ice Country, so he tells you that he does not have enough gunpowder to shoot you directly over to the desert from the Ice Country. 
even though it's about the same distance that he shoots you. So that's that. Also, this is one of the best armor upgrades you can get for your characters here. Because it's a significant step up compared to before. So I'm just gonna buy some armor for everybody here. Well, there's wind, the Coriolis effect, etc. Well, there. Suppose there is more to things, isn't there? Alrighty. Um, by the way, so earlier I had a setup, a specific setup for item thrashing, as we call it, in order to multiply our items. For example, I have two barrels, and if I item thrash with the boy, we get zero barrels, meaning we can use them a total of eight times before they are gone. You can do this anywhere, um, but you need to know where to stand. And the easiest way to stand is most inns, if you stand to the left of the counter, you are actually perfectly horizontally aligned to do the item thrashing as well. So what I can do here, so I can... Oh, by the way, Kind of important, you have to select the cap first and then the trash can. It's important that the trash can is in the top center for this to work with these setups here. You cannot select the trash can and then the cap, it does not work that way. Okay. This should be enough items trashed. Also I'm equipping the sprite just kind of along the way here. I'm actually gonna keep the power wrist equipped on the boy because six more defense is not that much. So I have to specifically equip the silver band on the sprite. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> it's probably completely off tune. Alrighty. Welcome to the ice country. Fun fact, these wolves are not weak to fire. They are in fact not weak to anything, they are just neutral. But they have very low defense against basically everything. But also, they hit like a truck and they have one of the strongest or most aggressive attack patterns, let's put it this way. Alrighty, so let me uh, explain a mystery that happens to probably a lot of people when you play through the game more than once. So, after, in a casual playthrough, after you clear the Pandora Ruins, defeat Wallface, um, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go back to the King's Palace and he will tell you, hey, you can have all treasure now there, and you get a sword orb and you get a spear orb. Now, we never got that spear orb, and consequently, the game knows that, hey, you're supposed to be able to get spear level 4 right here. But since I only currently have up to spear level 2, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, up to 2. This means this chest here is still supposed to give me orb level 4. So the chest will keep reappearing every time. I open it and I have not yet acquired this uh, spear orb level 4. So this is why if I open this here, get a spear orb, the chest will just kind of stay here and not disappear so I can get another spear orb. This is effectively kind of a catch up mechanic in case you missed certain orbs before in order for the game to give you these after the fact again. And the most significant time you might see this is in a speedrun, if you never picked up any sword orbs from any of the places where you could pick them up. You can pick up the chest in... the Grand Palace about three or even four times at a time for the sword orb there. It's kind of interesting. Alrighty, upcoming we are going to encounter one of the bigger hurdles in a speedrun for in the glitchless speedrun, because this guy here has actually really, really high magic defense for not having any particular elemental weakness. 
So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use the overcharge glitch. Because this guy here, actually no, before I finish him off, let's put it this way, I will show off some things. There we go, this is fine. So, um, in this encounter here, if you stand in specific spots, he will never be able to hit you. If I stand here, the pumpkin basically just lands on top of the trees and consequently never hits me. Also, you might notice that the sprite just does not take any damage from this little, these little vines. They're just in their way, that's about it. These vines are supposed to be stronger in this encounter, but they kind of forgot to give them the appropriate, let's say, damage upgrade. They kind of equip weapons on enemies in order to determine what the enemies do usually. But here, these plants are just the exact same plants that appear in the Tropicala battle. Also, in order for this boss here to cast a spell, for example, you have to be far enough away. So certain enemies and bosses have AI where they only start doing certain things when you're just too far away. Like for example, Sleep Flower right here. And we are unconscious. Can't do anything while unconscious. So this could be kind of a big issue here. It wasn't an issue, but yeah, it could be. I love the casting animation of this guy, so let me try to get him on screen. There it is. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> I know he's not in color, but if you're not looking, look at this guy. I love this goofy face for the casting animation. It's so perfect. Also, let's go ahead and finish him off. So he also can cast burst on you. Oh, there's another thing. The sprite never technically attacked right there. The reason why the uh, boss just took damage right there is because melee weapons... Actually, it's just specific weapons. It's mostly melee weapons. Melee weapons, whenever you get knocked down to the floor and then get back up, they have kind of this you attack around you effect as the character gets up. That is intentional. Uh, it does also have the kind of a weird side effect that if you are charging up a weapon and then get knocked down to the floor and while you're still charging the weapon, your get up attack actually has the same power as the charged weapon attack released. So you kind of can use that in a more glitchless speedrun against, for example, Not Spiky Tiger, the other guy, the blue tiger thingy. Because if he eats you and deals zero damage, he knocks you down to the ground. And your get up attack then will usually hit him. And if you charge up your get up attack, then that can deal a lot of damage very quickly to that guy. But I think that probably not allowed in glitchless. The Spyroyer, that's a weird German name. It is, yes. I mean, Boreal Face is not much less weird, I will say. Can you get multiple orbs from the catch-up chest and then go back for ones you missed? Yes and no. If the, months, uh, if the orbs you missed are in chests that... Or if the, chests you, uh, the orbs you missed are in chests, then no, those chests will be gone. However, if you somehow manage to skip a boss that gives you an orb, then get catch-up chests afterward, uh, get, get catch-up chests that normally appears after that boss and then go back to defeat that boss. Yes, you do actually get more. But by the way, there's a little bit of a risk to that. Real quick to preface this, if you have too many orbs of a specific weapon, for example, the most common one is that I will also show off later is the Mana Sword Early Glitch. If you do that too early and you're supposed to get another Sword Orb from I think it's Thunder Gigas in the Pure Lands, you will soft lock there, you can no longer proceed. So be a little bit careful about that, but generally speaking, yes, you can get more orbs than you're supposed to get by going to later parts of the game, getting catch up chests and then going back to the bosses that drop the specific um, stuff. Time to get Vesuvia. <laughs> the Horror Windle. <laughs> it's such a good name though, Blood. Alright. Okay, so, 
As soon as we step onto this pedestal where the green guy is, um, we are supposed to, well, get a cutscene. But if an AI controlled cactus just walks over, they never trigger the cutscene because AI controlled cactus cannot trigger cutscene triggers, so I can actually technically skip past that cutscene. I just kind of messed it up, unfortunately. Because this would have been an excellent demonstration of how you can mess up cutscenes by skipping one step and the game just kind of keeps incrementing the plot or event counter by one every time the next step happens. Unfortunately, I messed it up. I was not supposed to um, get the cactus stuck there. I needed to go slightly higher up. That's alright. If what is supposed, well, what is not supposed, this is what's supposed to happen, this is the normal cutscene. But in a 1 player 2 controller speedrun where they skip the first step, what happens here is that these three characters on the right side actually don't spawn yet when they're supposed to. And instead, we they spawn as soon as they are supposed to walk away and despawn. So right here, they are supposed to go away and they appear in... The one player two controller speedrun, which by the way, one player two controller speedrun now just ignores everything and goes over to the desert. Because you can skip the ice palace under specific circumstances. We are going to skip the ice palace, but there's a few things I want to point out in that dungeon. So we're gonna actually go into the dungeon, but we save beforehand and then reset to you before this. So this is a save file. Just a completely normal save file, by the way. Uh, that is before we clear the Ice Palace. Well, I guess aside from not having the Lady, that's not quite the normal place, but aside from that, this is pretty normal. You hope that's a horror window, the hint horror window? No, actually it's not. It's a diaper. A horror diaper. <laughs> I don't know how they got to that idea. I'm actually gonna start leveling up uh, Salamando here a little bit on the sprite. I actually need to get a bit of MP back on the sprite here. Salamando level 1 is kind of what I would like to have. And by the way, it does not matter whether your spell connects with an enemy or not, as long as you cast a spell, you get spell experience. Um, the time you get actually less spell experience is when you are in a non-combat zone. If you are in a non-combat zone, you actually get less spell experience than... or only half as much spell experience compared to in a combat zone. This is kind of supposed to... this encourage you from leveling up the lady spells while you are just kind of sitting at a spot where you can get easy MP refills and such, like in an inn for example. But because the game never tells you about that, most people don't even know that you'll get less experience during these times. That's why I spent hours le leveling the lady spells in the Wind Palace. Now that's the interesting part. The Wind Palace is one of the few locations where it is a combat zone. Your weapons are drawn inside the Wind Palace. So it does actually give you full magic experience inside the Wind Palace. That's one of the exceptions, curiously enough. It is just that slow in order to max out the spells. In a 100% run, which by the way I kind of plan on doing another one. Going into the new year, kind of like it's been, I suppose, kind of tradition the last few years. Um, spell leveling is a pretty lengthy ordeal. By the way, this is another one of these chests. I got a glove orb, and I get another glove orb here. Because I never picked up the glove orb that spawns in the... Moogle village after you free the Moogles. Just getting some more spell levels here, or experience on the sprite here.
You may have a hint about that when you played the remake. About spell experience? There might be certain things that I don't know about the remake. Honestly, so here's the funny thing. I know the remake is a very mixed bag and... Not my thing, I prefer playing the original. But what I will say about the remake, it is actually extremely faithful to the original, to a fault. Because what I think the remake did, uh, specifically the remake that you can buy on Steam right now, for example. What I think the remake did, and I do not have actually any real way to confirm that, is... It took the code from Seeker of Mana and just put a wrapper around it and then use the original functions of the code for everything. Which has some really strange quirks, but it basically makes the game as faithful as possible to the original, right? But there's also that weird thing where you get weapon experience in random places, and the remake does that too. I highly doubt they intentionally re-implemented that. I'm pretty sure they just took the original code and tried to adapt it to work on a more modern system. So it's actually... I think the remake is more of a port rather than... Well, code-wise at least. Anything else. What upcoming games are you looking forward to, Jagamoth? I'm actually not really sure because I just don't have that much time to play with a full-time job until October. You seem to remember from the re remake you can't stun lock enemies as easily. Yes, that is part of the deal as well. Uh, if an ally ever gets targeted by a spell in the remake, you cannot heal that character. And that is something I absolutely strongly disagree with. It's really irritating when a, a light character is about to take damage. Well, they have low HP, you would like to heal them, but if you're just cause or trying to give them an item slightly too late, it just straight up doesn't work. So, yeah. They removed damage cancelling, but they just made the system extremely frustrating to me personally. Alrighty, so little fun fact, this guy here on the left side is just stuck there. I don't know why, he just can't move. But also, kind of like I mentioned before, these guys have 600 HP. But if we deal 300 damage to them, they will transform into their second form. So one fireball at level 1 will almost push them past the 300 HP threshold. But now, if I chain two spells together, for example, Exploder, which deals more damage than Fireball, and then just cast Fireball right after, which by the way, fun fact, Lava Wave costs 3 MP. Fireball costs 2. But Fireball actually deals more damage than Lava Wave. If you're looking for damage, there's never any reason to use Lava Wave. Unless you specifically want to chain spells together. So here, this guy took enough damage to go from 340 HP remaining to 0. So it instantly kills him. So you don't even have to use overcharge glitches in order to be able to achieve this kind of effect. Which I think is quite neat. Like this is, what I assume, is an intended mechanic of the game. So if I would, for example, just cast any spell on this guy here, with the sprite right now, he will transform basically immediately. And yes, Fireball does more damage than Lava Wave. Oh, here's another fun fun. Um, whenever these little guys actually eat a character, that character is invisible right now. In fact, they are completely invisible and intangible. And if I could use the magic rope right now, or any other way to just change screens, that character would actually stay invisible. And I hope to be able to show that off later, but I'm actually not sure my sequencing will allow me to do that. Either way, the character is still there, the, uh, the sprite is still present, and I can cast spells out of the belly of this beast. It's really weird. Plus, these enemies here are weak enough that our armor is just going to completely ignore them. But yeah, 
I think 777 HP and these guys were gone. We have now level 2 Fireball. And this guy already took almost 300 damage. Oh, that was not enough to knock him out there. I figured a level... Well, 2 Fireball would be enough to just knock him out. There is, by the way, the same um, high and low damage roll concept for spells as there is for... regular weapon attacks. Also, they can cast Cure Water up to three times. They have six MP, Cure was quarter cost two MP, and yes, you can run enemies out of magic in this game. That will be actually be demonstrating on a very particular boss later. Um, I want to briefly multiply my Fairy Walnuts because I will need a few. Actually, no, I don't. I'm going to reset this to before we clear the Ice Palace anyways. Alright, the other thing I wanted to demonstrate in here... ...is... Um, actually, no, I'm not going to demonstrate this here. Sorry, <laughs> I keep changing my mind. Let me really quick knock this out. The normally slimes like to multiply, but because there's already three enemies on the screen, on the right side, might be a bit hard to see. Um, they do not multiply right now. Alrighty, so, real quick about whip mechanics and jumping across rope poles. So, the way a rope pole works is... If you gather the party... Where did you come from? What the heck? <laughs> where does that guy spawn? I've never seen that guy before. Sorry, I just want to demonstrate the uh, rope pole mechanics real quick, and these enemies should not be in my way. Alright, so the conditions for a whip jump to be possible is 1. You need to gather your party on the space next to the whip pole. And then you need to hit a whip pole. In this case, on the other side. Now, there's a few quirks about this. The reason why this doesn't work, I can't hit the whip pole right next to the boy right here. Because it's too close. The whip actually only has an attack hitbox a little bit further away, and that is probably because of the whip pull mechanics. So, there's two ways around this phenomenon. So what I can do here is... For example... I can stand here, and the jump in which direction we jump across the whip pull always happens in the direction you're facing. So if I face down and somehow, in some capacity, can activate this whip pole right next to me by hitting it, well, that is actually sufficient. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the Mitch Manage right now, but if you were to pick me the boy right now, he could just hit the whip pole right next to him, and it would jump us straight down. Now, there's another way to hit the rope pole in a weird way. For example, what I can do is I can equip a barrel right here. And barrels have some strange properties, I'll get more into detail later. But basically, whenever you equip a barrel, it will create a damaging hitbox around you as if you were attacking while equipping the barrel. If you face left or right, that damaging hitbox is just going to be slightly below your character, like a decently large hitbox. If you face up or down, that damaging hitbox is in the exact center of your character, a tiny hitbox. So it barely works. But I think what I should be able to do here is I should be able to stand here, face down, and then equip a barrel. And we can jump down here. We're gonna get to the snowman stuff later. But yeah, um, this is basically, at least to me, really fascinating, honestly. On how these whip or rope pull mechanics work. Can't you do it with a charge attack too? Yes, actually, you can do that with a charge attack too. I can't, well, I guess I could technically demonstrate it with an overcharge. But yes, um, it does not matter which rope pull you hit with the weapon. As long as the game thinks that you have the whip equipped, 
and you're hitting a rope pull, you jump forward in that direction you're facing. And that does in fact work, so there's a certain, I think a level 4 charge attack that attacks in every like cardinal direction once. And you can do this with just a straight up charge attack with the whip. Now there is one more method that I would like to demonstrate. So the boy currently has the sword equipped, right? I'm actually just unequipped the thing on the sprite. Um, the boy has the sword equipped, so if I get in position... I can't even get into position with this. But there is a way to transfer weapon properties to a weapon animation. So right now I have the sword both moveset as well as behavior. But if I give a candy to the boy, and then while this candy animation is happening, I switch over to the whip. Oh, it didn't work this time. Oh, wait, no, it works the other way around. As you can see, the whip has the wrong color. Might be able to see that. Either way. Um, that did not work. Oh, wait. Ah, I remember. I did that wrong. I actually need to wait until the boy does his getting healed animation proper. There we go. He has the sword equipped right now, and now I equip the whip on him. There we go. Now, he still has the sword, but the game thinks it's a whip. But it's, for all intents and purposes, the sword moveset. But I also cannot charge up the sword only to level 1 right now, because it's actually a whip. Which does mean the party also does gather in those spaces. Which also means I can use this in order to hit into any direction. I could jump up there, but I'm gonna softlock if I do that. But I can also just jump straight down. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Alrighty. Be gone! Well, no. Quite conceited for a child. Time for your punishment. I always think that the your punishment is intentional because it's more like a pirate that is talking, but I don't think it's intentional. Probably not. Either way, this guy is weak to um, Salamander. As you would expect. Now here's the fun part. Uh, let me actually try to see whether we can get it. It's gonna cast a spell and I was hoping not for Acid Storm here. I'm just gonna heal through the Acid Storm and such. That is a Freeze Breath. Freeze Breath is not a spell, so if we give the sprite a Paral, um, the sprite actually does not get damaged or hit by the Freeze Breath. Same here. Sprite just doesn't take any damage because Paral prevents any non-magical damage. So what I want him to do is I want him to cast the elemental weapon on me, just to demonstrate something. Also, yes, the boy has the discolored whip equipped again. But the boy deals 6 damage right now. I think that might be a low damage roll. Alright, the boy is also dead, so I have to revive him. Mildly dangerous, what I'm trying to do here. Basically, I want him to cast his ice weapon on me. That is not an ice weapon. If I remove the barrel too early there, I still get hit by the freeze effect, because the damage only happens at the tail end of the animation. 7 damage. As you can see, not a whole lot of damage. 52 damage, it's a frosty now. Alright, give me the spell, buddy. Also, he mostly only casts freeze when you are triggering his melee attack. There's an ice saber, thank you. So he just used an ice saber on me, this is actually what I want to demonstrate. Elemental weapons in this game don't deal elemental damage. They are still neutral damage with an added effect and a slightly higher attack power. Which means... So the original intent of the design was that, oh, we're gonna give the player ice weapons, so they deal only half damage against the ice gigas. That's not actually how that works. In fact, I was dealing 5 or 6 damage before. Ah, if I were to hit... I would actually deal slightly more damage than I did before. Now, by the way, 
if you ac actually can check, show that later. Um, but unfortunately, the boy getting snowman removes his elemental weapon right here. Because being a snowman, being a moogle, being pigmeat, as well as equipping a barrel, all of these things... Oh, thank you. can demonstrate it again. All of these things actually mean that... Getting unlucky with the damage rolls here. There we go, 14 damage. That's actually more than before. The previous ones were just low damage rolls. Either way, all of these effects where it calculates significantly different is technically equipping a weapon. And in case you're curious... Let's see if he does, does it again. Oh, he doesn't do it. In case you're curious, yes, you can enchant... Moogle, Pygmy, Barrel... Weapons. It mostly doesn't do anything. Except the barrel. It looks really funky if you do it to the barrel. They fixed that in the remake when the players noticed this bug remained. About elemental weapons? I actually did not notice whether it was still in the game or not. It might have been a quick fix in that case. Uh, taco is frosted. The frosty taco any good? Also, by the way, he's going to do his slam attack right now on the sprite where the sprite is standing. And then cast freeze right after. Because that is how the AI works, and I happen to know that. But yeah. So, the normal sequence of events, what is supposed to happen, is you clear the Ice Palace, you get the Mana Seed of Fire back for the Fire Palace, and then you can proceed as normal. However, we have done that now. Basically, I showed everything in the Ice Palace that I wanted to show. However, there is a way to skip getting the Mana Seed from the Fire Palace here. Also, maybe real quick. You know how in video games we love mythology, we like incorporating these Norse gods, the Egyptian gods, and all kinds of things, like stuff, mythical creatures from strange other cultures. Well, technically, Santa Claus is one of these creatures, and they just straight up included Rudolph and Santa Claus in their game. I don't know how common Christmas is slash was in Japan, but I always found that to be kind of funny. I was really confused as a kid, because in Switzerland we don't have Santa Claus. Not quite like that. So it's not quite the same myth, so to speak. All right. This is us clearing the Ice Palace. Let's go ahead and reload the save file. So this is the save file we created from before we defeated the... Uh, or completed the Ice Palace, right? And that is exactly where I want to proceed here for now. So, basically at this point we just got Salamander. And not a whole lot else, let's put it this way. No Saint Nicholas in Switzerland? Not quite. We do have, like, a Santa Claus on the 6th of December. No Father Christmas, no. Uh, we, we have the... basically the equivalent on the 6th of December instead. It's, but it's not for Christmas, it's for... before that? I have no idea why. That's just how it is around here. Where am I going? <laughs> Myth? You mean Santa is not real? No, Santa is real. Rudolph is not, right? That's how it works. Alrighty, so this guy here, if we ask him to shoot us over to Kakara, he says, Sorry, not enough gunpowder. My tongue is my limit. Why do you even give me the option? Well, to kind of explain it, I guess. But, again, the reason why we can't go directly there is because you're supposed to get lost in the desert first, and that cutscene or event can only trigger from Matango. So we have to go to Matango and then to Kakara afterwards.
Alright, let's go to Kakara. Um, <laughs> huh, well, let's try it. We'll slide into the cannon. After you got lost in the desert, you can take this cannon and travel to Kakara. Yes, you can go directly from the ice country to the desert, which is like 10 15 seconds faster than a speedrun to go to Kakara, then ice country, and then back to Kakara, which is why you sequence it that way. Alrighty, welcome to the desert where we are lost in. Now here's the little fun part. Um, the desert effectively is kind of like a Lost Woods type of deal in Zelda, where you can more or less infinitely walk in one direction at a time until you get to the correct screen. It's not quite as rigorous, like you don't have to get the exact right sequence. Because this screen right here, where we are in, you want to approach this screen if you think about it, it's, a, it's basically a 3 by 2 grid. It's like 3 wide, 2 high. And each one of these screens here is in the grid. However, if we approach this screen here, from the left or the right side, this is where you go to the correct screen, so to speak. So you can go up, left, down, right, or up, right, down, left, or up, right, up, left, because it loops around up, left, up, right, or basically any, many combinations. Generally speaking, eventually you get to the correct place. That's a short version. Now, um, once I go to the left here, this is where we get to the screen. Um, fun fact, the characters always line up in the same direction. And what is supposed to happen is you ha just have all three characters spread out um, in their respective place actually don't know how it's going to work from this side, but because AI control characters cannot scroll the screen, this means that if the sprite tries to continue walking after this little cutscene happens, or in this case I would have had to select the boy, um, if the boy continued walking while I had control over the sprite, he would just keep walking into the uh, camera boundary of the screen and not be able to move, and we would have both characters just kind of stacked on top of each other rather than them just spreading out like this. Kind of weird. Which, by the way, we are gonna come back to this part of the desert at some point. At least, if you not forget about it. There's gonna be so much stuff. But yeah, um, you know how our party gets split up here? Basically, the boy uh, goes into the machine room and he generates heat by randomly walking around, because at least I assume that's how energy is generated in this universe, because everybody else is doing it. Um, the sprite is getting sent to the kitchen, where they can eat all the food, and the lady gets sent to the mayor's cabin, where she can yell at him. Alrighty. Talk to these clowns. By the way, we get a full heal from these guys here. Um, if the boy was dead, otherwise this would be a little bit awkward. If you just had a ghost here and you were split up from your party. So everybody gets a full heal here. Fire! Fire! So the guards walking around, of course, are counteracting the fire. Which is kind of how they work here. Right, they're just randomly walking around, and that's how they extinguish fires. Basically, blue, of course, generates cold energy. I'm making up stuff, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna stop now. Uh, one thing I always like pointing out. When I first played this game casually with my, like, family and siblings, it took us probably half an hour or something to realize that there was a door here. We just did not see this place whatsoever. We were randomly walking around, walking in circles, until we finally found that thing. <laughs> you don't like this lore? No. This one room in the Grand Palace required Luminous Bell, right? How are we gonna get past that? There's like three different ways past that. But yes. Uh, alrighty, moving on. Moonwalk. Also, this is the weirdest save point in the entire game. All clear, make a log entry? Sure. 
Like, this is kind of the only place where you can make a lock entry like this. It's really strange. Alrighty. Rats ha. I love that expression of the sprite, which by the way, if you have the second controller control the sprite during this, the sprite just continues doing that expression and never stops until you start moving with the second controller. It's great. Well, unless you go into this door here for that matter. We're gonna get Lumina, actually. Oh, there's some... I'm probably not going to get into the weirdness we can do with Gold Tower. Like, I was considering it, but... I didn't have enough time to prepare. There's some shenanigans you can do with safe warps. And resetting the state of Gold Tower. Which I kind of plan on doing for the glitched 100% sometime. But I need to figure out how that exactly works. I don't want to accidentally lock out the game. Which, to be fair, at that point we could always continue anyways, but it would be a shame if we were to skip some things. Alright, we have the lady back in our party. <laughs> she still has the boomerang equipped. And welcome back, and she has all the magics. Because we never gave her a name after picking up the magic. So let's give her the appropriate equipment so she is not as frail as she would be otherwise. She is still kind of low level because she didn't receive any experience. So the way this guy here works is he tries to just keep going up or down for that matter. Until he reaches your level and then just dashes across the screen. Right there. Right there. There is a very particular place where this guy can get caught on the scenery right here, and I don't know how it exactly works, unfortunately. Like, basically, I'm gonna try and see whether I can possibly set it up here. I finally managed to get this once by accident. No, that's not it. I'm gonna try two or three more times. But yeah, he only actually casts a spell as a countermeasure to him getting hit. Let's see whether this works. No, nope, didn't work. I think I was too high up this time, so I need to be slightly lower, maybe? Let's see if this works. This is a very particular setup here. Where basically, the mech rider bumps into this cactus and goes up. But because he is getting stuck on this rock, he just never goes anywhere. I'm gonna give it, let's say, one more try. Moved around before. No, okay, that's fine. Let's just knock him out. And which spell should we use? Now, here's a little fun fact all of the sprites' damaging spells have one spell that has the highest attack power. And all of the highest attack power elemental attacks have the same power. However, Undini is very imbalanced in that Freeze is the strongest attack spell. It only costs 2 MP, which is I think a baseline power, magic power of 96 if I'm not mistaken. So Lamando's 96 baseline power is Explosion, costs 4 MP, literally double. Same with Sylph. Thunderbolt is the same power as Undini's freeze and costs more, well, it costs double, it's just ridiculous. And Gnome here is Earth Slide, which is 3. Not quite as extreme, but just not that good. But basically, the short version is Freeze is the most efficient spell you have against any enemy that is not weak to a particular element. Because it only costs 2 MP, it's easy to spam. And well, it's just kind of efficient. That's the short version. And yes, Dark Force is the only other spell which would be equivalent to Freeze. There's two problems about Dark Force, of course. One is you kind of get it somewhat late, so trying to have it catch up with Freeze is a bit of an ordeal. For one, and the other part is... 
that there's a lot more enemies that are resistant to dark than there's enemies resistant to water. In fact, any enemy that is resistant to water is weak to fire. So, because we have Salamando now, we can just use fire instead. And yes, Dark Force is very easy to chain. A lot easier than Freeze, to be fair. Although, waiting until it actually releases the chain, because you can only chain up to 999 damage, and anything past that gets lost, is a bit of a tricky part. Also, how long did it take you to be able to get out of here? Because talking to that guard takes a while sometimes. You learned about chaining spells as a kid with Dark Force. Nice. It's stupid that you get those spells later at level 0. I think it's fine. Personally. Because the first few levels are not too, too slow. But... Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, in German, we had a guidebook basically, just kind of coming with the game, like a gigantic, complete walkthrough. And... I remember specifically, the guidebook tells you about the slime boss, where you're supposed to use Salamando damage. And because we never leveled Salamando, it dealt one damage. So we were just really confused whether the guidebook was right or wrong, but it's just that Salamando needed to be at least level 2 or 3 in order to be able to heal any real damage. You might have the same book. Unfortunately, I don't have that book anymore, but... I read through that book a lot. Also, if you have never seen it, the German guidebook's illustrations, they are actually really pretty. Like, there's a lot of really nice and pretty things in the guidebook. Like, it's really, really nice. It's kind of visually. Alrighty. Welcome to the Fire Palace. If you remember, I actually reloaded this save file here, where there are... We have not cleared the fire uh, ice palace yet. So this means... Um, we have never gotten the seed from... The ice palace, or the fire seed from the ice palace specifically, let's put it this way. So, now here's the trick. In order to be able to skip the seed from the fire palace, we have to get up this ramp. Because as soon as you enter the basement, where the cactus say, it's really hot in here, or just kind of, if you enter the basement at all, even without a text box, the game will check whether the mana seed is supposed to be there in the mana seed room at the end of the dungeon or not. But I'm certain that some of us have figured this out just kind of casually as a kid, because we just really wanted to get up here and figured out that we can just repeatedly punch with um, the glove weapon and just keep getting higher. Or you might have actually learned about this just from other sources too. But yeah, um, this is kind of the classic way of how you can get up this ramp. Just hope that we get punches, which is a 50-50 rather than a kick, and you just move up here. Alternatively, there are certain weapon attacks that allow you to get up a decent bit too. But I think none of the weapon attacks that you have access to at this point get you all the way. Level 3 sword probably gets the closest. So, however, there are other methods of getting up this ramp. There used to be an old-ish method for getting up this ramp via... Oh, I never leveled up the spear. So I leveled up the other thing. Actually, the sword should work too. I just said that. Alright, let me actually demonstrate the old method of getting up this ramp here in a speedrun. Basically, I get a specific overcharge attack that allows the character to fly. 
So, the reason why I need an overcharge attack is because, well, five is not good enough. Seven is actually exactly what I need, I think. Oh, shoot. Ah, uh, wait, no, wait. This is fine. I need a seven, uh, I need a seven, but I need it on the sword and not the whip here. Sorry, I just kind of forgot to switch again. This is a little bit awkward. There we go. A level seven sword attack is going to make us fly up there. Okay. Not level seven. Is it level eight? Oh no, this is fine. So basically, this is the old method of getting up here because, as you can see, the AI control character, he uh, the sprite just kind of moves a little bit faster up there. And I think that is basically the game giving the AI control character just a slightly stronger boost during certain attack animations, so the sprite literally can just force their way up there. And then, whoops, <laughs> I accidentally did remove this. And this is kind of how we just went up there. We would use the spear charge attack instead, but I don't have the spear level, so this is just kind of the old method of how we can get up here. Now, there's another method of getting up there. And that other method is as follows. I mean, just get rid of the charge attack real quick. And that other method is barrels. So at some point I was just kind of playing around with barrels and I noticed that if I equip the barrel and while equipping the barrel I get healed. Equip the barrel get healed, or just get healed at any point while having a barrel equipped as well. And I just press left, the barrel just kind of keeps sliding in one direction. Like, I'm not even doing anything else, I'm just holding left very briefly. And as soon as the character starts moving, I just release left and the character just keeps going. Basically, it forces you to move, or keep moving, in that one direction while you get healed. So I just hold up here. And it literally doesn't stop me going up the ramp here. So we can effectively do the exact same thing for the other characters too. Give you a barrel, and give you a barrel, and because the AI control characters just keep trying to move up because they try to get to the boy, I can just heal them, and heal them, and whoop, they get up there. So we can also get up the ramp this way. Which, by the way, it used to be a gigantic huge ordeal to get up the ramp with a single controller without that technique. It is possible, but it is a gigantic headache trying to get up the ramp there with just a single controller. And this method here with the barrels is just way easier. You use actually the area of effect, or well, healing everybody with Undini in order to be able to achieve that effect instead, usually. Because you give everybody the thing at the same time. And... Wait. Fireball's right, right? I think Fireball's right. Keep forgetting about this. Alrighty. So, if you're not a big fan of glitches, let me explain something about this room here in particular, because if you're playing glitchless and you're looking to get a bit of a money grind, here somewhere. There's actually a very, very good method. So, if I go in here and go back, you will see there's gonna be two enemies spawning. These two guys. They have very relatively low HP, and they are pretty easy to defeat by just kind of whacking them two or three times. If you have the weapon upgraded, the boy actually usually just needs two hits in order to defeat them. Now, the reason why there's only two of these enemies spawning is because this chest here occupies one of the spawn slots. Because there's supposed to be three enemies spawning in that particular position. So if you pick up that 1000 gold chest... There's three enemies here now. And if you, for example, equip the spear... You can just hit them here them again and it's a very very easy place to just grind out levels money experience anything you would like 
Well, not anything, but... It's very quick and efficient to just reset that room. And I do that in a variety of my solo character challenge runs. Just because it is so ridiculously efficient. Way more efficient than even later game areas with stronger enemies. Just because these enemies have so little HP and have so little defense compared to how much experience and money they give. You wonder why they put the fire seed check in the basement, rather than where you actually need the seed. I mean, it's kind of one of these things where I assume it's just kind of the developers taking shortcuts. Because if certain things are supposed to happen in certain sequence of events, and at the time you don't really know that the players can skip these sequence of events, one is just as good as the other, and it might have just at the time been more convenient to put the check into the basement rather than the seed room. It's basically, game development is always more complicated, and if it works without glitching out initially, yeah, I might as well just stick to it. Alrighty, so, we're gonna do a little thing here. So this is a seed that we have to hit with Undine's freeze attack. So, what we can do... is we can cast the freeze spell twice on this orb. So the first time we hit the orb, the game just kind of goes, oh, alright, let me activate the event where you can make the stairs appear. And the second time we hit the orb, the game just kind of goes, uh, something is supposed to happen for 10 seconds? Okay, event is over now. And basically the first time, what I'm gonna do here, is freeze, and the second time, I might actually mess this up because of timing, but we'll see. There we go. The second time, we actually transfer that event where the sprite just hit um, the elemental crystal, and the event that is supposed to take place in this room here is never taking place. What is supposed to happen in here is the game is supposed to go, oh, well, you just activated the boss fight. Walk into the room, put a torch at the entrance and the exit, and have you fight. But because I effectively transferred that second um, Undini freeze hits the trigger event, it's just kind of the game confused and it never starts this event here. And by the way, fun fact, this Minotaur here has no collision box, you can just walk straight through him. Also, he's one of the more fun bosses where if you are exactly diagonal towards him, let me try where I can get this. If you're exactly diagonal towards him, he just goes Wiggletron. Let's see. Wiggle Wiggle. Oh, it doesn't... doesn't do it properly. Come on, Wiggle. It's easier to demonstrate this with a solo character. But I also kind of would like to not die here. <laughs> Alright, so here's the thing. I actually don't know whether you can softlock or not if you defeat this guy right now. So, what I suggest we do, because this is the SNS Mini, we're just gonna make a safe state here. Because I genuinely do not know if this is gonna softlock me if I defeat him right here. Science time! Okay, also get the boy back so he can tank some more attacks. I'll give the sprite some MP back. So, by the way, I'm using Air Blast for the same reason I use Fireball. It only costs 2 MP rather than 4, and it is not half as strong compared to Thunderbolt. Thund Thunderbolt is stronger, and you actually can chain Thunderbolts together and chain the magic, but it's so much more efficient to just cast Air Blast instead. Thank you. 
think the boy would die here if I let him tank that attack. I'm gonna heal him here. Air Blast level 2. It's gonna deal significantly more damage because it now has enough power to punch through the magic defense of the Minotaur. There we go, let's see what happens. Because I honestly don't know whether it's just gonna advance the room script by one, and it might lock us into the room if I do this. No, oh, no, it looks like we're fine. Alright. I was just curious. Alrighty, so. The Mana Seed of Fire is exactly here. Let's activate it. Once again, you have to be close enough in proximity to the seed and face up in order to activate it. The game doesn't check whether you are above or below it, it just works. And activating this Mana Seed here is all we needed. Actually, I'm curious, what happens if I go into the basement now? This, activating this mana seed here is all we needed in order to... <laughs> I see. The lava's just drained down there. In order to be able to go to the next area. By the way, um, if you skip Minotaur, the enemies are still all present in the surrounding area, so you have to kind of dodge them. What happens if you go to the ice country and get the fire seed? I actually don't know. Maybe you can get Fire Palace enemies to spawn again. Not sure. Alrighty, welcome to... The Empire. Oh boy. So this is kind of where I no longer really have any notes. Oh shoot, I forgot the King Mushroom uh, text box. I'm gonna just me mention it right here while walking. Um, after we rescued Flammy, you know the little fluffy dragon from the Dragon Viper back in Matango, the Mushroom Kingdom. The Mushroom King actually has a weird dialogue box there where he gives Flammy the name Flammy and you're supposed to have the option to say ugh or you could say not bad for the name choice of the dragon but because of weird scripting you just say ugh and not bad and you never get to choose the game just by default always chooses for you that this is the weird text box alrighty that's good enough. Okay, what we are supposed to do in here is we are supposed to get the code from Mara in order to be able to get into the sewers. But if you are perfectly aligned with the wall here, literally per pixel per per eh, pixel perfect, if you never run, like press the A button, from the beginning of the screen, you can just push up against this wall here and just straight up walk past this guy's trigger where he's supposed to walk up into the sewer area and well, we can just go without ever talking to him. It's kind of weird. You always thought the joke was the king is the king, so of course his name is the best. Yeah, that's kind of how I always interpreted it as well, but it's supposed to be a choice. Alrighty, so, alternatively what we can do is, of course, we can just activate this guy's trigger. Funny, more, more funny if he just kind of <laughs> walks into us and gets stuck. Um, so, you might think, oh, can we just do this electric here again? And technically, 
the answer is yes. But if you paid attention in potatoes earlier, the problem is actually we need to scroll the camera slightly higher up. So if we scroll the camera up, we can actually just select buffer our way straight through him. If we didn't move the camera, we couldn't do this. No, actually no, let's just keep going. And no, you could never actually name Flammy, unfortunately. Flammy's name is just Flammy, or Lofty, if you're playing the German version. Okay, so... Have you ever lost a character? Like, straight up, they were just gone. Well, let me explain how that works, because I think it's quite fascinating. So what I'm gonna do here is... I'm gonna do the weird thing that you're not supposed to do, where you can't just straight up lose a character from your party. Let's see, this should work. Uh, maybe it works now. Um... This almost guaranteed should work. Does it only work on the main controller? Actually, hang on. I might have to use controller 1 for this. How many more? Okay, I need to refresh my medical herbs too. This should be fine for refreshing medical herbs. I probably need to refresh a bunch of other things. Let me check. Alright, medical herb zero. Basically, snowman abduction is a thing in this game. Okay, that was too late. Let me reset and actually use the main controller for this. See if this works better. Too much damage on the lady, we need to heal her a little. There we go. Alrighty, so... The way we can make a character disappear entirely is... They need to get snowman, then you wait a little bit. Basically until the numbers have settled. Then you use a medical herb, and then you use uh, switch to the character quickly. And hold upper right. So the character pushes against the enemies. And if I do this all correctly... There we go. Finally got it. If I do this correctly, um, the character straight up disappears. It's actually straight up removed from your party. And basically, from what I know, the reason why this happens is because the snowman is not supposed to have any animations. You're not supposed to be able to move around as a snowman. However, because of the weird sequencing of animations and status effects, we can still move around as a snowman briefly until the game catches up to turn you back into the regular character visual, so to speak. And specifically, the push animation happens to be the one that is a problem for the game to handle. If you push up right into a corner, other directions work too, but generally speaking, just up right. Um, the game somehow gets to a glitchy part of the memory, where it just decides to remove the character from your party. Permanently, by the way. So I don't recommend you do this unless you want to lose the character from the party. Oh, another thing, by the way. If you ever softlocked in this cutscene here... That's because the boy is nodding at some point in this cutscene here. And if you're a snowman as a boy, snowmen do not have a nodding animation. And the game just waits for the nodding animation of the boy to conclude at the beginning of this area. 
or after the cutscene and it just never concludes because the snowman never ends up nodding. So consequently, you soft lock the game because the snowmans don't have a neck to nod. Literally. Can you get a character back that got abducted? Unless there's a specific trigger or reason as to why they get removed from your party and then you get them back later. No, actually. By the way, Frosty Ring prevents you from being burned. That's a special effect. Golem Ring doesn't do anything, neither does Silver Ban. Tiger Bikini, well, we don't have anybody who can equip it right now. We do have people who can equip a Tiger Suit, on the other hand. Uh, Ruby Vest. Tiger Cups. Oh, the Quilt Hurt here, by the way, also gives plus 5 agility. Unfortunately, the boy cannot equip it. But that's that. Ah, I see. Yes, you caught up to that coconut. That is the plan. For anybody who is just listening, or just watching it without seeing the chat... Well, you might have figured it out too, but you'll see. There's a reason why I specifically removed the lady from the party. With all the glitches in this game, is there no way to put armor on a cactus that cannot normally wear it? So that's the that's actually an interesting question, because my answer is maybe. I will say probably not, but maybe. I do have an idea on how it possibly could be achieved, but I've never actually tested it. Alrighty, so I'm gonna put Does it have to do with trash cans? Yes. The thing is, I will say probably not, because you only can affect specific values. With the equipment trashing. So that's that. Also our non existent imaginary friend. So slapped Anna, so she passed out. The boy in the tiger bikini, yeah. The current idea I have would actually equip what the sprite can equip on the boy, specifically. So unfortunately no tiger bikini on the boy. Would be fun though. So I'm gonna try and see whether I can get this to work here. I don't know whether there's any pre-setup required before the cutscene starts, but let's see. Oh, I got it! I got it! I got it! Finally! <laughs> oh, that took... Every time I wanted to demonstrate this, I didn't get it. Alrighty. We just got a spear orb. Where did that one come from? The answer is up here. This chest up there had a spear orb in it, and I just picked it up from over there next to right after the cutscene. So, let me real quick explain as to why that happens, I guess. Because the way I understand it. So, in short, for one frame after a cutscene, or when you enter an area, or when an item chest or anything spawns, it basically has no value as to where it is currently located. And it also has no distance between the characters yet calculated. And I think basically because the game checks what the distance is between the characters, whether they can interact with each other or not, for example picking up a chest, you have to be below a certain distance value. Um, because the game has not yet calculated this, the first frame you gain control over your character, you can actually have a distance of zero between the chest and the boy in memory, just as the chest loads. And because the distance is zero, the game thinks, oh yeah, you're zero pixels away from the chest, go for it, pick it up and open it. And that's kind of how that works from all I know. 
And basically right after this cutscene concludes, you can press B one frame and you open up that chest. Kind of funny that way. And TZ Matthews, thank you so much for 51 months of support. Welcome back, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. Mogul! Uh-oh. Mogul! We have a frosty taco again. Oh no! Now you're thinking of the board ends with you, where the ability to, of the boy main character to equip girl clothes is based on bravery stat? Wait, is that a fake? That sounds amazing. <laughs> Wait. I just got poisoned. Okay, that should not happen. <laughs> I should never get poisoned here. Because... The green slime is the one that poisons you. But our defense is so high, the green slime literally never can deal any damage to us. But I think because the green slime hit me exactly at the same time as the blue slime tried to hit me, the blue slime did deal damage, but I got the effect applied of the green slime. That is actually not something I've ever seen before. But I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Will you stop? Oh my god. <laughs> this guy. You need to have enough bravery to equip girls' clothes. In the world ends with you, and it's the best equipment. That's such a fascinating way to do that. I like that actually. Alrighty. I'm gonna step on that switch, and then move out of the room of the second controller because that way I will circumvent the boy getting frozen by snowman. Um, I don't really have much to say about this area, aside from picking up that chest from a remote location, I guess. There are actually a lot of strange enemy spawns in this area here in particular that you may no never know about, because you don't usually traverse these rooms backwards where these enemies can possibly spawn. One of them is right here if I get it. I didn't get it. There's actually a eye spy or whatever they are called right here in the corner, if you ever get one to spawn, but it's kind of specific I guess. Also, I have a honey. Kind of need the sprite for the upcoming battle here. So, by the way, wall phase only goes into his special phase when you. Uh, kill both the left and the right eye. This is the same for this guy here. The, this guy here only goes into his special phase for. Well special movement if you kill both eyes at the same time as well. In this case, for Doom's Wall, that is kind of some more, uh, unique set of like physical damage abilities where he grabs the closest cactus and dra uh, drags them from corner to corner, and the furthest away cactus gets kind of like a, a set of rocks thrown onto their faces and such. It's actually a pretty neat moveset. Don't usually get to see it, not even casually, because... Most of your spells here are actually strong enough to just straight up demolish the poor wo uh, Doom Wall here. Oh, right, we never leveled up Salamander here. That's fine. Also, did I... I think I bought equipment and never equipped it, did I? <laughs> I think I forgot. But yeah, Doom's Wall has basically no magic defense, but also no particular weakness. When I was a kid, we always used, like, Earth Slide against him, because Wall Face is weak to Earth Slide, so we just figured, oh, of course it's efficient. And, I mean, it did really good damage. Just not necessarily for the reason I thought it would. Oh, 
Welcome to you, Peach Lee. I hope you're doing well. Magic spam is broken in this game? Yep. For quite a while, the uh, one controller speedrun actually mostly used magic rather than overcharge attacks because magic is just almost as good as a glitch that allows you to deal max damage in one attack. Alrighty. Now, kind of as I've mentioned before, this is where we can, or where we normally lose the lady from our party. Also, this is the reason why I like playing on the SNES Mini. Because that cutscene right there has some real intense flashing. If you play it on an emulator, or anything that is not the SNES Mini, be warned. That flashing is really intense right there. Like the screen flash. But yeah, um... Maybe a little fun fact, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from just going outside. We can't just leave the lady behind and go wherever else. Oh, maybe these guys are actually interesting demonstration. So, do you see how the sprite gets stuck on these enemies? Eh, not enemies, on these characters? Because, again, while the weapons are drawn, our characters cannot, or the AI control characters cannot move through NPCs. Basically, in combat areas, these guys are just... You cannot push them around, and AI control characters cannot walk through them. That's actually gonna be relevant in just a moment. But yeah, um... You can actually just straight up go outside. You might have noticed the message set there, um, Go 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 sees the Reaper, which is the message that normally happens when a character is, well, killed, and at 0 HP. You can actually go and rest at an inn, and technically just off-screen revive the lady, and then use the cannon travel to go anywhere else you want. It's kind of an interesting little quirk of the game. Alrighty, so we just lost the lady in the sewers. Turns out this is where she was kind of hanging out or getting flushed into. That's alright. So, <laughs> I love the door just kind of ah, starting there in the middle of combat. So once again, kind of like the... Actually, this is a bit more difficult to demonstrate. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, kind of like the worm earlier. This boss here cannot be hit by projectile weapons, so the flying javelin or the bow projectiles, the arrows... You cannot actually hit this guy at all with these weapons. So if you're doing a weapon type specific playthrough, well, maybe be aware that you probably cannot defeat Vampire as well as Dragonworm with most of the ranged weapons. Now, if you have ever seen, for example, the boomerang, or also the javelin, hit Buffy or Vampire, that is likely because you use a very specific charge level. With the boomerang it's way easier to demonstrate because boomerang level 1 charge attack actually hits once with a melee physical portion, and once it hits with a ranged projectile portion, so in fact, unlike basically any other weapon, basically unlike any other weapon, the boomerang can hit twice. Well, almost any other weapon, because there's also the Javelin, I think level 6 attack, also can hit twice, I'm not mistaken. As well as... By the way, I'm just leveling up other spells right here. 
Breeze would be the most efficient one, but I will want to have Salamander level to level 3, I think. As well as Sylph a little bit higher, and all these kinds of things while I need go. But yeah, either way, sorry, I keep interrupting myself. If you want to be very technical about it, the boomerang is the strongest weapon in the game. Because it can hit twice with one attack. And this is in fact also the strategy I employ in certain solo character challenge runs. Where I think I use the boomerang charge attack on the lady in order to be able to deal the damage to the mana beast in the end. Hey Gunarm Dine, welcome, how are you doing today? Also here's a probably good demonstration of the boss always targeting the closest character with his spells. Because he always targets the boy because the boy is just standing the closest to it. Alright, level 2 on this, this is fine. What level do we have on Sylph? Sylph is also level 2. I definitely need to heal the boy here because otherwise he's gonna get knocked out by that energy absorb. Alright, this is fine. Let's see, what about Gem Missile? Gem Missile is still level 0. I'm basically just using the vampire here as target practice. It doesn't matter how much damage my spells do, all it matters for leveling up spells is that you cast them a certain amount of times. And I effectively want to have certain spells for certain bosses later on. Fairy Walnuts remain. By the way, this is even a strategy that the Glitchless speedrun employs, where it uses specific spells, not necessarily to kill the specific bosses faster, but because there's kind of certain minimum thresholds of spell levels you want to hit in order to defeat certain other bosses later more efficiently. It's kind of like a use spend a little bit more time in certain boss fights, in order to save a lot of time later. I'm kind of hoping here that the sprite manages to... knock this guy out with this volley of gem missiles, otherwise... I'll have to do equipment trashing on the fly here again. Let's see. By the way, I would like to point out that the Doom's Wall... Okay, we have to go again. I'd like to point out that the Doom's Wall had like 1200 HP. This guy has more than double. Like, it feels really, really out of place in terms of how much HP this guy has. Compared to where he is right now. Like, it's kind of ridiculous, honestly. And also fun, in my opinion. Ooh. If I equip and thrash right now, I'm only going to have one medical herb afterwards. But, eh. It's fine, we can just buy some more. Because if you have three of certain items and you're equipped and thrashing with the boy, uh, it reduces that three to. well. to one. And it only affects specifically the amounts 3 and 2 when doing equipment thrashing with the boy. Which makes a lot of sense, honestly. And Ghost of Gutfunk, thank you! Thank you so much for 15 months of support. 
Welcome back. I'm glad you enjoy your stay. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> you're gonna have to disagree with that one, which makes a lot of sense. It's just kind of how the bits are interpreted and such. But yeah, we have the lady back in our party. Hooray! Oh, S. Grant, thank you. Thank you so much for 24 months of support. Welcome back. And I'm glad you enjoy your stay. I hope you're doing well. Alright, we're gonna uh, buy one medical herb. What else do we need, actually, for items? We need one medical herb. That's it, actually. Just one medical herb. Alrighty. So, earlier, these NPCs in a combat area, we could not pass through with the AI control cactus. As you can see, because this is not a combat area, AI control cactus can just straight up walk through this lady here, for example. Or this guard here, they can just go straight through. No. That is not true for any areas where we have our weapons drawn. And guess what? There is this area here. Where there's gonna be NM NPCs kind of blocking our way with weapons drawn. But... There's a certain type of character that can still go through NPCs. And enemies for that matter. And that ca type of character is... A dead character. So if we just knock out one of our characters here, she will be able to pass through these NPCs anyways. Wait, I needed to buy the medical herb first. Okay, so this is what we do in the speedrun. Uh, we just knock out... I'm pretty sure we knock out the lady because she has the lowest HP since... We actually skip her for a large portion of the early game. And she doesn't return until way later. And, well, the less attacks it takes for the knight to knock her out, the quicker we can be for... Feeding them. By the way, I would like to point out that these rebellions or re rebels and resistance are probably the easiest ones to, well, get back to. Because all you need to do is just kind of convince them, oh, would you like to have a banquet? Let's make peace, right? A little bit like Final Fantasy VI, either way. Um, I literally cannot see my character. I'm pretty sure my game is 30 FPS right now. Oh, there we go, I can see her right. Like, my visuals are 30 FPS. You should be able to see the character just kind of flickering. Let me actually see whether you can see that on stream. You may or may not be able to do that. No, she's kind of straight solid, isn't she? Hmm... Same for you. This does actually mean it's not actually being displayed at 60 FPS like it should be. Let me check real quick. See whether I can maybe change that. Doesn't seem to do anything. Just 
this do anything? Oh. So it does technically work. The timer is advancing every frame at least. Yeah, it's just literally the capture is not capturing properly. Maybe this one? No. This one? No. This doesn't appear to do anything. Yeah, the visuals are at 30 FPS, which is really should be 60. Like, it literally even tells me that here, and the signal status is 60 FPS too. Maybe the capture settings don't take effect until we restart. No, that's the thing. Because I click the vertical here, it does take effect immediately. So... It is correct on that end. FPS can be more difficult. Well, the thing is, it already shows that it is supposed to be 60 FPS. Mm. I mean, I can try this. Disable. Nope, still the same. The SNS itself. The SNS Mini? It is an SNS Mini, so... I don't assume it should have... These kinds of settings. Let me make a save file real quick. Just in case. Uh... No, I think this is pretty normal. Display, 4x3, pixel perfect. And these are just the frames. I know it's slightly cut off on the side. Yeah. So, it's fine. We'll just move on, because it's been like this the entire time. But since I can see the same thing you guys can see, it's gonna be okay. Alright, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna course are the ghost of the lady here to go to behind these guards and the way we do this is we use the second controller to move up here move the boy over there hold left on the second controller and disable the first controller and this will make the lady just kind of move up and down behind the guards because she's trying to get to the sprite but she can't because the wall is in the way. So while ghosts can go through NPCs, she cannot go through walls. There we go, now we can actually see her. And then... We can use a couple of wishes to revive her here. Switch over to the lady. And just walk past these guards. Yeah, I'll have to look at uh, or check the capture card as to what exactly is happening there. Because it's supposed to be a 60 FPS. But it isn't. Alrighty. Um, so, as you may notice, there are no enemies in here whatsoever. And here's a little fun fact. If we could throw the boomerang all the way to the left side there, or a javelin for that matter, we would be able to skip going through these things here, which actually is something that we were able to do in the Seagrove Mana remake. We step on these thingies, we can't go through. Not easily anyways. And if we step on this thing on the right side, it will just kind of knock us back. 
But technically, if we had a quick way to charge up our weapon, to have a specific weapon just kind of fly further than a regular boomerang or other throw, for example, level 2. I think that didn't do it, did it? No, it didn't do it. Either way, if we had a weapon that could reach over there, then that would be perfect. What we can technically do is we can do an overcharge of a weapon here. And then we can switch that weapon with another weapon. And then this overcharge actually does go far enough to be able to just go straight through here. But at least in a speedrun, this is just strictly slower than moving the drama way, let's put it this way. But it's kind of funny that you can do this, and in the remake, <laughs> you could do this actually way earlier already, because um, weapons work differently. By the way, this cutscene right here, I forgot to show it, but you actually get weapon experience during this cutscene, whatever weapon you currently have equipped. It is really weird. And this also happens in the remake. This is why I know that it's basically the remake is just a wrapper around the original code base. Because why else would you re-implement this? Like literally, right now I just gained a bunch of weapon experience on my characters. As if I killed something. Either way, welcome to Mech Rider number 2. What does he do? Well, first of all, he tries to go up or down far enough to be able to run you over with his machine. Now the problem for him is, in this arena in particular, he cannot go high or low enough to be able to run us over with the machine. But he still tries. And as soon as I hit him once, he will cast speed up on himself. Which by the way, enemies that use speed up that did not have evasion before actually gain evasion. Just kind of on a random note. Either way, if he did not have any magic remaining, he would no longer be able to cast speed up on himself, and he would just kind of raise his hand in frustration and then just continue slowly walking left and right. Which, by the way, is an interesting point about buffs in this game. So we can actually also cast speed up. So, speed up level 5 took about, I don't know, 25 seconds until it wore off. Here's speed up level 0. Let's see. Our hit is up, evade is up, hit is up, evade is up, hit is up, evade is up. And magic faded, magic faded, magic faded. Because buffs in this game just don't last. I think it's like 5 seconds per spell level. At level 0 it's 5 seconds, level... One, it's 10 seconds, it's basically almost not worth it to cast any buff spells whatsoever in this, unfortunately. But yeah, if I were to hit him here again, what he will do is he will start using his little missile attacks. And those missile attacks are actually kind of dangerous. To say the least, because he, he just straight up knocked out the boy. And yes, buffs do last longer if you single target them, that is indeed accurate. They're not any stronger. In fact, most of the buffs I think are not strong. Maybe they are. I think they just last longer, but they have always the same effect. I'm not entirely sure about that one. Either way, this guy takes a bit too long to run out of magic. I was kind of trying to demonstrate that once he's entirely out of magic, he basically just doesn't do anything anymore. But we can demonstrate this on the next Mech Rider instead. So let's just knock him out here. Oh wow, Wave Cannon. Wave Cannon is actually a really high power single target attack. 
And it's quite fun when he actually gets to use it, because you almost never see him using this. Two cups of wish just so we have back down to three at this point. Oh, he's out of magic. But he is also dead. Also yes, we skipped the Metal Mantis. And we never actually freed the rebels from their prison, so they're still kind of running around down there. But funnily enough, we could actually just come back later and defeat Metal Mantis. Because the cutscene where we're gonna get caught is still in place, oddly enough. Hello! Alrighty, so... King Truffle here gives you brief instructions on where you're supposed to go. Now... For quite a while I was oblivious to this, but what you're supposed to do... Is you're supposed to... Have King Truffle... Get home... Actually, was it east rather than west? I think it went the wrong way. Either way. You're supposed to bring King Truffle home to his home place, right here. And then he's there. But if you never go here, the implication is that you just kind of... <laughs> carry King Truffle all the way around with you. Which I think is quite funny. By the way, earlier I demonstrated how I had multiple stacks of fairy walnuts in my inventory. Here's a thing, if you get too many items in your inventory and you don't have space for the flammidrum, flammidrum to be put into your inventory, it's just straight up lost and you will softlock the game and can no longer continue. So if you use the glitch to get more items in your inventory that you're supposed to, make sure you use them up so you can actually get the flammidrum. Alright, this should be eh, slightly too far to the right. This is fine. Just equip and trashing here real quick. So I refresh the amount of medical herbs and cups of wishes I have. Alrighty, welcome to having Flanny. And this is... You know the speedrun does a lot of things just kind of in a really efficient but also somewhat glitchy way. This is where it goes kind of completely off the rails in a sense where it just does not go where you expect it to go. And this is where I would like to demonstrate to you a certain glitch that most of you are probably already aware of. So here, this is the ice country. And if you land around here, this is a very particular place where you get to the Nico here. This is the Nico in the frosty forest. And this is the only place in the entire game where you can land with Flammy and immediately save. I save this save file. And this save file is now actually kind of corrupt, if you will. So what happens is if I just reset the game here and try to load the save file normally. It basically crashes the game. And I have to press the actual reset button on the console in order to be able to get back into the game. So, now this save file here, you might think it's lost, but it's not really lost. So what you can do is you can load another save file or start another save file. Actually, let me just demonstrate this. And hold start select L and R for a few seconds in order to be able to save warp into certain areas. More specifically, the reason why that save file is crashing I'm holding start select L and R for a little while. The reason why that save file is crashing is because the game does not have any information as to where you're supposed to load in. Like in the sense that 
it just doesn't know where it's supposed to put your characters on which map on which uh, coordinates because if you land with flammy those variables that it normally tries to save into the save file they are just not there and now i'm actually on the mana fortress but this is the intro version of the mana fortress it does actually have a loading trigger right here but any loading trigger that doesn't go anywhere actually by default leads you to the frosty forest here so we now know that the mana fortress is buried under the frosty continent right that's how it works either way this is how this kind of safe file corruption shenanigan things work and i actually forgot to keep the safe file for the mantis and that's fine Alrighty, now, one of the most useful glitches in Secret of Mana speedrunning is the ability to get an invisible character. An invisible character is what I like to call still in cutscene mode. And cutscene mode grants you certain properties. For example, while a, de de uh, while a text box is displayed on screen, cutscene mode characters can allow everybody in your party to go through walls. So what this means is if we somehow could get an invisible character and still do stuff, we would be able to do a lot of shenanigans, let's put it this way. And this is one of the things that when I originally started looking into Seeker of Mana glitches, which without the intention of speedrunning myself at the time I didn't even realize that I could be a speedrunner too because I just assumed only the best of the best can be speedrunners, which is very much wrong. I j either way, I started looking into the glitches myself, and it turns out if you do a safe warp into this cutscene right here, the boy you see on screen is actually an NPC model, kind of like we had the girl just double up in the goblin cutscene earlier. There's usually NPC models and regular character player models. This is an NPC model right now. The boy is actually hidden in this cutscene here. And this screen itself just kind of has the trigger that if you are in this area here, for some reason if you're in this area with a character that has already completed this initial cutscene, it will just teleport you to Poda's village, but not before it makes your characters invisible. Right now, I have invisible characters. They're just trailing behind me, and one of the odd things about invisible characters is we can also walk through NPCs, as well as we can actually not go through screen transitions. So for example here, we have all the characters now here past the screen transition that would lead us normally into the next area. And let's put it this way. That is actually a very interesting and intriguing property to have. But the problem is, if you can't go anywhere, what are you going to do? Well, it turns out, if you're using an item on your character, and specifically, they use that getting healed animation, now suddenly those characters are visible again. You can heal a character and make them not visible, if they take damage by equipping a barrel on them first, for some reason that does not make them visible again. But here's basically the same demonstration. I walk with the sprite all the way over here, where I'm not supposed to be, but AI control characters cannot go through um, screen transition triggers. Because otherwise, well, you kind of would get rather glitchy effects. Welcome to the Rabbite Forest, where we're not supposed to be, but this is not terribly well, exciting to be able to go here, let's put it this way, because you can't just use the select trick to get back into potatoes without any trouble, but this is probably something that I will say most people probably don't know. There's a very fascinating little room that you can get into that you were never supposed to be able to see. I need to make sure that my cactus trailing behind me are not 
getting stuck on things. I'm work working in very particular ways. So this is back where we are over here, right? This is where the mana sword cuts in began. Now, in order to keep the illusion of continuity, what game developers like to do is they like to just kind of have the areas continue a little bit further before the cutscene. And effectively here, if we can go to the left here somehow, you know how there was this little trigger on the floor where the boy went, oh, look at this. Um, right here there was a trigger where the boy looked to the right and said, oh, I need something to cut away these bushes to be able to get back home. This is still a trigger right there, but on the left side of the rabbit forest area. No, I actually need a chest, perfect. I need a chest in order to be able to do this. So, what I'm gonna do is I actually need the second controller here. I have the boy right here. I'm gonna walk him past the trigger right over there. And another property of invisible cactus is the distance between your character and any other NPC, AI or property is never updated, which means if I press to the left and press the B button on the boy's character, he will be able to pick up the chest. And because we have invisible characters in our party, opening the chest is kind of an event which opens the text box and stuff like that and allows us to briefly walk through walls. So I'm gonna press the B button on the boy and then start basically just walk to the left into the wall with the lady while opening up the chest on the boy. And now, we're passed over here. As you can see, there's a little bit of visuals from the previous area, just kind of to give you the illusion of this is continuous. And what happens if we step here? We are in a debug room. Most of these NPCs don't really do anything. I think they are basically just there to demonstrate the various types of behaviors. Where if you get close enough to this guy here, he just looks at you. This guy here, he faces you when you press the B button. This guy here does not face you at all, he just always specifically looks in one direction. This guy here looks at you when you press the B button. And yeah, so also if you just kind of keep running into the void, there's a snowman here. I don't know why, there's just one here. And well, if we ha what happens if we talk to the king? Well, the interest cutscene starts again. So this is just something that you're never supposed to see. And here, this is the perfect demonstration as to what happens when or what is supposed to happen in order to scroll the cutscene. The boy is effectively just moving the camera or the cactus are moving the camera in order to be able to scroll the screen during these cutscenes. And I, I think this is just a really fascinating effect because cactus get their visibility and invisibility toggled. So if we were invisible before, now we are visible and vice versa. For example, there's these slidey tunnels, like for example going to the Dwarven village, you go through a tunnel where your characters just slide through. This also briefly toggles the invisibility and invisibility. <laughs> the other guy just leaves. Because he does not want to worry about these things. I actually have no idea what happens if you just continue with the cuts in here. Now we have the lady falling instead. Actually, I guess this is not an NPC model. This is really weird. I wonder whether it sets some variables that we could uh, use or abuse or something. But yeah, this is how you get into the debug room. 
I actually had a different concept and technique at so originally to get into the debug room. So my original idea, because before I realized that we can... Where's the music? Weird. My original idea before I realized that we can get into the debug room via the use of chests was to actually remove a character from the party through the snowman glitch. But in order for an enemy to be able to turn into a snowman, they need to, well, have that ability. So I actually bounced off ice weapons off of a wall onto a rabbite and had the rabbite freeze me in order to have a character get frozen in a snowman in order to be able to get past those, like, screen transition triggers with two invisible characters. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. But yeah, um, what else? So what we do in a speedrun is... Once we get Flammy, we immediately go here and clear out this area here in particular. Actually, I want to get invisible cactus for this, so let me do this thing real quick again. Do I like, ho like horror games? No, actually really much not. The only horror game I actually kind of liked was Soma. But I never played it myself for that matter. But yeah, maybe demystified this initial cutscene a little bit, but honestly I think it's just a really clever way of scrolling the screen. Because you can take control of a character to scroll the screen. Makes sense. Because as long as the player doesn't learn about these other things, or nothing glitchy happens because of them, it might as well just be kind of its own code. Reusing and taking shortcuts is what programmers should do. Because otherwise you're just reinventing the wheel over and over again. Alrighty, back to getting invisible characters here. And what I'm gonna be doing is I will be making just one character visible here. Keep the others invisible. And I would like to demonstrate the very first time I realized how to possibly skip a large portion of the game, because this is kind of how I got into speedrunning. I discovered how we can skip basically most of the mid-game in Secret of Mana. So what are we gonna do? We're just gonna climb up this mountain here. I should not have done that. And in case you're curious, um, characters getting damaged or hit by anything does not make them visible again. Not even dying makes them visible again, just a healing animation for some reason. Plus, they are pretty much intangible for the purposes of getting hit by physical attacks. Even though they're technically in physical locations, they can neither hit nor get hit by certain enemy attacks. Uh, just kind of purely because the game does not consider them to be close enough to each other, I think. Or too close? I actually don't know why it doesn't work. It's just how it is. Either way. Now, maybe another quick demonstration here. For what I said earlier. So there's this NPC just kind of loaded into the game. If I talk to him, my entire characters, or the party, is going to get gathered right next to him. So if I do this... Everybody is now in the spot where the boy is sitting. And in order to be able to do anything here, what I can do is, if you face to the left on a character, I'm facing left now with the lady, and then press the B button, you can effectively interact with anything that is currently loaded, because the game thinks the distance between you and that loaded entity is zero because it because it never calculates the distance between them if 
well, your character is invisible, because why would it? Normally it shouldn't have to. So, what we can do is because our goal is to get past these spikes here, right? And because I learned in Secret of Mana all the maps wrap around, if I could just go far enough down, I would eventually come back out at the top. So what I did is I had an invisible character here, use the ability to talk to Zage Jock from far away by pressing left and B, get the boy past that screen transition trigger, and then just walk him down here. Because eventually we get to the other trigger and we can just straight up walk through. And this is how for the first time a skip for getting Lumina, getting Luna, and getting Tasnika, and getting Shade was discovered. Now later on, um, it was actually two people who played the game Secret Mana Speedruns co-op that discovered a much more efficient method of doing this. So effectively what I can do instead, we don't have to get invisible characters for this here, it's not necessary. Let me make them visible real quick. So what we can do instead is we can charge up the sword to level 1. And while we're charging up the sword to level 1 specifically and unleash it, the game basically interrupts the sword level 1 charge attack moves the character to where the lady is, because she's going to be the one talking to Sage Doc, and then continues executing the level 1 charge attack, because it's not done yet. So I st unleash a level 1 charge attack, talk to Sage Doc while that charge attack is executing, and because our cactus can walk through walls while they are gathering near Sage Doc here, for example if I just do this, the boy is just gonna come back over. Basically, I'm abusing the fact that all characters can walk through walls during this little well, text box cutscene, even without invisible characters, that we can just go straight through here. So yeah. But this is both the original and the more recent, actually, the current version of how we get passed through here easily. And... Effectively, defeating the doppelgangers and clearing the trial is the game's trigger for making enemies appear, or well, making the cutscene and stuff appear in the sunken continent. So because this just happens to be such an easy skip, all things considered, you can even do this with just one controller, you don't need to. You can just unleash the level 1 sword attack and quickly switch to the other character and talk to Sage Jock, it's pretty easy to do. Um, because of that, we can actually just continue with the plot, as if we did everything in between. And, maybe another little thing. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, at this point, we managed to become strong enough and get all the equipment from Gold City that these doppelgangers here literally didn't do any damage to us whatsoever. Like, they literally were just too weak to be able to do anything. But, curious enough, if you actually get a character killed, their doppelganger equivalent just straight up disappears. This is an intended mechanic, and I did not know about this for a really long time. Which is way more convenient than having to actually, you know, kill the doppelgangers, you can instead just get your allies knocked out, and you win! You have gotten killed three times, and still survived, so you must be strong enough now. And yeah, the most glitchy parts tend to happen around rope poles, and specifically trying to climb this area, because you can accidentally hit a rope pole and air control characters can just back off into walls and all sorts of things. It's less than ideal. But yeah, we now have unlocked... 
the ability to go to the sunken continent. And this is where we're going to actually switch over to another thing, because let me go ahead and save real quick, just so we have this saved right here. Oh, by the way, if you do a casual playthrough and you want to power up the sprite for dealing more magic damage, buy the circlet here and a Lazuri ring from gold uh, from the gold island because the circlet and the Lazuri ring both actually give you plus five intelligence. And that is a gigantic damage boost for the sprite's spells, just kind of... They hit even more like a truck than before. I do believe that is still the technique used in a glitchless speedrun, where they pick up the circlet initially, and then once they have enough money slightly later, they pick up um, the Lazura ring once they go into the gold city. Alrighty, so... If we go to the sunken continent right now, what we encounter there is... Okay, this is gonna... Let's put it this way, this is gonna get slightly complicated, but just follow me here. If we go to the sunken continent, after you defeat the doppelgangers, everything proceeds as normal as if you did everything before too. So effectively, you get to fight the big watermelon with teeth and legs boss, which is called Agrogopilon, if we go in here into this area. However, let me go ahead and switch over to the emulator that has been running in my background since forever, because I wanted to demonstrate this and I re literally cannot do this on the SNS Mini version. So here we are on the Super Nintendo Mini version. Let me remove this here real quick. And let's see if I can give this a bit of sound. Bear with me. Random application audio capture. All right, I hope this is not too loud. All right, this is on the SNES 9X emulator. On Silas Outside. <laughs> Thank you so much for a crazy long time of 63 months of support. Welcome back, Papa Yaga. Papa Yaga. Either way, welcome back, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay. I'm not a papa. I'd like not to be, please. Alrighty. So this is a save file where we just got Flammy. And we have made one in character invisible. So the sprite right now is invisible, kind of like we did before. We did uh, the intro and have a save file in the Frost Forest Country. Now, one of the biggest reasons as to why there's a distinction between Secret of Mana 1 player 2 controller categories with or without multi-tap is that there's a skip to even do a defeating the doppelgangers with a multi-tap. And the skip itself is mostly fine. The problem is that in the end, you have a 1 in 16 chance to get a chest drop, and you require that chest drop, and it's just very awkward. And I will demonstrate as to why. So this is the game status right after acquiring Flammy, plus an invisible character. So what the game does here, let me actually select the second character. Oh, wait. I think what I need to do is I need to... So the reason why I'm using the SNES 9X emulator is because this is one of the few emulators that actually allows you to have a multi-tap enabled and disabled. So unfortunately, I can't really show this off the normal way. But effectively, for anyone who may not know, on the Super Nintendo, by default, you can have only two controllers connected, no more than two. But there's these devices called multi-taps, which basically you slide a button on a multi-tap and then that tells the Super Nintendo that, hey, there's a multi-tap connected, you can now go into multi-tap mode. And 
Sony SNNX allows you to enable and disable these things on the emulator for multi-tap and no multi-tap. So effectively, right now, I need to switch this over controls to super multi-tap 5 characters and now as you can see, the lady is controlled by the third character, not just the second one. This is the third one. And the reason why that's important is if I disable the multi-tap via that slide button, or in the emulator I can do this by just uh, going back to controls and just removing the multi-tap, the character that is selected on the multi-tap immediately goes back to being controlled by an AI. And Nintendo required developers that use the multi-tap to have a failsafe implemented that what happens if you remove the multi-tap at any point, the game still needs to be able to run. And because of that, you can still see the number 3 on the character, despite the character being clearly controlled by an AI controlled character. It's just, they half implemented that functionality, but not really. Either way, I enabled the multi-tap again. Basically, consider the multi-tap is connected right now. So, what I'm gonna do now is, when you go into the sunken continent here, you get this text box here where you say, oh, can't move. Which, by the way, is a lie because you can clearly move with secondary characters. Either way, you can't move, and to my knowledge, there's nothing we can do in here. Like, it's literally can't move. But, we then land outside here, something's pushing us back with this text box. And because there's a text box and we have an invisible character, we can move through walls. Which is not inherently useful, because we're just kind of stuck there with the lady being... ...well over there in that place. However, this is where disabling the multi-tap comes into place. If we just kind of disconnect the multi-tap, the third controller gets sent back over to AI controlled and we can just walk outside and anywhere through the walls we want. Which is kind of very neat. Because this allows us to go to the rest of the sunken continent. Because unlike previous areas where you would expect that sunken continent or not sunken continent are different maps, it actually is a different map state. The entire map literally transforms into being a different thing. So this is the entrance to the Grand Palace, right here. On the left side, we have the entrance to the underground sewers of the ancient city. And on the right side here, we still have the exit where you come out of the ancient sewer city, where you just have defeated the Kettlekin boss. And, well, what we can do now is we can go in the straightforward way through this. Welcome to the Grand Palace. Now, the reason why this is kind of special is because you could not do this without a multi-tap. And for the longest time, there was not really a method as to how you could possibly proceed through the entirety of the Grand Palace without having... Well, access to all elements, because that's one of the deciding factors for the most part. You have to have all elemental spirits in order to be able to go through the Grand Palace. That is what you normally do. You use Salamando, you use... Actually, all of the elements except for Dryad in order to be able to activate these orbs and move through the switches, so to speak. You can get a decent bit in. But at some point, there's just this weird torch in the way. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I was so confused as to what I was supposed to do because I missed one of the uh, spell switches. There's just this... There's nothing here. We can't go through there. There's supposed to be a stairway. But what we can do is... I've demonstrated this earlier, how we got into the debug room. What we can do is we can to try to get a chest... Actually, I need to get the multi-tab enabled again real quick, so I have another controller connected. What we can do is we can kill this turtle here and hope for a 1 in 16 drop for a chest to be able to go through the wall. 
And this is basically the biggest reason why we ended up... Just kind of splitting the category between multi-tap and no multi-tap. Since you cannot do this on a Super Nintendo Mini. Because there's literally no functionality to put a multi-tap onto this SNES Mini. You cannot do this on the Wii Virtual Console version because multi-tap is permanently enabled, there's no way to disable it. You cannot easily do this on most emulators because, for example, BizHawk does not even have multi-tap functionality. In SNES Nanix, you have to awkwardly go into a menu and unselect the multi-tap in order to be able to use this. The only way to use this in a regular form is to have an original Super Nintendo with a multi-tap, which in certain instances are not particularly cheap, in order to be able to perform this. And this is kind of another reason the hurdle to be able to compete in this category in a speedrun would be kind of significant, because you, unlike most other categories, you can't just play on emulator if you would like to. You have a pretty significant disadvantage. And then, of course, on top of that, for people who have multi-taps, well, you get, what is it, it's like two hours in, no, one and a half hours into the speedrun, more like an hour 10, hour 15, whatever. And then you have this turtle here. 1 in 16 chance to get a chest, and you hope you get lucky. If not, you just have to reset over and over, and it's just no fun. I have a safe state here, where I did actually get a chest, just kind of to demonstrate on how this works. So, the sprite is still invisible. So what we're gonna do is because the sprite is invisible, we can just open up this chest with the lady here and walk with the boy through the wall. And from here, once we are through this wall, we can go basically through the entire rest of the palace because we can hit these switches in the correct sequence in order to activate all the events uh, later on in order to be able to proceed. This is how the multi-tap Grand Palace skip functions. And I will guess that most people have never seen this version because nobody runs it. <laughs> I think I might still have the record in that category, although it would be a really easy record to break honestly. Because it saves like 4 minutes and even at the time I was only like 10 seconds ahead of the other record. So yeah, this is a demonstration. Let's get back to the normal playthrough. Well, quote-unquote normal. What are we gonna do here? So if we go in there, we would be fighting the Agrogopilon, the watermelon with legs. But instead of fighting the watermelon with legs, I'd like to not do that. And... Let me go ahead and make a save file real quick before I go. But yeah, I feel like Secret of Mana is kind of a really good example of a speedrun category where it's still technically valid with multi-tap, and honestly, there's a lot of fun and funky techniques you can do with saving a little bit of time and here and there in cutscenes by enabling the third character and moving just a little bit quicker. Like, it's actually quite fun, but th that hurdle there with the 1 in 16 drop chance for the chest is just too much. Either way, I'd like to demonstrate something here. Let me go ahead and... Just unequip all the equipment pieces on the characters. Because did you know that in Secret of Mana, if you die in the Ice Palace, or even just outside the Ice Palace here, you actually don't game over. The game is being really nice to you. So instead, the game sets a flag that if you game over, you get revived, well, the boy gets revived specifically, and you get teleported outside here. And this actually counts for as soon as you get, well, 
to the outside of the ice palace. The only time that flag gets removed, there... That flag no longer counts is if you go into the ice country, as in if we just go one screen south here, that flag gets removed. And if you ever complete the ice palace, it also gets removed. If you remember, I specifically reset so the ice palace would still be... Well, not done yet, so to speak. You had this done in... Happened in your first place and you were really confused, yeah. You can literally just stand outside the palace here and the turtles can wail on you. But... Because Santa is being really nice to you, he just t uh, throws you out the front door, revives the boy and tells you to scram. You can actually just stand here and the turtles can just knock you out over and over. But yeah. Hey Swinder, welcome! Oh my goodness, welcome back for 82 months, that's insane! <laughs> welcome back, and I'm glad you enjoy your stay. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. But yeah. You thought I was going to say if you die in the ice palace you die for real? No, not quite. Not quite. But yeah, um, so... Because the Ice Palace has never been completed, and if we use Flammy here... I should not have equipped the boy. If we ever die anywhere, because that flag is now still enabled... If we ever die anywhere... The game basically interrupts its death sequence with... Oh, yeah, actually, let's uh, send you to the map outside the Ice Palace. And it's fine. Effectively, what we can do here is we get into this cutscene, we get attacked by a, an aggressive watermelon. Which, by the way, the watermelon body itself does not deal any damage to you as long as you don't move. And it only has a hurt box if you actually hit it yourself. So right now, I can walk into the watermelon body and it doesn't deal damage to me. But if I hit it, well, if I were to hit it without dying in between, that is, if I were to hit it, it actually would allow me to just kind of walk into the hurt box of the watermelon and then it would just kind of do the other things. But Sanda tells us to scram. And this is where. In the 1Play2 controller, you hold up left and B in order to descend as quick as possible towards Nico. And here we are. Welcome to having broken the sequence in... The Grand Palace. Personally, you're going to live forever or die trying. <laughs> nice. But yeah. Now, this is where the speedrun actually, for the first time, gets invisible characters. So we're just gonna have to sit through this again. And this is where... Because we broke... The cutscene... Or more specifically, we never completed the cutscene in the sunken continent there. It is only halfway finished. Basically, it began with us getting sent to the watermelon boss room. But the NPC that was just kind of seemingly talking to us there is still standing there. And none of the events have activated that would allow us to meet Dryad in the mana seed room. And... 
just because that one NPC happens to be still standing spawned in there actually allows us to trigger mini events that allow us to walk through walls while having invisible characters active. Alright, we're gonna do the same thing again. Hold LR, select and start for about two seconds. And then we load that save file. Once again, we have invisible characters. We have to make at least one character visible, because otherwise we cannot enter loading zones and triggers. Doesn't matter which uh, item I give the character, as long as he has a healing animation. Actually, let's make the... Make the sprite visible as well. That is not the sprite, but whatever, it's fine. And well... Now, we go back in here. This guy's just standing here. If we talk to him, basically a mini event plays, and he just faces you. But as I mentioned before, an invisible character, if the invisible character is facing to the left, they can interact with an NPC or any object that is interactable. So I have the sprite now facing the left, and if I press B right now, the character now faces to the other side. So, if I have a second controller and press B on the first controller, I can just walk through the wall here. And this allows me to effectively go back here. And jump across. And then we hit the rope pulse, which by the way, if you have an invisible character in your party, you effectively get the ability to walk through walls via rope pulse slightly early. Which means that you can just hold into a wall and walk through them. It's a bit strange. So we hit this thing twice, and then we hit this, and that's kind of all we need. Did I miss? I feel like I goofed that sequence. We'll see. Then we go back to the main room. Oh, it's fine. And welcome to this guy. Suddenly he spawned, and he is the trigger to allow you to enter the Dryad room on the left side. Actually, he's not the trigger. He allows you to enter the Dryad room on the left side in order to move on. Now, there's a slightly more efficient way to get past this room here, you actually literally don't even have to fight that guy. But I wanted to demonstrate something with him. So, um, I need to equip everybody again so we don't die instantly to random attacks. Because what I need to do requires my characters to get eaten. So, you may have noticed, I actually just made the sprite here visible again, so I have no invisible characters in my team whatsoever right now. All of them are actually pretty much normal, kind of like they usually should be. But what I can do here is I intentionally get eaten by this guy. I try to get eaten. Or the sprite gets eaten, that's fine too. And then I use a magic rope. So right now the sprite is in the belly of that guy. But what that practically means is that the character is invisible. So if we interrupt that sequence there, Sprite is now still invisible. Cutscene mode, if you will. So this is technically another way how you could get an invisible character. But this never has any practical use, to my knowledge.
because the thing is I think none of the areas other than this one here in particular you can actually get eaten by one of these enemies and then use a magic rope to get out of the encounter but yeah um, this is kind of mostly all I wanted to show off here this guy here is weak to ice so we can just go ahead and nuke it if we want to wait no he's weak to fire I had that backwards Either way, he only has like a thousand two hundred HP. It's really not much. But at the same time, um, we are kind of low level. Our spells are kind of low level, so... Uh, this might take a little bit. Or we could just do an overcharge attack too. I have to admit this playthrough is going on a fair bit longer than I intended it to. But there's still a few weirdnesses that I like pointing out. By the way, in case you're wondering, I don't think he can actually ever eat us while we are down here. So for some reason, this guy does recognize that we are outside the boundaries of where a character can get eaten or something. Not entirely sure how that works. Hey, Nodwick, welcome. I'm doing quite fine. I have to admit, I'm slightly tired right now. <laughs> so, I hope it'll be fine. Actually, I feel like it's probably about time for another break soon-ish. There we go, we actually start dealing damage now. Let's see, we have the mana seed of fire, water, wind and earth, so we should be able to get up to level 4 fireball here. But also, the way you get magic experience is... You get 9 magic experience from 0 to 1, you get 8 from 1 to 2, you get 7 from 2 to 3, and you get 6 from 3 to 4. You need to reach 100 magic experience. Oh, I need to restock my fairy walnuts. You need to reach 100 magic experience in order to level up, and any experience that would roll over is lost. You do not get any rollover experience. The animations on this guy are pretty adorable, I will say. He thought I slept for 12 hours, how can I be tired already? Well, I mean, the last two days I only slept like 3 hours, or 4. That's probably why. Alright. Magic level 4. Let's see whether that's sufficient. By the way, if you seal a mana seed, you don't just gain like the ability to level up spells higher. You also get a bit of stat boost on everything. Like you are stronger, you have more defense, you have more magic power, you basically get everything improved per mana seed. Which is probably another reason as to why our damage output here is uh, kind of on the weak end. Did we get him? Oh nice, the game realized it's a uh, boss fight now. Alright, after we defeat this guy, we can go ahead and visit a very dangerous boss. But she's easily defeated by a barrel. When I was a kid, I did not understand 
funhouse sprite whatsoever. I had no idea what was going on there. I just saw a dude with a gigantic weird helmet and like a baseball cap, a red one. I always thought that was really weird. Either way, welcome to Hexus. Hexus is weird. Because Hexus is supposed to have one neutral and four elemental forms. Now, I think the way the elemental forms were supposed to work is if you are far to the left of her, she turns into water. Uh, straight up is earth, straight to the right is fire, and straight down would be wind. But this is not actually how this works. She never actually turns into her elemental wind form. So... She doesn't really get to do a whole lot, let's put it this way. That's a very dramatic three seconds. Yep. But yeah, um, what I'm doing here is I'm sitting in front of Hexas because nothing can get through a barrel except spells, and the only spell she uses in her neutral form is Dispel Magic. Hexas literally cannot damage me. Like, it's impossible for her to deal any damage whatsoever. But this spell magic costs 4 MP every time she casts it, if I'm not mistaken. And she has 99 MP to begin with. So once she casts this spell magic... Four times? Actually, is it 4 MP? But anyway, basically we're just running her out of MP. That's the short version here. How do you win? So, um, another method of being able to win this is while I cannot attack while a barrel is active, my AI controlled friends can in fact attack. So, what I can do is I can tell the boy that he should stay really far away, but attack with a level 1 charge attack here. And if the boy is in fact in range for combat, he will try to attack. So effectively... Oh, he got too close. He needs to be not that close, otherwise he will die. <laughs> Kinda like that. So it can be a little bit of a... A little bit of an ordeal to try and get the AI control cactus positioned right. Did you just pick me two cactus at the same time? That's impressive. Either way, it can be a bit of an ordeal to get the cactus positioned right. But eventually you'll get it. Also, I think. So there's a weird glitch that I do not understand entirely, where Hexus is intangible right now for physical attacks, but as soon as I cast any spell on her, she can be hit now. Or maybe the boy just doesn't deal any damage. I don't know. He could just be missing the entire time. Or, what is also possible is that Hexus might have a shield at the bottom, like where her snake body is. Let me check. Hexas is overall a really weird boss. Like, there's a lot of things I don't understand about her. The boy should be able to hit her. That's the theory, at least. Oh well, she's out of matching now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually turn her into her elemental form. Oh wow, that... <laughs> don't go over there. If we are in the top left here, she turns into her water form where she would cast Freeze and... Acid Rain, I think. But because she's out of MP, she can't exactly do that. 
if we are straight above her, she turns into her Earth form, where she would cast Earth Slide and Gem Missile, I think. Over here, she would go ahead and cast Fireball and Lava Wave. I actually don't know what she casts. Either way, if we go down here, not far enough away, she would she would go back into her regular form, I think. There it is. So basically, it's just direction, proximity, what form she transforms into. But because she effectively um, cannot deal any damage to us anymore, because she's literally out of magic, and in her elemental forms she only does do magic spells, uh, we win. There's nothing she can do about that. Let me actually see. Hey, Spidey, can I get this? Alright, I think she is like higher on elevation level and that's why we can't use melee weapons. But technically, the javelin can hit her. Now that's interesting. Alright, we're gonna do an overcharge attack here though. Because right now, Hexos literally cannot kill us or damage us anymore in any capacity. So we're just gonna go ahead and... Do something along these lines here where... We give the boy a strong bow. And hope that we hit. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Projectile weapons, they shoot their... Projectiles further, the higher charge you do. But at some point you charge such a high level that the projectiles are just out of bounds and don't go anywhere. It's kind of silly. Um. Um. This is actually a bit of a problem trying to damage Hexus right now because she has a lot of magic resistance. Hang on, I think what I need to do... Is give the sprite MP back. Hope that Hexus gets grounded again. Oh by the way, there's also a spell casting in vulnerability. Where if your character is casting a spell, they can no longer get hit by anything. Which, by the way, is true for enemies and bosses as well. They cannot get damaged by weapons for the time being. And this is a bit of a problem. There we go. Okay, now we can hit her with the whip. We're good. We need to mess around with stuff, I suppose, in order to be able to hit her here. But now we do the overcharge attack again. And then we just knock her out. Oh yeah, I guess when she is not actually being able to cast a spell, she doesn't get the spell casting in vulnerability. So it's literally just that her vertical position, like height value, so to speak, was wrong. And maybe... Well, that's my assumption on how it works anyways, because we can still hit her projectile attacks. I don't know why she just goes invulnerable to melee weapons at times. No clue. But, up here, we have another front boss. This is Mech Rider number 3. And if you have learned anything about, about Mech Rider number 2, well, you might know that he tries to get on my level. Well, with that I mean the vertical position. He tries to get onto the same vertical position that I'm standing on. But because his collision box is way larger than what he considers to be acceptable to be able to charge across the screen, uh, 
This is all he does. Until AI control cactus decide to mess it up for that matter. That's maybe the one potential danger here. Either way, my Kryder doesn't do anything in this combat unless I move up a little bit with the boy in order to be able to hit him. So, what I can do is I can just stand at the bottom of the arena and hit him. You can do this basically with any weapon, any setup, any characters. And his first reaction to getting hit is casting wall, which is funny because after his next reaction to getting hit is trying to cast speed up on himself. The problem is He's trying to buff himself while he has an buff that reflects spells, and he always prioritizes giving himself wall, then he tries to give himself a buff. But because he cannot give himself a buff while he has wall, um, that's all he does. He's supposed to do like the little rockets and wave cannon and actually some pretty dangerous things, let's put it this way, like high power attacks if he ever got speed up or any other buff on himself. But because he never gets a buff on himself, he never does that. He's not smart enough. And in case you're wondering, speed up doesn't really do anything if player character gets it. But yeah, we just knock him out there. You don't know why this boss has terrain collision at all. It seems like it would work perfect. They just turned it off. I think... So here's the thing. The reason why it would not necessarily work perfect if they just turned it off is because of how the game does not allow you to hit enemies that are behind or on top of intangible walls or walls that you cannot walk onto yourself. Which, unless you use like projectile weapons like the bow and arrow or... For example, the javelin. Which is a huge problem if you try to fight like the dragons in the pure lands with regular weapons. Because those dragons are really tough to hit, honestly. If you try to use a whip or a sword or anything like that. They need to be in relatively specific positions to be able to hit them. How close to the end is this? Well, let's put it this way. The Mana Fortress is right there, and while we're supposed to do the Pute Plants, we can actually skip it. Alrighty, welcome to this part, where if you didn't have a guidebook, chances are you might not have known that there is Nico with the best armor you can buy in the game right here. Because also, if you're unlucky, this is a combat area, only three NPCs can be loaded at any given point. Which means if you have three NPCs loaded while you get into the range of Nico where he's supposed to spawn, he's just not going to spawn there. And why would he ever look a second time over here if you just don't know about it? But yeah. So this gauntlet here is actually the best armor piece in the game, I will say, for any character. To give you a frame of reference, up until now, all armor pieces had approximately the same magic defense compared to what they had for physical defense. But for whatever reason, starting with the gauntlet and any armor piece that has equal defense or higher, they have like 250 magic defense. It's basically a pretty ridiculous difference. If you invest into buying any of these equipment pieces, I highly recommend you get the gauntlets first. It's also the cheapest for that matter. Of course, if you use the money glitch, then it's not really much of a concern to begin with, but if you need to, or if you'd like to do this more glitchless, And yeah, pure lands. Even with these, are, if in, even if you know that these armor pieces are here, the pure lands are still mean because they are difficult to survive. Since 
even if you know about this Nico, you will not usually get here while having enough money to buy these equipment pieces, since those are ridiculously expensive. But yeah, the gauntlets, by the way, the gauntlets also give you plus 5 strength. So, plus 5 strength is for the boy, 5 levels more for dealing physical damage. For the sprite, it's like 10 levels more for dealing physical damage. It's actually a pretty significant difference. But yeah, at this point, we could just go clear the pure lands and stuff like that, but I need to think about what I want to do. And I need a short break, everybody. So, we're going to continue this in, let's say, 10-15 minutes. Thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for listening and for lurking. Again, if I scrolled over any interesting things that you would like me to demonstrate or do or show off or anything like that, let me know. And we'll see whether we can get to this. Be right back. Can you request Matango as a break screen? Because the music is a banger. Um, sure, I pressed the... <laughs> My brain does not work properly right now. I pressed the break and button just kind of to... Un I don't know what I was... I wasn't thinking, okay. <laughs> Where's my tango? It's over here. Alrighty. Be right back. Hello. Hello. We're back. Good morning, good evening and good afternoon. I hope you are all doing well. I hope you all have a most pleasant day so far. And well... Where do we go next? Oh, thank you. Hello. <laughs> uh, for anybody who might be watching this on YouTube, if you are curious, the little guy in the bottom left, that is our channel mascot, the Fussel, also holding up the break sign, and whenever anybody redeems hello in the stream chat with the channel points that you just kind of passively earn, well, it says hello, and people like to do that when I say hello, and sometimes there's also a fancy grimer going down the right side with rainbow colors and such, and that is when people say happy pride, because why not? Alrighty. <laughs> I like those. I try to keep them usually away from important screens, but then again, usually there's not a whole lot of people that just use the ball that time. But it's quite fun for these. Hello. We should have left it on the screen since. Oh, during the break because it's awesome track. I mean, Rekodactylus specifically requested Matango, so I went there. But you're right, this music is really good. Alrighty. When I was a kid, I did not realize that this is Turtle Island. Because look at it. There's the head up there, the legs left, right, bottom, and the little tail of a turtle. Kind of a turtle island. Does anybody know where the weird face is in the middle of the ocean? Because I don't remember. Yeah, that's usually the biggest issue with speedruns. You don't get to sit around and enjoy the music, you just have to go. Because this is also, right here, one of my favorite music themes once you turn in the sea hare's tail. Right here. You turn the desert into an oasis. And get one of the best music pieces in the game too. Oh. Wave wave. Hello. Was it a jingle for acquiring a Moogle belt? I think that's unique. 
Did you get that also for the Mitch Mallet? I don't remember. Alrighty, so, real quick while I'm waving, this guy here can upgrade our weapons, which is something you do casually, just kind of way earlier. Let's upgrade the sword to level 3 and we cannot upgrade the sword any further, because we were supposed to grab a sword orb in... Okay, I'm gonna stop waving now, thank you Silas outside. Um, because we were supposed to acquire a sword orb from, let's see... Pandora Castle, there was one. Then there was one in the North Town Ruins. Then there was also one in the Underground. Basically the area we skipped in... In the Sunken Continent, there was another Sword Orb down there in the Grand Palace as well. Actually, yeah. Let's see, I think I kind of somewhat skipped over a part that I want to demonstrate, so I need invisible characters to get back there too, but I also want to have invisible characters for another demonstration of an area that you don't usually get to go to, or for that matter go back to. So we're gonna grab invisible characters again by saving at the Frost Forest Nico begin the intro and just let it scroll through for a minute until, well, we soft reset. So for anybody who might have come in here more recently, the way we do this is effectively when you land right next to that Nico in the ice country, the game does not know where you have entered the screen from and it does not have any coordinates or map region location saved. Those are usually the data information that it puts into the save file where it is going to start you again when you load the save file. But right now, um, those information pieces in that save file are completely empty. But if we hold start select L and R for a few seconds, then the current lab location where we are right now, especially, well, right here, is not going to get erased and because there's nothing that loads from a save file it just takes whatever is already there. So we're gonna save warp into this little area here and it just so happens that it's going to make our characters invisible effectively what I like to call it. Um, turn them into cutscene mode and then teleport us to Podos while we're still invisible and we can become visible again by using an item that just heals us and gives us that healing animation. Specifically, the healing animation is what allows us to be visible again. Can also have invisible moogles. Alrighty, so what I want to do is I would like to demonstrate something real quick over in the desert. So, when you originally land in the desert, where the cannon travel guy just sends you to the wrong place, you just kind of somewhere. And this somewhere here, the game just kind of grabs you. Oh, wait, actually, it's the wrong place. The game basically just grabs you and teleports you back to the normal desert area, since the desert area where you get lost in, and the desert area where you normally walk around in south of Kakara are actually separate areas. Oh boy, where is that area? What happens if you just save, turn the game off and turn it back on and load that file? Does it glitch out big? No, it just gives you a black screen and it doesn't do anything. That's all it does. It's not particularly spectacular, it just doesn't do anything. But yeah, you do not lose the save permanently as long as you know about holding start select L and R in order to save warp into new locations and then you can just with that save data you can save in a new location afterwards. But there's probably plenty of people who thought they permanently lost the save file. 
because that's what they did. I don't remember where it is. Does anybody remember where this is? There's like a very particular area where the game normally does not allow you to like continue because it just teleports you back. And I'm gonna potentially come back later. Let's just go down to where I actually need the invisible characters. Alrighty, so... Secret of Mana kind of has that awkward part where... If you would like to have certain pieces of equipment, because they're either really good or you just are a completionist and you would like to have one of every piece of equipment, or at least the strongest ones, then certain areas, once you clear them and complete them, you can no longer go back to those, which means you have to get these pieces of equipment right then and there, or you just lose them. Or, alternatively, if you know a way back there, that kind of works too. So what we can do now is we can do the following. Because we have invisible cactus, while a text box is active and open, we can walk through walls with a character. What I'm gonna do is I talk to an NPC with one of the other characters, walk the boy through the wall, and then we do the same thing with the sprite. And everybody is now through the wall here, so this is where the lady is, this is where the sprite is, and this is where the boy is. Now we are basically out of bounds again in this area. Which we can easily do thanks to there being NPCs now. Alrighty, so there's a few things I want to do here. One of these things is right in here. And I kind of missed that opportunity the first time I was through here. I should have done that immediately, let's put it this way. And that is going to grab the sword chest. So these sword orbs are supposed to get me to <laughs> a reasonably high level. By the way, these guys here, they drop a ruby helmet, which is also plus 5 intelligence, but also really high magic and physical defense for the sprite. There we go. We get this chest here. We get a sword orb. Get another sword orb. Then we get the sword orb that is supposed to be here. Well, actually, no, now we get the sword orb that is supposed to be here. Oh, yeah, Tasnika was another sword orb that you were supposed to get. So basically, we skip the sword orbs in Pandora Castle, we skip the sword orb in the North Town Ruins, and we skip the sword orb in Tasnika. All of these which the game now gave to us, because technically we have proceeded far enough that we are supposed to have these, so effectively the sword uh, orb kind of catches us up, since the way the game handles these orb chests is as follows. Effectively, the orb chest knows that you're supposed to get orb level 7 for the sword from that chest. So as long as you don't have orb, le orb level 7, that chest is just continuously there. It's kind of like a catch-up mechanic. Because you might have just missed picking up the sword orbs in Pandora Castle and North Hand Ruins because those are in chests. You're not supposed to be able to skip the one in Tasnica, but all of these... It just kind of makes sense that you might have just not found them when playing through the areas. So it just kind of catches you up to the level of the orbs that you're supposed to have at this point. And this is kind of what happened right there. It just gave me the orbs that, well, I can have now. Which also means, if you might have paid attention, I've never collected the sword orb in Tasnica. I can still go and grab that one. And the reason why that's actually particularly interesting is because... Within those four orbs I just picked up, Tasnika was one of those that the game already expected me to have already, rather than coming back. By the way, this chest here is a boomerang orb. 
And you can do something similar by getting this boomerang chest early-ish. Either way, it just kind of catches me up to where I'm supposed to be, but in Tasnika, I now still have the option to go back there and grab another sword orb. It is, well, pretty easy to do, honestly. Um, I think this would work. Actually, I may would have to make my characters visible again. By the way, this is another place where if you're really diligent, you can just punch your way up the waterfall. With a bit of luck too, I guess. Kind of like the ramp in the other place, or alternatively. By the way, you can make it up there, and if you hit this switch on this side, it's going to first activate the stuff on the right side, and then the rest. Ah, um, those catch-up chests confuse you as a kid? Yeah, makes sense. How do you even hit this guy? Invisible characters are not so... Oh, you have a javelin, that's why. Right. But he shouldn't deal enough damage to deal damage with the javelin. Still confusing. Oh, right. I remember now where I was going. <laughs> Sorry. I had a... I had a brief moment of where... Why am I going here? It, what did I want to do aside from the sword? Oh, now I remember again. I just kind of briefly forgot for some reason. Alright, we're just gonna go through here. And in case you're curious, Hydra is in fact still here. And for the most part we don't have to worry about enemies because we have armor piece. Or equipment that is, well, something that you can use to go through the pure lands in. Also, I never remember whether this is left or right if I haven't played in a while. So basically, our armor is way too good for these enemies at this point. Even though normally they would be reasonably dangerous. Alrighty. Welcome to Hydra. Hydra has... A good chunk of HP, but he's weak to fire. Oh, I wanted to have invisible cactus for here. Wait, we're not actually going to get any... ...levels for Salamando, so I think I should just use overcharge attacks. Because otherwise this is going to... ...take a really long time here. I'm just gonna use overcharge attacks again. Acid Storm level 1. Alrighty, the main reason why I went to pick up the sword chest is to just demonstrate something that if we do a glitched 100% speedrun at the end of today, this year, um, there's actually a very obscure chest that you are never supposed to pick up. That's not true. I think originally you were supposed to pick up these chests, but they didn't put them into the correct rooms. It's weird, you'll see. It's really weird. Also, unfortunately, we now have visible cactus again, which is going to make it a little bit more difficult to get these chests in particular. Actually, I'm tempted to go back and get invisible cactus just to demonstrate it. Actually, let me do this, because we have the time.
The orbs that drop in the Mana Fortress, are they catch up or just one of each type regardless? They are one of each type regardless. Which actually, this is exactly what I was getting at too, by the or was going to get at too, for orbs. So, question. Anybody who has ever done like a 100% playthrough of the game, there... You had to get all the weapon orbs from the Mana Fortress. How many Axe Orbs and how many Claw Orbs, or Fist Orbs, whatever you want to call that weapon, did you need to collect in order to be able to have all of them? If you uh, never miss any chest or weapon upgrade orb, or anything like that. Two of each, indeed. So... In grand total, if you discount the final final boss, and the boss before, Dark Lich and the Mana Beast, you have exactly enough bosses to get all the weapons to level 8. Is level 8 or 9? Basically one less than the maximum. But there are two bosses that do not actually drop any weapon orbs. Those two bosses are both in the Mana Fortress and those are Buffy and Dread Slime. And I can even tell you the reason as to why they removed the weapon orb drops from them. Because if you have too many of one weapon orb and the boss is supposed to drop one, you soft lock the game. Like it literally doesn't continue and teleport you to where you're supposed to go or it does not open the door or whatsoever. It basically just does not know what to do with that event once that happens. So effectively, dreads, if you were to basically get all the weapon orbs, or two of them, or whatever, all of them, of any particular weapon that Red Slime or Buffy would drop before you defeat Buffy or Red Slime, you would actually just soft lock right there and could no longer proceed. Because the game would not have any idea on what to do with you. And you could not you could no longer complete the game. And that is kind of a huge problem, and consequently, I believe, and I have no way to confirm this, I would need to ask the developers who, chances are decent, even if they were to answer us, they would not know themselves anymore. I believe that there are two chests in the underground that were placed there to make up for the chests that you don't get, or the weapon orbs that you don't get in the Mana Fortress anymore, with the Axe Orb as well as the Claw Orb missing from these two bosses. Although there are two things that are peculiar about it, so which kind of puts my theory into question for that. And those two things are, for one, it's not an Axe Orb and a Claw Orb in there. It's actually an Axe Orb and... Sword Orbs in there. In fact, it's the same level of Sword Orbs... ...that... ...you get normally when you just go a little bit further into the Grand Palace. And that's kind of where... I'm really not sure how much merit my theory has about that, to be honest. Because it would have to be a Claw Orb and an Axe Orb instead. Either way, the reason why you never actually get to these chests is kind of strange. That is because we already have encountered there are combat version and non-combat version of certain maps, and those are just separate maps, let's put it this way. 
For example, when you get to the Moogle village, or the Moogles in the snow area, effectively the snow area with the Moogles, or where the Moogles used to be for that matter, is a different map than the snow area with enemies inside of them. And there are two versions of this entire area map right here. One is a combat version, and one is an NPC version. And the thing about the NPC version is that there are NPCs and you can get into the NPC room, but fact of the matter is that there... Are you guys in the walls? Oh no. <laughs> I never considered that. Oh, they're stuck in the walls. Well, here and here. Good thing we can use magic rope. I never considered that. That's a concern for an actual run. But yeah, effectively there's an entire copy of that map where we know you can meet the rebels. I was kind of hoping to be there by now with that explanation, but... <laughs> just... Yeah, I decided to go through the walls instead. Oh my goodness! We can't get stuck there? What just happened? How did I get in there? <laughs> what? Wow! I had no idea you could get stuck in there. That's... fascinating. I should not have done that again. On the bright side, I only need one... Character invisible. <laughs> I just had to try it again. I didn't know you could get stuck in there. Oh well, either way. So, let's try this again. There are combat version and non combat version of these maps here, so to speak. And for some reason, it's not just a small area where the rebels are. That entire area is literally a copy of the entirety of the map. Rather than just, you know, one or the other a little bit. It's just the non-combat version of that map. And what I believe happens is they intended to put... Here's the NPCs, by the way. Well, actually, both of these are combat versions of the map, now that I think about it. Because the NPCs are here. Wait! Are the chests actually here? Hang on, this is where I would love to have the multi-tap to be able to walk through the walls a little bit. You can see this is where you need to hit the switches over there. Also, sometimes the guard spawns, and sometimes Chrissy spawns, and sometimes the other dude spawns. Either way, they did not account for there being only... Hey, what's this gun? They did not account for there being only a limited amount of... Well, characters that can possibly be loaded here. Oh, wave wave. Hey, XF. Either way, this is one version of the map with NPCs. Actually, both of them are combat versions, now that I see it with the weapons drawn. But, there is another version of this map. That has a chest right in there, too. Ah, oh, I would like to have to. Characters there. Alrighty. <laughs> I'm gonna need to stop waving. <laughs> but no, thank you, XF. So, through this left wall here, somewhere, there is that room that we were just in. And that room is where... We get a... wait, it is a glove orb. 
Oh, is it just not an axe? Oh, it's not the axe orb, it's just glove orbs. But yeah, this is the same room over here. At least I think it is. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't get all the cactus through the wall here. But yeah, this is the catch-up chest. The lost catch-up chest, if you will. With the glove orbs. That I believe was supposed to be the substitute for removing one of the orbs from the boss in the Mana Fortress. And that's all of them. And basically, if we sequence it properly, we don't have to grind for, I think, five of the eight weapons orbs, because we can do some shenanigans with getting the orbs from places before we get them from other things, so to speak. Wow, you can get stuck here. <laughs> Drinking sounds like a good idea. I actually recently managed to accidentally drop my mug. It's not a mug, it's it was like a gigantic Well it's not that gigantic. It was a large chuck of water that I somehow managed to recently drop on the floor and now I don't have it anymore. So I need to learn to remember to drink with this thing, which is a lot less wieldy, let's put it this way. Either way, we have now managed to acquire weapon orbs for the sword as well as the claws up to level 7 I believe for both of them. And for both the sword and the claw, this is what we are supposed to have at this point. That is actually, excuse me, that is actually intentional. Keep your water in bags, bags can shudder. I mean, it was literally a plastic jug, it, like, it was not ceramics or anything like that. But it just happened to be, well, 15 is years, years old by now, and eventually a Bax just kind of would also tear at some point too. Alright, little fun fact about the glove here. The chakra hand gives you plus one intelligence and plus one wisdom. Intelligence is the sprite spellcasting stat, and wisdom is the lady spellcasting stat. The Elven Bow and the Elf Harpoon also give you plus one. It's basically not really worth talking about for the most part. But yeah, um, here we go. Kind of trying to think. Oh yeah, let's just do it. Basically, I was thinking, should we go ahead and do the good old traditional, the classic sword, or mana sword glitch? And I think we should. But we're gonna actually do it kind of slightly backwards. So I hope this is gonna be interesting, even to people who might have done the mana sword glitch themselves at some point in the past. So, the oldest method or use of that wrong warp glitch or safe warp glitch, whatever you want to call it, is the following. We actually need to watch the intro one more time, but this time not to get invisible cactus. This time we're going to go actually start the game, let's put it this way.
Alrighty, so you already know that with the Ice Country save file, we can save file to any location that we have already or are visiting or have already been in. Now, normally when you warp into any boss arena, you will just kind of be in the boss arena and nothing happens. So it is actually a gigantic coincidence that the very first boss, the Mantis Ant, is actually not one of those. Literally every other time where you uh, save warp into an arena of a boss that you have already beaten, you would normally go ahead and just get... the same message again. Or well, you don't get any messages, you're just standing there. Worst case scenario, you're soft locked in there, and best case scenario, you can just walk out of that boss arena. But yeah, Mantis Ant is one of these weird exceptions where if you somehow could get into that boss arena again, you can fight the Mantis Ant again. And well, thanks to our save warp glitch, we can just do that again. Now, once again, I just picked up all the sword orbs from the sunken continent or, well, Grand Palace, whatever you want to call it. Which means we have a level 7 sword right now. If I were to go into the Pure Lands and defeat the Thunder Gigas, I would have level 8 sword, which is the Dragon Slayer, something like that. I don't remember what it was called. Either way. Level 8 sword is normally the maximum you can get. Because the mana sword is in fact the last evolution of the sword that you can only ever unlock in non-glitched gameplay if... and only if... you get to the final cutscene, you cast the mana spell or the two mana spells on the sword while or on the boy while he is holding the sword and then use when you get the mana sword. Well Let's see how this is going to go for us. Because we have level seven right now. Getting the orb from the Mantis Ant here will get us level 8. And then we could go and either complete Tasnika to get level 9 Sword Orb, which we are never supposed to acquire to be able to upgrade it, or we could go and defeat the Thunder Gigas. I'm actually a little bit torn which one I should go for. Should we go Pure Lands or should we go back to Tasnika? I actually kind of want to do both, honestly. Just kind of show off that it softlocks your game. When you have too many orbs. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do both. Oh, I'm a dingus. I don't need to fight this guy. I need to save warp now. My muscle memory just kicked in. Here. Welcome to this guy. He only has 150 HP. Alrighty. 
You thought that if you forged a level 9 weapon, you went back to a level 1 weapon of another type. No. Um, if you get a level 10 weapon, then you get a level 1 weapon of another type. But you cannot usually, outside of that very specific strange circumstance, you cannot usually get too many of any one orb. Not even through acquiring them later, it's just game that the game just kind of crashes on the script trying to give you the next higher weapon orb for some reason, because it's not prepared to handle that. I just realized it was would be quite the uh, ordeal to go ahead and get to Thunder Gigas without being able to level up my spells any higher right now. Uh in case. But yeah, we have the Dragon Buster it's called in this version. It happened in the early Rando, yep. Let's just go Tasnika, it's fine. I was thinking of maybe some other stuff, but I just started to realize how much more time that's going to cost, and it's really just a minor thing. Just believe me that if we pick up this sword here... By the way, Gemma is right here again. If we pick up this sword here, and then were to defeat Thunder Gigas, he would... He would just softlock the game after trying to give it give us the orb and it will never proceed and we could not go to the next area, so we could not actually clear the pure lands. By the way, um, this guts in here, the trigger is literally just one tile above where you land. So unless you actually walk up here, the cutscene for Gemma here never starts, so you can literally just walk around it. Oh yeah, there was actually something else in the Pure Lands that I kinda wanted to show off. <laughs> Do we have a clip of that somewhere? The Thunder Dragon being afraid of... ghosts? <laughs> this one magic? I don't have any magic, dude. You're the only magical guy right here. Oh look, he does not like balloons either, he just freezes as soon as he acquires one. I don't blame you. Oh yeah, we have the post-game or late-game armor, so he, he literally can't damage me, I just realized. This guy can drop chests, and if you're lucky, the rare drop is a Thieves' Gauntlet, which gives you plus 5 agility. And... Let's see. Here we get another sword orb. So, this is a very easy method for us to acquire one more sword orb if we somehow manage to skip Tasnika and get back later. For example, in the Solo Cactus Challenge Round of the Sprite, what I do is I actually create a save file, uh, uh, X-Country save file before I enter Tasnica, clear Tasnica, and then go into the trials with Sage Chalk and such, 
and then I go ahead and save warp into those trials with the save file that did not yet clear Tasnica. Just so I can later go back after defeating Thunder Gigas to get the mana suit early. So effectively the solo character speedrun with the sprite just gets this version of the mana sword. With the boy I get the mana sword through the mantis end. Da -da, there's a mana sword right here. With the boy I get the mana sword through sword through mantis and then with the lady we actually used boomerang instead because her ability to guarantee critical hits and double hit with the boomerang is just ridiculously good. Alrighty, now that we have a mana sword, I feel like it is only appropriate that everybody gets to equip a mana sword because why would we need to just kind of limit this to the boy, right? So what we can do is, right now, the boy has the mana sword equipped. For reference, the mana sword I think has literally twice the amount of attack baseline compared to any other weapon. On top of that, I think it gives you plus 5 to basically all your stats. And on top of that, it has a special condition that it never misses. And that's kind of a big deal about the mana sword. Every other enemy, even in the late game, you have like a 30, 20 to 30% chance to just outright miss without the game telling you about it. Except the Mana Sword. The Mana Sword always hits. So, in order to unequip a weapon, what you want to do is you want to scroll the camera boundary somewhere to the left. Right here. The camera boundary is just to the left of the boy here. Then we go two tiles to the right from here. So, one, two. So now we are two tiles away from the left side camera boundary. What I do now is I go into my equipment menu, equip an armor, then select the armor and put it in the trash. What this does is it, instead of equipping or unequipping the armor I had before, it unequips the weapon. So now this means we can have the lady equip the mana sword and we can have the sprite equip the mana sword too if we just do the same thing with the lady as well. Equip an armor, put it away, and now we have three characters with mana swords. And as you can see, it is pretty ridiculously strong, but doesn't really protect us from... Wait, does it protect us from status effects? Because the boy literally just stood back up right after. Alrighty. Everybody mana suit. Everybody was mana suit fighting. Or something like that. So let's have you be more aggressive now. Oh, by the way. Question, everybody. If I were to go ahead and delete the character... Which one should I delete? Pop quiz. <laughs> Indeed. You didn't study last night. Ah, oh, don't worry, you can study right now. Actually, um, Blood, are you there? I think you're there. Could you make a straw poll that lasts for a long time or something? To ask which character we should delete. I do need one character who actually doesn't have the mana sword equipped so we can get through areas, I suppose. I think I could even technically equip a mana whip if I wanted to. That could be funny.
You know, but it's our fault. Well, time to learn. Actually, that's fine. Um, I think you should be able to access a menu somewhere. I'm mainly asking because I don't know where that is either. Actually, I think I have a button somewhere. <laughs> I never remember every time I have to search again. I was just thinking in case you knew how. Let's see. That's a squad stream. That's the wrong button. Oh, I think I found it. <laughs> oh, also random fun fact. If you want to get overpowered early when playing through Seeker of Mana, just come here with these Dark Knights. And kill them until you get their rare drop. Because their rare drop is actually a gauntlet. The same armor piece that we have right now. And effectively, pretty much no enemy can touch you anymore for a really long time. It's really overpowered to get a gauntlet this early on into a uh, playthrough. The problem is, of course, it is a rare drop, so yeah, it takes a while to actually get one. Should look up on how to get all, use all those much stuff. I mean, you don't have to. It's fine. But yeah, uh, let me. Oh, somebody already did. Thank you. Appreciate it. So everybody, there's a straw poll currently in chat. We're gonna delete the character just for fun. For the rest of the game, which one should we delete? So, by the way, um, once again, this demonstration with. The conditions for a rope pull to allow us to jump are as follows. We have to gather the party near a rope pull, right here. And then we have to hit a rope pull that is somewhere else. So as long as the game thinks that we have a whip equipped, what we can do is... Ah, this one should be fine. Yeah, this is fine. We can do this. So. Uh, let's see. Give the sprite a candy. And while the uh, sprite is happy about getting a candy, we equip the whip. So the whip now looks like a sword, a mana sword. And I could... Can we not do this? I thought we would be able to jump. Oh, there we go. Whee! <laughs> we can jump to the right now. Because the sprite has a mana whip. It's actually the same strength as just a regular whip. Technically what I can do now is I can give the sprite candy right here. Actually, I wonder, hang on. Can I do this during the boss fight? I don't have to kill these guys, but I always like to if I have an easy way to do so. Just because a chance for a rare drop. Alrighty, welcome to Lime Slime. This guy is weak to fire. But what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to give the sprite a candy. Then I'm gonna tell the sprite that, hey, you have a whip equipped. Let's use the mana sword instead. Now the sprite has a mana sword whip and can actually hit the core of the slime from really far away. Plus, um, we can actually stack damage onto the core here. Which is quite funny too. But yes, um, in case you're curious, the sprite literally has a whip that has mana sword properties now. Have you played Sagan and Setsu 1, Mystic Quest, Final Fantasy Adventure, Sword of Mana, Adventure of Mana? Yes. Pretty much all of these, actually. But I would like to play through Sword of Mana again sometime. Because that's a fascinating game. <laughs> we totally should have collaborated all three characters to get the same moves. 
So I can place to the game with zero characters. I can do one, but I think I couldn't really do zero. Oh wait, do I not get that thing now? I think I might not actually get these armor thing or thing is now. Alrighty, so that was just kind of a fun little place to go. Oh wait, I needed to stay here. No, alrighty. For my next trick, I'm gonna do the following. And where can I do this? This is probably fine here. By the way, even the sprite deals really competent damage with a mana sword. It's pretty awesome. Alrighty, so... I would like to demonstrate to you the easiest way to set up a mana sword barrier skip. So what we do here is we have a sprite, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to attack the whip pole on the left side with the sprite, and while I'm about to attack or hit or attack with the sprite, I'm going to open up the menu on the second controller, kind of like this, and then just call Flammy. And what this does is the game remembers now that, hey, um, I'm supposed to make you jump across the whip pole right there. I, I think I should go ahead and get you across that gap. So, if there is an event that is supposed to happen as soon as we land in a certain specific place, for example like the mana fortress, or there is, I'm gonna give it one try, the desert place where you're not supposed to be able to land anymore. If you're landing in any of these places, The first thing that gets executed is the sprite just jumping us all to the left. Which is actually quite fun that way. And so what you can do with this is you can skip the mana or dress barrier. Now this is the easy way to do it. There's two more ways of doing this. Uh, the speedrunner way is this one over here. Well, the one player to control the speedrunner way is this one over here. Kind of didn't land in the correct spot, that's okay. But this one is a little bit trickier to execute and has some quirks to it where you cannot stand too close to the enemy, otherwise your launch attack will actually be altered because the uh, character perceives the little thing to be a different an enemy. So, once again, if you are really far away from any enemy, you will always do the same swing. In this case of the sword, it's just the lower swing. But if I'm close enough to any enemy, or anything that cons the game considers an enemy, we have a 50-50% chance to do the swing, and a 50-50% chance to do the stab attack. Which, there's basically just one alteration of each of the weapons. So, what you want to have happen is you want to basically use a level 1 sword charge attack that moves you far enough forward to hit this little guy. Because what happens if you go onto this guy is it just hops you up the ledge. So our goal is going to be to store this event while we are calling in Flammy at the same time. So, gonna charge up this thing and then I'm gonna call Flammy as soon as I release the charge attack. And now, the boy just activated that little uh, high stepper, I think they are usually called, which normally is supposed to put us up onto the ledge. And we can use this to go in here. Yeah. 
and what happens instead of the game telling us that hey we can't be here uh, we just jump to the left and literally jump over the barrier now not everybody even has two controllers or for that matter not everybody is comfortable enough to just use two controllers but there is a one controller method to do the barrier skip as well And it actually involves boomerangs, specifically a very, very specific kind of boomerang level. Level 2. That's all you need. You need a level 2 boomerang in order to be able to skip the mana barrier with just one controller. If I ever find the area I need to land in, I'm not good at navigation. There we go. You would think I would know the world map by now, but <laughs> not really. You mean against the Mana Beast Valokar? No, actually, there's a different reason for that Valokar. The reason why the Mana Sword hits for an insane amount against the Mana Beast is because. Oh, we never leveled up the boomerang. That's fine. The reason why the mana sword hits for an insane amount against the mana beast is actually because of a secondary mechanic. I'm gonna get to it once we get to the mana beast. But the short version is, the mana sword spell boosts your damage output. based on the other weapon levels you have, like your secondary weapon levels, you get additional attack power from them. I need a level 2 weapon on the sprite. Actually, I guess I could just unequip the other stuff again, it's fine. Let's do this on the boy instead. So, I'm gonna give the boy the boomerang here. We cannot charge up the boomerang to level 2 right now, but I'm just gonna do a I think Crow calls it weapon grafting in order to be able to use a level 2 boomerang here. But you can just do this with a regular level 2 boomerang, you don't have to do the weapon grafting whatsoever. Oh. Sprite needs to unequip the sword real quick. Alright, so now I have a boomerang that I can charge up to level 2. And my goal is to effectively hit the rope pull up there with a boomerang attack at the same time as I'm hitting... Wait, is it level 2? Is it level 3? Either way, my goal is to hit that rope pull up there at the same time as I'm calling in Flame, which I think I have to stand around here. Yeah, that works. So, because the boomerang allows it to just continue flying... Relate... While hitting the rope pull, it will still transfer that event over to... Flying. So this means, right now, the game is uh, queuing up a rope pull event where it is checking whether we are in the correct position to be able to jump across a gap. Do we have the whip equipped and have we gathered the party before? It doesn't matter that no, neither of these conditions are true. We can just keep going here because the game now skipped the barrier once again. So this is the one controller method of skipping the barrier in the mana fortress right here. And well, I would suggest let's keep going. Welcome to one of my favorite songs in the game. I don't know what it's called in, like, musical terms, but these rolling notes are definitely some of my favorites.
Um, there is a method to get through the wall here on the left side to get a bit of a shortcut, but I have to admit, my focus is starting to fade, so I think I'm just gonna go the normal way for now. I kind of would like to have a chest though, just for fun. Boss notes, notes going up and down in the background are arpeggios. How do you pronounce that properly? Thank you, Azur. Arpeggios. Arpeggios? Thank you. Appreciate it. But yeah, that's kind of... When I listen to songs for a long time, and I have listened to this one for a long time, I tend to start just kind of listening to these little background instruments and just follow them around in a sense. And this song definitely has one of my favorite ones where it's just... It just sounds like a lot of fun. I don't know how else to describe it. It just sounds fun. And I really like this one. Maybe I should have grabbed other stuff. Oh well. Welcome to... Buffy. And I think I'm just going to resort to the one player... to controller method at this point for defeating Buffy here. Um, there's not really anything particularly interesting I can say about Buffy, I guess. At least not that I would be aware of. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do just kind of the standard routine, let's put it this way. I'm not used to not having the controller inverted, which is kind of weird to me right now. Ah, this is fine. I actually hit him. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm just overcharging my attack. And I'm keeping effectively the sprite or the lady as close as possible to his shadow, which is effectively where he has his center. And this allows me to make sure that the boy is not the one that is getting hit. So whenever Buffy ends up coming down, I will be able to hit with the boy as quick as possible. And then what I'm trying here is I now moved uh, the lady just exactly into a position that allowed me to get the lady grabbed. And now what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to cast Analyzer to lock Buffy into place. Normally you want to cast Slowdown, which has a slower, uh, a shorter animation, but I kind of messed it up. It's been a while since I played this. Also, I haven't really done this with the whip before, to be fair. Okay, and he escapes. But yeah, 
because you can only hit him with weapons while Buffy is just kind of coming down and jumping around, it makes it kind of a little bit awkward trying to navigate around that, especially if you're trying to do just kind of like a weapon or no offensive spell challenge type of deal. This guy is a bit of a meanie. I think he might be dead here if I hit, but that's kind of the catch. I need to hit. Oh, I don't have any healing items anymore. Uh, here. Oh, we did it. Also! I completely spaced out on this. I am supposed to delete the character. So, we're gonna go ahead and delete the boy. Because that's what people voted for. I'm sorry, I just... <laughs> uh, I think you can tell I'm losing focus here. I'm just trying to remember the last uh, few bits and pieces that I want to do. Bye, boy. Yep. We actually have to walk out of it, all the way out of here because... Well... Magic rope doesn't work. I wonder whether we can level up our spells higher than before now, or whether we are kind of locked at this level that we are now. I actually have no idea. Alrighty, sorry, I'm back. Hello, how are you guys doing? Okay. We can't get in. Right, that's... <laughs> yeah, we can't get in. Which is why we already defeated Buffy. It's fine. And while I'm out here, might as well just go ahead and restock on supplies as well. Because now that the boy is going to be gone, I need at least four of each item in order to restock them with the ladies' equipment trashing instead. the boy into the pit. We sent him into the void. I hope that is an appropriate way to go about it. In that case, I probably should go and get Luna. But in order to get Luna, I need to get Lumina first, too. Or we could just do Weapon Overcharger with the Lady. <laughs> I don't think I've done that in a regular run before, so why not? If I can set it up, it would actually be beneficial if she was weapon overcharging with the sword. Actually, I can set this up either way. That's fine. Because the sword never misses. Or we could even weapon graft the sword onto something else. Have we ever considered... Sorry, I'm just kind of... 
going on tangents here, but I wonder whether we ever considered using weapon grafting for specific boss fights in one player to control the speedruns. Not sure where it would be particularly useful, but I think it should work. Alright, sorry, I need to find... ...self down here. Right, this guy's still in the way. Alrighty, if we remove the boy from our party here, this is pretty much permanent unless somebody figures out a way to call the script to put the boy back in the party, which I don't know that one. So I need to actually make sure these guys are no longer attacking, just staying passive in the background here, because otherwise it's gonna be a little bit more awkward now. You don't attack, you don't attack. I do want to go ahead and knock out this fishy real quick here though. There we go. No, 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 you guys don't attack. Don't at No! Stop it. Right? No. Now, what we need to have happen is the following. I need the boy to be frozen as a snowman. And then he needs to push the enemies to the top right. Let's see if we can get that to work. Here it is. Now, once the number settled down there to 77, we use a medical herb on him. Quickly switch back to the boy with the select button. And then we push up right. There it is. Goodbye, buddy. This is what we know as the snowman abduction. It's not permanent, you just need to reload the save state. I mean... I suppose technically correct, but practically. Are we gonna do that? No. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I would like to briefly... Bye bye, Rump. Rump got rumped. Uh, I need to figure out which weapon I'm gonna use. Four secondaries. Plus, I need to get back up there into the mana fortress. Oh, that's Podos. Yeah, this is where I wanted to go. Going to do some equipment trashing real quick. How many do I need? One, two, three. Ooh. Four, five, six, seven. Okay, I actually have to go and buy stuff real quick. And sell one cup of wishes, otherwise we're gonna not have enough in the long run. That sounds really weird. I need to sell one cup of wishes, otherwise I won't have enough in the long run. Because I want to do equipment trashing. Alright, this should probably be easily sufficient. Oh, actually, one more weird thing that I can show off I just realized. That is actually perfect that we're gonna be saving right here, because it's gonna be a soft lock. Don't recommend doing this during regular playthroughs, but... I mean, unless you really want to, I guess. Right, it should have replenished all our stock of items to zero. And remember, zero is basically the same as having eight of each uh, inventory item, because we can use them eight times. So, there is a really weird 
soft lock that you can do in the castle here. Because inside this castle you can use magic rope. So what does a magic rope do? Magic rope brings you back to the entrance. Makes sense. Now, there are specific tiles and entrances where if you go into the room, the game remembers, okay, I need to bring you to the room that you were in before the last loading screen, screen transition and such. So if we step on here, we were just outside here, it makes sense. However, if I go inside here and then use the magic rope, technically I have gone from in this room with the magic rope to this room with the magic rope. So my last room that I entered from is this room. So, consequently, I'm not locked in here and any time I try to go back out here it brings me back to where I used the magic rope earlier. And we can no longer complete the game because we are stuck in... Well, this room here. This is why I saved before. Alrighty. Let me actually real quick check what button levels the lady has. Groundhog Day, pretty much. She needs any other weapon at level 2. Actually, I shouldn't have flown away. A any other weapon she needs at level 1, aside from the sword. And we can actually just make it the boomerang, because why not? The boomerang is crazy good. So, I need to really quick level up the boomerang. So, by the way, how weapon levels work? Maybe real quick. So, weapon levels work as follows. If you defeat an enemy that is equal or higher to your level, you gain full weapon experience, which means full weapon experience from 0 to 1 is 9 weapon experience, from 1 to 2 it is 8 weapon experience, from 2 to 3 it is 7, from 3 to 4 it is 6, etc. Basically, once you reach weapon level 8 you get 1 weapon experience for an enemy that is at least equal or higher to your level. Now, if the enemy is lower your level, you get half of that, rounded down. So if you ever want to level up a weapon past level 8.00, you actually have to defeat enemies that are at least your level or higher level than you. Because otherwise you, gone, you get half of one rounded down, which is zero. So that would be kind of an issue if you try to do a 100% run. Now, Half of the weapon experience you earn is actually also transferred to your allies. For example, um, if I attack an enemy with a boomerang, I get 9 weapon experience halved, because the enemies are lower level here, which means 4. So we have 57 boomerang weapon experience right now. And killing this guy here means we have 61. Next one is going to be 65 right here. We kill two enemies is actually going to be... 69 boomerang experience. It makes sense. Now, half of that experience that the lady acquires gets over to the sprite. The sprite currently has 1 point or 72 mana sword experience, and half of 4 is, well, 2. So, funnily enough, no matter what the level is of the sprite's weapon, the sprite always gets two weapon experience in this situation. So even if the sprite had a, le we a weapon at level 8, it still would gain two weapon experience. So at level 8, you actually level up weapons more efficiently if you can leverage them with allies killing enemies with lower level weapons. And that's actually kind of an entire conundrum on how to most efficiently level up all the weapons. Also, if you try to get all the weapons up to level 
including the mana sword, which normally you can't do that with the sword because, well, mana sword is, or the sword is the only weapon that only goes up to 9.00, 8.00. But with glitches, you can get the Mana Sword and all the weapons up to 8.99, which... That's actually kind of a problem if you consider that the last character needs to level at least some of the weapons up to 8.99 with enemies that are at least equal or higher level than him or them, I guess. So what does that... What that means is you have to basically intentionally keep a character at lower level in order to be able to level up all the weapons to 8.99 because it's going to be quite a grind to get all the weapons up to the max level. By the way, the highest level enemy is level 70 which is, if I'm not mistaken, the Terminator. So if you are higher than level 70, and you don't have a way to leverage your other weapons with previous weapons, there is no way to max out all the weapons to 8.99 anymore. Alrighty, now that we have that out of the way, let's finally get to the Mana Fortress. You know, I kind of forgot about the part where I probably will want to just do the good old traditional skip here. Actually, a sprite should also have level 1 sword, right? Yep, that works. Alrighty, we're gonna do the high stepper skip into the mana fortress. Skipping the pure lands here for now. Again, the main reason is because I've been streaming for quite a while and unfortunately losing focus already here. The one thing I would have wanted to show off in the Pure Lands is the... actually the two things. It's getting stuck because you have too many sword levels on the Thunder Gigas, as well as the Thunder Dragon being as afraid of ghosts. Which I think both of them are quite fun. <laughs> That's right, the boy technically still had the whip equipped. So we just whooped the whip out of the way. To their position over there somewhere. Oh! Wait, I can't switch over to the Mana Sword right now. Uh-oh! <laughs> uh... Wait. That might be a problem. I don't think I've ever encountered that part, honestly. <laughs> I usually just unequip the characters I delete beforehand. Yeah, I need a place to land where I can actually check my weapons. Okay. We can equip the sword again. Good. I was worried that I couldn't equip the sword anymore. Because the boy is normally stuck with the mana sword when... Actually, we can just stay here. The boy is normally stuck with the mana sword when you, of course... Well... Unleash the mana sword onto the mana beast. Unless... You actually... Enchant... The sword, the mana sword, with... A spell. Then you can still switch it around. Kinda weird. Oh, 
Alrighty. Let's go to the Mana Fortress again again. Okay, so start swinging with the lady, open the inventory in the second controller, call Flammy, and we'll execute the whip job as soon as we land on the Mana Fortress. Which, by the way, the control switches from the character who called Flammy to the character who actually hit the whip for last in terms of who has control of Flammy. Kinda weird. Alright, let's jump over the magic barrier in the Mana Fortress. And hopefully just run through this for the last time for now. No! Muggles! No muggles allowed. It's really weird only seeing the game at 30 FPS, when it really should be... well... a lot more than that. Let me through. Alrighty. Now. What else? Kind of hoping for a chest here because. Ooh, chest. Oh, yeah, maybe something you might not know. If you analyze your chest, then you can disable the trap if the analyzer level is high enough. And if the chest is blinking red, that is when you have to disable the trap. I know it's counterintuitive, but right now the trap is not disabled because the analyzer level is not too high or high enough. Which means right now, because we don't have high enough agility, we have a 50-50% chance to get a trap instead of anything else. And we got a Doom Trap. Still alive though. I think 1 in 16 times you actually straight up die to a Doom Trap, or was it 1 in 8? Either way, he's fine. Which by the way, Doom Trap is physical damage and you can absorb it with Luna Barrier. Kind of fun. How many little things we come across? Would there be any actions benefit one player three controllers? If you could perfectly navigate with three D pads, sure. But I cannot. Alright. Now we're gonna go and switch over to the boomerang, start charging up to level one. And this is where I start having trouble because I only have two characters. There's normally this guy here, who would like to have more than two. Alright, switch the weapon over to the lady here. 
Oh, right, that's a weird one. I switch now, it's gonna start overcharging. I used two candies so far, so we have five remaining now. Alright, what I wanna do is I want to stack both of my characters onto the same spot. Because Thread Slime is one of those weird bosses that always targets the character that is the furthest away from it, rather than the closest character. And it's also the one boss, actually one of two bosses, that has infinite mana, or MP I guess. Right now, it's gonna target the lady, if anything. And the reason why I wanna put both characters into the same spot is so the boomerang has the best chance of getting the double hits that I want. So now we just hope that he doesn't spam his spells too many times. We switch over to the boomerang, which at level. Charge level 1, 4, 6, and I think 8 can double hit enemies and bosses. But because it's a boomerang rather than the mana sword. It does have a chance to miss, which is kind of an issue. But hey, we can also get crits occasionally. We do now need to heal. This means we only have four candies now. I think the projectile portion of the boomerang actually literally does not have large enough of a hitbox to be able to hit the red slime core there. It just doesn't reach far enough. Alrighty, but red slime defeated and as you will be able to see, we do not get any weapon orbs, which... Fun fact, I did not realize that this thing doesn't give any weapon orbs, alongside Buffy not giving any weapon orbs until way later. Alright, we don't need the whip anymore at this point. We just need a sword or an axe in order to cut through the last green thingies. So we are on the home stretch. Alrighty. Welcome to the Dark Lich Encounter. Which has some of the most iconic music in the game, I will say. Because it is very different than basically anything I've ever heard as a kid. And I really enjoyed it. I don't necessarily like it for being music as much as I just like the atmosphere and the mood the music ends up bringing with this kind of tune. It's 
really fascinating. The Oracle indeed. Alrighty, welcome the Dark Lich. Petrified him. No hit. Ah, oh, he did it. Meany. I'm more used to them just instantly dying rather than actually surviving. <laughs> the boomerang came back. <laughs> oh no, no more charge attacks for me. Can he actually dive down, please? Very fitting track to a lich fight, definitely agree. Hey, Evil Gate! It's actually percentage based HP damage. So, it's one of the few spells you might survive no matter your armor and level. We'll see if we get the thing. We did not get the thing. Probably should not have the cact in the front that cannot do any menus. There we go. This is fine. Actually, it's a boomerang. I should go for one more. Come on, stick up your head, please. Come on, buddy. You can't hit him during this unless you use spells. Which my spells are pretty weak at this point. There we go. See will I get the position because I don't remember. There we go. Welcome to the Dark Lich Headbang. So, to illustrate real quick what is happening here. Basically, in this state, Dark Lich can only move up or down. But he also notices that I am technically within the horizontal reach of him, so he just kind of keeps moving up and down. And his goal is to attack me. But because I'm in more or less the exact center of where the Dark Lich is, he cannot actually attack me. The one exception is if I am slightly off center and one of his attack reaches happens to get to me in the wrong moment there. So we just hope that doesn't happen. But he can sometimes escape and I don't exactly know the precise conditions as to why that can happen. Usually after I close the menu there. Alright, and with this we kind of have him literally locked down in an AI loop. This is not even a glitch by the way. This is technically just an incredibly short AI loop where we stand in a very precise position and he does exactly what he's supposed to in the sense that, well, he's executing the correct code. It's not any bug in particular. It's just kind of a very incredibly short AI loop that we are taking advantage of where he tries to go up, but then he goes too far up, then he tries to go down, but then he goes too far down, then he goes to tries to go up again, etc. Well, we have a level 39 taco now.
We have to get out of here now. And welcome to my favorite piece of music. Well, one of them anyways. As I said, it kind of always depends on the mood. This one is the other one. You remember as a kid how furious you were to find out there's another boss right after? Oh boy. Since we basically just read through the walkthrough and the guide as we went, I was perfectly aware that there was going to be another thing. Alrighty. Let's get going. There's... One more glitch. I guess without the boy we literally can't do the other one. <laughs> but we also have the sword mana sword already, so it wouldn't be terribly interesting either. But maybe real quick. Um the reason why the mana sword, specifically in the mana beast fight, is so ridiculously strong and just with regular attacks just deals maximum damage effectively, is because every time you level up any weapon your partial and also full weapon experience for any character for the boy's attack actually gets calculated into his attack power while the mana sword spell is active. While the mana sword itself is already really strong, what actually makes it even more ridiculously powerful in that scenario... Oh, by the way, I forgot about something. Let me do this real quick. What makes it even more ridiculously powerful in that scenario is that It effectively just skyrockets your raw attack power that then subsequently gets multiplied into ridiculous degrees as long as you have leveled up your secondary weapons at least somewhat. In the glitch speedrun you see runners actually specifically almost level up other weapons that are not the sword to like level 8, uh, 0 0.9 and 0 0.96 almost to a level but not quite in order to maximize the amount of attack power that you get additional. Because the glitchless speedruns uh, mana beast fight is actually usually a little bit faster than the glitched versions because they can take full advantage of that mechanic. Yes, Meridian dance time. So what I forgot to do, um, if a character has a barrel equipped and then they get a weapon enchant. That barrel, as I mentioned before, is technically a weapon, and thus you can enchant the barrel as a thing. Which is kind of strange, but hey, it works. Alright, as soon as the mana beast just flew in right there, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to intentionally open up a full screen menu. Oh, I would intentionally open up a full screen menu. Hang on, let me think about my inputs here. Ah, I goofed. Okay, we're gonna do this next cycle. Because I don't think I can do this right now. Basically, there's a strange glitch associated with the mana beast here. But also, you can stack damage onto the Mana Beast. So as long as I choose an attack that has both a physical and a melee, uh, a ranged attack portion with the Boomerang, I can actually hit the Mana Beast twice with one attack with the Lady here. The biggest danger of the Mana Beast doing right here is actually casting Lucent Beams right now. But this is why I keep this right foot away from the center, because the Mana Beast tends to well, always attacks the character that is the closest. In this case, the lady is the closest to the center. The mana beast will always cast spells on her. So in this case, I have enough time with the sprite to both negate and heal the lady's damage. And while we're at it, just gonna heal the sprite here. Right, we have enough HP. Even if the sprite were to get killed right there with that one attack, um, Andini's spells actually also heal you from 0 HP. Also, as soon as the mana beast starts flying in, what you can do here... ...is 
is you can just start casting with the lady and it will just perfectly negate the damage from the mana beast flying in. So what I actually want to do here... How many barrels do we have left? Seven, that's fine. Let's see if I can get the thing now. So, I'm immediately going to open up a full screen menu here. It, I think it doesn't matter which one. So let's change our border a little bit, shall we? And basically if I do this right after the Mana Beast attacks like that and is about to land again, it kind of messes a little bit with the Mana Beast graphics. Or maybe not, maybe I... I don't know what I need to do for the timing. Oh, <laughs> no, there it is. I think I was a little bit late actually with the timing there. Maybe I need to do this slightly earlier. But yeah, uh, Mana Beast is slightly glitchy now. Just a little bit. And you can actually mess up the entire sprite by more timely open up the entire full screen menu, so to speak. I think the lady should survive one attack. Yeah, she actually survives two even. I mean, I would prefer if she didn't have to. Alrighty. Such a weird visual glitch, yeah. I think Crow came up with that one, or maybe it was Moppleton who told me about it. It's really strange. I forgot this wasn't the uh, last attack right there for some reason. <laughs> Let's open the stats menu this time. It didn't work! Alright, I don't know how to get a full glitch thing going, unfortunately. But hey, as you can see, the boomerang hits twice. Whenever we have the appropriate attack. We just have to get lucky with two characters that we don't get lasered. The mana beast, by the way, can just chain Lucent Beam you, and there might be nothing you can do about it. So in the solo character challenge round, the safest thing you might want to do is just only attack once per entire cycle, which is really slow. But it's the only guaranteed way how you can eventually win. And it because basically becomes a war of attrition at that point. If never played the remake, is it worth it? It's a mixed bag. For the most part, I would just say some things are good about it, other things are just not that great. Last try. See whether this works now. There it is. This looks like a full-on mana beast glitch. Maybe I need to not stick in the menu for too long.
What I could do is actually could Moogle and immediately unmoogle the character. Um, did anybody by chance keep track of how much damage we've dealt so far? <laughs> Something seems different about you, Mana Beast. New haircut? I think there's other things to do here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and put on the Mana Sword instead on the Lady, that way she is going to guarantee hit. Oh, we got him. One more hit it was. And the GG! Actually! Oh wait, no, I don't have a Frost Forest Nico safe file. Never mind. I was gonna do a thing, but we can't do that right now. Taco! He's gone. No more tapcos, guys. Well... And unfortunately for the lady, she is just kind of mostly stuck on these screens because once again... The eye control cactus cannot scroll the screen. And what is supposed to happen is the game is supposed to take control of the boy that you had in the cutscene and assigns it the, well, screen scrolling capabilities because that is normally your player character. Instead of what is happening, the lady is just walking into invisible walls everywhere. And I feel like this is just. A significantly more dramatic and tragic ending than anything else where no matter where she goes, she cannot go more than five steps without bumping into a random wall. Kind of crazy if you think about it. Also everybody, you have three guesses. Full moon, crescent moon or two thirds of a moon. In Seeker of Mana, it's actually completely random which moon you get, and also the star constellation is random as well, but which moon you get is usually the easiest thing to bet on. So, it could be a crescent moon, it could be two-thirds of a moon, or it could be a full moon. And which one it is is actually technically predetermined by the checksum of the save files, but I have no idea what that checksum is, because I've saved. So, 
whatever it's going to be. It's completely random for now, but if I were to take this save file here and go and defeat the Mana Beast again, we would actually get the same ending screen again. But hey, what do you think it's gonna be? Alrighty, we have one full moon, we have one crescent, another full moon, a waxing waning moon, which is what I call two thirds, which, same thing. We have another crescent, we have two thirds moon. We have a very fun stream, and thank you, I appreciate that. And thank you as well for the kind words, Willard and super low profile. And Veld Fury, thank you for the gifts up to Willard. Really nice of you. Thank you so much. And keep in mind, this is not even everything that the game has to offer. There are so many more little things that I either forgot or just at least in the end decided I probably shouldn't make this too, too long. Yeah, thank you everybody. I need to figure out why my capture card is only recording in 30 FPS because uh, this probably has been the case for a while and I just didn't realize it if I were to guess. Have I ever held the world record on any of the Secret of Mana categories? Most of them actually at some point. I still have two? Wait, really? I know technically, well, probably... I mean, it's not an official leap to the board because not really anybody else runs 100%, but I guess I technically have 100% records. We could call the... Eight point nine nine all weapons record with the mana sword at eight point nine nine as well. We could call it a hundred point nine nine percent because kind of adds point nine nine above the thing. We have multi tap and the any percent co op with Bowie and Stinger. Ah, oh yeah, the co op. I guess that's technically true. That was a fun run. I tend to forget about that one, because in my mind, co-op is supposed to be faster than one player two controller, but of course, it's much more difficult to get three people together than it is to get two hands together. And we have a full moon! This is actually a very nice ending screen. So congratulations to anybody who guessed full moon. And well... Thank you. Thank you all for having a lot of patience with me, because I fully realized that basically with accepting the job that I currently happen to have, I kind of more or less fully stopped the streaming momentum with what I like to do and what I would love to do right now. But at the same time, it seemed like the appropriate decision to, so... Well back to full-time streaming back in October, which is still quite a ways away. But I would also like to do, well, a bit of a throwback to old streams, like Terranigma, as well as Sagan and Setsu 3, Tales of Fantasia, maybe some other games too. Could play some Boshi again sometime. And just 
do similar-ish, like explanatory and show-off playthroughs of these games too, because why not? Um, this is probably not going to happen this weekend, because um, just talking the entire time for 8 hours straight with me not paying enough attention to drinking enough water frequently enough, because I have a new water jug that I should get used to, um, is likely going to take its toll tomorrow, so we'll see. I also have to prepare for, well, traveling for a week, so not sure. Either way, everybody, thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for listening and for lurking. Leffy, thank you so much for 10 gift subs. That is crazy. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good time. Hopefully until next time, and... Make sure to take good care of yourself. Good night.